Forward and Preface of U.S. Marine Operations in Korea, 1950 to 1953, Volume 4, The East Central Front. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. U.S. Marine Operations in Korea, 1950 to 1953, Volume 4, The East Central Front by Lynn Montross, Norman Hicks, and others. Forward Americans everywhere will remember the inspiring conduct of Marines during Korean operations in 1950. As the fire brigade of the Pusan perimeter, the assault troops at Incheon, and the heroic fighters of the Chosen Reservoir campaign, they established a record in keeping with the highest traditions of their corps. No less praiseworthy were the Marine actions during the protracted land battles of 1951, the second year of the Korean police action. The 1st Marine Division, supported wherever possible by the 1st Marine Aircraft Wing, helped stem the flood of the Chinese offensive in April. Then lashing back in vigorous and successful counterattack, the Marines fought around the Huichan Reservoir to the mighty fastness of the punch bowl. The punch bowl became familiar terrain to Marines during the summer of 1951, and the division suffered its heaviest casualties of the year fighting in the vicinity of that aptly named Circular Depression. The fighting waxed hot, then cold, as the truce teams negotiated. They reached no satisfactory agreement, and the fighting again intensified. Finally, after a year of active campaigning on Korea's East Central Front, the Marines move west to occupy positions defending the approaches to the Korean capital, Seoul. The year of desperate fighting, uneasy truce, and renewed combat covered by this volume saw the operational employment of a Marine-developed technique, assault by helicopter-borne troops. Tactics were continually being refined to meet the ever-changing battle situation. However, throughout the period, the one constant factor on which United Nations commanders could rely was the spirit and professional attitude of Marines, both regular and reserve. This is their hallmark as fighting men. Donald M. Shoup, General, U.S. Marine Corps, Commandant of the Marine Corps. Preface this is the fourth in a series of five volumes dealing with the operations of United States Marines in Korea during the period 2 August 1950 to 27 July 1953. Volume 4 presents in detail the operations of the 1st Marine Division and 1st Marine Aircraft Wing, the former while operating under 8th Army control and also as part of 9 Corps and 10 Corps, U.S. Army, and the latter while controlled by the 5th Air Force. The period covered in this volume begins in the latter part of December 1950, when the division rested in the Masan Bean Patch, and continues through the guerrilla hunt, the punch bowl fighting, and all other operations during 1951. The account ends when the Marines moved to positions in the West during March 1952. Marines did not fight this war alone. They were a part of the huge 8th United States Army in Korea. But since this is primarily a Marine history, the actions of the U.S. Army, Navy, and Air Force are presented only sufficiently to place Marine operations in their proper perspective. Many participants in the fighting during this period have generously contributed to the book by granting interviews, answering inquiries, and commenting on first draft manuscripts. Their assistance was invaluable. Although it was not possible to use all the plethora of detailed comments and information received, the material will go into Marine Corps archives for possible use and benefit of future historians. The manuscript of this volume was prepared during the tenure of Colonel Charles W. Harrison, Major Gerald Fink, and Colonel William M. Miller as successive heads of the historical branch. Production was accomplished under the direction of Colonel Thomas G. Rowe. Major William T. Hickman wrote some of the preliminary drafts and did much valuable research and map sketching. Dr. K. Jack Bauer and Mrs. Elizabeth Tierney assisted the authors in research, 
and Mr. Truman R. Strobridge assisted in proofreading and preparing the index. To the Army, Navy, and Air Force officers, as well as Marine officers and NCOs, who submitted valuable comments and criticisms of preliminary drafts, thanks are also extended. These suggestions added to the accuracy and details of the text. Additional assistance was rendered by personnel of the Office of the Chief of Military History, Department of the Army, the Division of Naval History, Department of the Navy, and the Historical Division, Department of the Air Force. The exacting administrative duties involved in processing the volume from first draft manuscripts through the final printed form were ably managed by Miss K. P. Sue. All manuscript typing was done expertly by Mrs. Miriam R. Smallwood. The maps contained in this volume were prepared by the Reproduction Section, Marine Corps Schools, Quantico, Virginia, and the Historical Branch, Headquarters Marine Corps. Official Department of Defense photographs were used. The Marine Corps mourns the passing of the prime author of this series and other admirable works of Marine Corps and military history. Lynn Montross, after a lengthy illness, died on 28 January 1961. H. W. Buse, Jr., Brigadier General, U.S. Marine Corps, Assistant Chief of Staff, G-3. End of foreword and preface. Chapter 1, Part 1 of U.S. Marine Operations in Korea, 1950-1953, Volume 4, The East Central Front, by Lynn Montross, Norman Hicks, and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interlude at Masan A new chapter in Korean operations began for the 1st Marine Division at 1800 on 16 December 1950 with the opening of the CP at Masan. By the following afternoon, all units of the division had arrived from Hungnam with the exception of VMO-6 and small groups of such specialists as the amphibian tractor troops left behind to assist with the redeployment of the remaining 10 core elements to South Korea. The 1st Marine Division and 1st Marine Aircraft Wing were separated for the first time since the Incheon landing. VMF-311, the new Panther Jet Squadron, was flying from K-9, an air force field near Pusan. Operating together as an all-marine carrier group taking part in the Hungnam redeployment were the three Corsair squadrons, VMF-212 on the CVL, light carrier, Bataan, VMF-214 on the CVE, Sicily, and VMF-323 on the CVE, Badong Strait. The two Japan-based night fighter squadrons, VMF-N-542 and VMF-N-513, flying from Itazuk, patrolled the skies between Japan and Korea. VMO-6, the observation squadron, consisting of helicopters and OI fixed-wing planes, was attached to various ships of the 7th Fleet for rescue missions when pilots were forced into the sea. A detachment of Marine Ground Control Intercept Squadron 1, MiG SIS 1, and the entire Air Defense Section of Marine Tactical Air Control Squadron 2, MTAX 2, were also attached to the warships. They assisted in the control of hundreds of planes that flew over the Hungnam beachhead daily in support of the final stages of the 10 Corps evacuation. The three Marine Corsair squadrons on the Sicily, Badong Strait, and Bataan represented the entire air strength of Escort Carrier Task Group, TG, 96.8, commanded by Rear Admiral Richard N. Rubel. Each squadron came directly under the operational command of the ship on which it had embarked. Supply, engineering, ordnance, billeting, and messing were of course provided through naval channels. The only relationship of the squadrons to their parent organization, MAG-33, derived from the administration of personnel and the storage of equipment at Itami. Return to the Bean Patch Masan, the new division assembly area, 
was located about 27 air miles and 40 road miles west of Pusan on the Bay of Masan, which indents the southern coast of the peninsula. In order to prepare for the arrival of the division, Brigadier General Edward A. Craig, the Assistant Division Commander, ADC, had flown from Hungnam with the advance party on 12 December to make necessary arrangements. The small seaport, which skirts the bay for about two and a half miles, was untouched by the war as compared to the ravaged towns of northeast Korea. It had a protected anchorage, dock facilities, and good rail and road communications. There was an airstrip at Chinhae a few miles to the southeast. Some sort of cycle seemed to have been completed by veterans of the 5th Marines when they found themselves back again in the familiar surroundings of the bean patch on the northern outskirts of Masan. This large cultivated field is entitled to capital letters because of its historical distinction as bivouac area of the 1st Provisional Marine Brigade after the Battle of the Noktong in August 1950. Barely four months had passed since that hard fight, but a great deal more history had been made during the combats of the Inchon Seoul and Chosen Reservoir campaigns. There was room enough in the bean patch for all three infantry regiments. Headquarters, the 11th Marines, the 1st Signal, 1st Tank, 1st Amtrak, 1st Ordnance, and 1st Motor Transport Battalions were located on the southern outskirts of town along with the 41st Independent Commando Royal Marines. The 1st Combat Service Group, the MP Company, and the 1st Service, 1st Shore Party, and 1st Engineer Battalions occupied the dock area of Masan proper. A large building in the center of town housed the Division Hospital, and the 7th Motor Transport Battalion was assigned to the Changwon area, four miles to the northeast. Peaceful as the surroundings may have seemed to troops who had just completed the 13-day running fight of the Chosen Reservoir breakout, the Chitisan mountain mass some 50 miles northwest of Masan had been for many years the hideout of Korean bandits and outlaws. The Japanese had never been able to clear them out, and the Republic of Korea had met with no better success. After the outbreak of civil war, they made some pretense of aiding the communist cause, but were actually preying upon the ROC army and police for arms, food, clothing, and other loot. Operating in prowling bands as large as 50 or 60 men, the guerrillas were well armed with rifles, machine guns, and at times even mortars. In order to assure the safety both of its own bivouac areas and the vital port of Masan, Division promptly initiated measures to maintain surveillance over a broad belt of countryside which described an arc from Chinju, some 40 miles west of Masan, around to Changwon. The infantry and artillery regiments and the Division Reconnaissance Company were all assigned subsectors of this security belt. Daily motor patrols of not less than platoon strength were to be conducted in each subsector for the purpose of gaining information about the roads and the guerrillas as well as discouraging their activities. As it proved, however, no hostile contacts were made by the Marines during the entire Masan interlude. The guerrillas preferred to restrict their attention to the local police and civilian population. 1st Marine Division in USAC Reserve At 22.40 on the 18th, a dispatch from Major General Edward M. Almond, U.S. Army, Commanding General of Ten Corps, informed the 1st Marine Division that it had passed to the operational control of the 8th Army. Major General Oliver P. Smith reported in one of his first dispatches to USAC that the Marines had received fresh rations on only three days since landing in Korea. The division commander invited attention to the importance of building up the physical condition of men who had lost weight during the chosen reservoir operation. An information copy went to Commander Naval Forces Far East, Comnav Fee, who reacted promptly by ordering a refrigeration ship to Masan with 50,000 rations of turkey. The G-4 of USAC also responded with fresh rations from time to time until the Marines, in the words of General Smith, had turkey coming out of their ears. 
Games of softball and touch football became popular in the crisp, invigorating weather as the men rapidly recuperated from fatigue and nervous tension. A series of shows was put on by troops of U.S. Army and Korean entertainers, and the U.S. Navy sent Christmas trees and decorations. The first Christmas in Korea was observed with a memorable display of holiday spirit by men who had cause to be thankful. A choir from the 5th Marines serenaded division headquarters with carols on Christmas Eve, and all the next day the commanding general and ADC held open house for staff officers and unit commanders. The United States as a whole rejoiced over the news that the last of the 105,000 10 Corps troops had embarked from Hungnam on 24 December without a single life being lost as a result of enemy action. President Truman spoke for the nation when he sent this message to General MacArthur. Wish to express my personal thanks to you, Admiral Joy, General Almond, and all your brave men for the effective operations at Hungnam. This saving of our men in this isolated beachhead is the best Christmas present I have ever had. Photographers and press correspondents flocked to Masan during the holiday season for pictures and interviews about various aspects of the Chosen Reservoir campaign. Among them was Captain John Ford, U.S. Navy Reserve, a successful motion picture director who had been recalled to active duty to make a documentary film depicting the role of the Navy and Marine Corps in Korea. He used scenes in the Masan area for background material. General Smith was informed that a motion picture company intended to produce a feature film entitled Retreat Hell, based on a remark attributed to him. Retreat Hell, we are just attacking in a different direction. When asked if these actually were his words, the division commander had a diplomatic answer. He said that he had pointed out to correspondents at Hagaru that the drive to Hamhung was not a typical withdrawal or retreat, and thus the statement attributed to me described my thinking, that of my staff and unit commanders, and my situation. During the Masson interlude, Colonel S.L.A. Marshall, U.S. Air Force Reserve, arrived as a representative of the Operations Research Office of Johns Hopkins University, which had been employed on military research projects by the Far East Command. Marshall, a well-known military analyst who had written several books about World War II operations, based his studies on personal interviews with scores of participants. The researcher was given a free hand at Masson, Aided by a stenographer, he interviewed officers and men from privates to commanding general. The resulting thousands of words went into a classified report entitled CCF in the Attack, Part 2, a study based on the operations of the 1st Marine Division in the Kotori, Hagaruri, Udamni area, 20 November to 10 December 1950. General Ridgway, new USAC commander. Shortly after arrival at Masan, General Smith called a conference of unit commanders and emphasized that their task was to re-equip, resupply, repair, and rehabilitate. Officers and men of replacement drafts were to be integrated and given unit training as soon as possible. Both veterans and newcomers were soon training in regimental areas assigned by Colonel Alpha L. Bowser, the Division G-3, who arranged for a 200-yard rifle range and a mortar range. On 23 December came the news that Lt. Gen. Walton H. Walker, the 8th Army commander, had been killed in a jeep accident. His successor, Lt. Gen. Matthew B. Ridgway, U.S. Army, had commanded the U.S. 18 Airborne Corps in Europe during the final operations of World War II. Commencing his flight from Washington on the 24th, he landed at Tokyo just before midnight on Christmas Day. The new commander's task was made more difficult by the fact that the Korean conflict, at the end of its first six months, had become probably the most unpopular military venture of American history, both at the front and in the United States. From a mere police action at first, the struggle soon developed into a major effort in which the national pride suffered humiliations as a consequence of military unpreparedness. Far from building up the morale of the troops, letters and newspapers from home too often contributed to the doubts of men who asked themselves these questions. 
Why are we here and what are we fighting for? Some of the answers were scarcely reassuring. It was insinuated, for instance, that Americans were fighting to make South Korean real estate safe for South Koreans. I must say in all frankness, commented General Ridgway in his memoirs, that the spirit of the 8th Army as I found it on my arrival gave me deep concern. There was a definite air of nervousness, of gloomy foreboding, of uncertainty, a spirit of apprehension as to what the future held. There was much looking over the shoulder, as the soldiers say. These criticisms were not applicable to the 1st Marine Division. Our men were in high spirits and busily engaged in getting ready to fight again, commented Brigadier General Edward A. Craig, ADC. In my travels around the various units of the division, and in talking to the men, I never even once noticed any air of nervousness or apprehension. When General Ridgway visited the division at Masan, he made a tour of the entire camp area and observed training and general arrangements. He stated that he was quite satisfied with the 1st Marine Division and its quick comeback from the chosen fighting. General Ridgway learned soon after his arrival that the 8th Army staff had prepared a plan for a phased withdrawal to Pusan in case of necessity. He called immediately for a plan of attack. Prospects of putting it into effect were not bright at the moment, but at least it served to announce his intentions. Rumors were rife at this time that a general withdrawal from Korea, in virtual acknowledgment of defeat, was contemplated. In a letter of 1957, General Douglas MacArthur wrote an emphatic denial. I have no means of knowing whether such action may have been seriously considered in Washington, but, for my own part, I never contemplated such a withdrawal and made no plans to that effect. The front hugged the 38th parallel during the last week of December as the 8th Army held a defensive line along the munsan chungchon yangyang axis. Three U.S. divisions were in a combat zone occupied largely by rock units. The 24th and 25th Divisions, both reduced a third in strength by casualties, remained in contact with the enemy in West Korea, while the 1st Cavalry Division, also depleted in numbers, occupied blocking positions to the rear. Personnel and equipment losses suffered by the 2nd Division during the CCF counteroffensive of late November had rendered it non-effective as a tactical unit until it could be reinforced and re-equipped and the 3rd and 7th Infantry Divisions had just landed in the pusan Ulsan area after the Hungnam redeployment. On 27 December 1950, the Commanding General began a three-day tour of 8th Army units at the front. He talked to hundreds of soldiers ranging from privates to unit commanders. There was nothing the matter with the 8th Army, he assured them, that confidence wouldn't cure. I told them their soldier forebears would turn over in their graves if they heard some of the stories I had heard about the behavior of some of our troop leaders in combat. The job of a commander was to be up where the crisis of action was taking place. In time of battle, I wanted division commanders to be up with their forward battalions, and I wanted corps commanders up with the regiment that was in the hottest action. If they had paperwork to do, they could do it at night. By day their place was up there where the shooting was going on. It could never have been said that this professional soldier, the son of a regular army colonel, had failed to set an example in his own career. As the commander of an airborne division, he had jumped along with his men in Normandy. Seldom seen in Korea without a grenade attached to his harness, Ridgway insisted that it was not a gesture of showmanship. In mobile warfare, a man might be surprised by the enemy when he least expected it, he said, and a grenade was useful for blasting one's way out of a tight spot. Ridgway's Declaration of Faith After completing his tour of the combat area, the commanding general concluded that one thing was still lacking. Soldiers of the 8th Army hadn't as yet been given an adequate answer to the questions, Why are we here? And what are we fighting for? In the belief that the men were entitled to an answer from their commanding general, he sat down in his room and wrote this declaration of faith. To me, the issues are clear. It is not a question of this or that Korean town or village. Real estate is here, incidental. 
The real issues are whether the power of Western civilization, as God has permitted it to flower in our own beloved lands, shall defy and defeat communism, whether the rule of men who shoot their prisoners, enslave their citizens, and deride the dignity of man shall displace the rule of those to whom the individual and individual rights are sacred, whether we are to survive with God's hand to guide and lead us, or to perish in the dead existence of a godless world. If these be true, and to me they are, beyond any possibility of challenge, then this has long since ceased to be a fight for freedom for our Korean allies alone and for their national survival. It has become, and it continues to be, a fight for our own freedom, for our own survival, in an honorable, independent national existence. The deep conviction of this declaration could not be doubted. But Ridgway did not confine himself to moral leadership. He also insisted on a return to sound tactical principles. Upon learning that some of the infantry commanders in combat sectors had no knowledge of the enemy's strength or whereabouts, he ordered that aggressive patrolling be resumed at once. He directed further that every unit make a resolute effort to provide a hot reception for the Red Chinese patrols which had met too little opposition while prodding every night for soft spots along the thinly held 135-mile United Nations line. In his talks with officers and men, the new commander told them that too many weapons and vehicles had fallen into the hands of the enemy during the withdrawals in West Korea. He made it plain that in the future, any man abandoning equipment without good cause would be court-martialed. Not only did Ridgway stress the increased use of firepower, he requested in one of his first messages to the Pentagon that ten additional battalions of artillery be sent to Korea. These guns were to provide the tactical punch when he found an opportunity to take the offensive. Meanwhile, he had the problem of putting up a defense against a Chinese communist offensive expected within a week. On his first day as 8th Army commander, he sent a request to President Syngman Rhee of the Republic of Korea for 30,000 native laborers to dig field fortifications. The energetic, 71-year-old Korean patriot provided the first 10,000 at dawn the following morning and the others during the next two days. Armed with picks and shovels, this army of toilers created two broad belts of defense, one to the north and one to the south of the Han River. The purpose of the first was to stop the enemy if American firepower could compensate for lack of numbers, and the second was a final line to be held resolutely. End of chapter 1, part 1. Chapter 1, Part 2 of U.S. Marine Operations in Korea, 1950-1953, Volume 4, The East Central Front, by Lynn Montross, Norman Hicks, and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Interlude at Masan Marine Personnel and Equipment Shortages Although the Marine ground forces found themselves in the unusual situation of being 200 miles behind the front, they could be sure that this respite wouldn't last. Every effort was being pushed to restore the division to combat efficiency by a command and staff acutely aware of shortages of men and equipment. The effective strength on 29 December 1950 was 1,304 officers and 20,696 men, including 182 attached U.S. Army troops and 143 Royal Marine Commandos. This total also included 28 officers and 1,615 men who had arrived in a replacement draft of 17 December, and 4 officers and 365 men in a draft of 3 days later. Authorized division strength was 1,438 officers and 24,504 men, indicating a shortage of 134 officers and 3,808 men. Most of the deficiencies were in the infantry and artillery units. 29 officers and 2,951 men in the three infantry regiments, and 38 officers and 538 men in the artillery. 
Division G1 had been informed by the FMF PAC representative in Japan that about 5,000 casualties were hospitalized there, and an unknown number had been evacuated to the United States because of overcrowding of hospitals in Japan. Such factors made it difficult to predict how many would return to the division, but G1 estimated from 500 to 1,000 in January. The situation in regard to division equipment might be summed up by saying that on 23 December there was a serious shortage of practically all essential items with the single exception of M1 rifles. Upon arrival at Masan, units had been required to submit stock status reports. Their lists were forwarded on 23 December to the commanding general, 8th Army, with a notification that requisitions had been submitted to the 2nd Logistical Command, U.S. Army, in Pusan. It was requested that deliveries of supplies and equipment be speeded up, so that the division could soon be restored to its former combat efficiency. A comparison of the totals of selected items on 23 and 31 December, as listed on the following page, shows that considerable progress was made during those eight days. Bags sleeping. Allowance, 23,000. 23 December 50 shortage, 3,585. 31 December 50 shortage, zero. Machine gun, Browning, caliber 30, M1919A4. Allowance, 1,398. 23 December 50 shortage, 338. 31 December 50 shortage, zero. Bar, 30 caliber. Allowance, 904. 23 December 50 shortage, 441. 31 December 50 shortage, zero. Carbine, 30 caliber, M2. Allowance, 11,084. 23 December 50 shortage, 2,075. 31 December 50 shortage, zero. Launcher, rocket, 3.5 inch, M20. Allowance, 396. 23 December 50 shortage, 105. 31 December 50 shortage, zero. Howitzer, 105 millimeter. Allowance, 54. 23 December 50 shortage, eight. 31 December 50 shortage, zero. Howitzer, 155 millimeter. Allowance, 18. 23 December 50 shortage, nine. 31 December 50 shortage, zero. Glasses, field, seven by 50. Allowance, 1,740. 23 December 50 shortage, 1,305. 31 December 50 shortage, 1,006. Tank, medium, M4A3, dozer, 105 millimeter. Allowance, 12. 23 December 50 shortage, 7. 31 December 50 shortage, 7. Tank, medium, M26, 90 millimeter. Allowance, 85. 23 December 50 shortage, 16. 31 December 50 shortage, 12. Truck, one quarter ton, four by four. Allowance, 641. 23 December 50 shortage, 105. 31 December 50 shortage, 58. Truck, one and a half ton, six by six cargo. Allowance, 54. 23 December 50 shortage, three. 31 December 50 shortage, zero. Truck, two and a half ton, six by six cargo. Allowance, 737. 23 December 50 shortage, 124. 31 December 50 shortage, 33. Radio set SCR 536. Allowance, 474. 23 December 50 shortage, 211. 31 December 50 shortage, 211. Radio set SCR 619. Allowance 137. 23 December 50 shortage 74. 31 December 50 shortage 49. Telephone EE8. Allowance 1162. 23 December 50 shortage 58. 31 December 50 shortage 58. The second logistical command in Pusan commanded by Brigadier General Crump Garvin, U.S. Army, deserved much of the credit for the week's restoration of marine equipment. Progress passed all expectations, considering that General Garvin was supplying other 8th Army units which had lost equipment during their withdrawal. 
There still existed on 29 December a requirement for clothing and individual equipment, and the spare parts problem remained acute. Ironically, the fact that the 1st Marine Division had brought most of its motor transport out from the chosen reservoir was a handicap at Masson. Eighth Army units which had lost their vehicles were given priority for receiving new ones. This meant that the Marines must make the best of war-worn trucks. Marine Air Squadrons in Action While the ground forces trained in the Masson area, the Corsair Squadrons and the Jet Squadron flew combat missions. Support of the Hungnam redeployment had top priority until 24 December, when the last of the 105,000 troops were evacuated by Rear Admiral James H. Doyle's Task Force 90. Such totals as 91,000 Korean refugees, 17,500 vehicles, and 350,000 measurement tons of cargo were also recorded by the U.S. Navy's largest operation of the Korean conflict. No serious trouble was experienced from enemy action during the two weeks of the redeployment, although G-2 reports warned that several Chinese divisions were believed to be in the general area. Airstrikes and naval gunfire shared the credit for this result. Nearly 34,000 shells and 12,800 rockets were fired by the support ships, and UN planes were on station or carrying out missions every moment that weather permitted. Marine fighters of VMF-212, VMF-214, and VMF-323, flying from carriers after the closing of Yanpo Airfield, made a noteworthy contribution to the success of the Hungnam redeployment. VMF-212, commanded by Lt. Col. Richard W. Wachowski, was assigned the task of gathering the helicopters of VMO-6 from various ships of the 7th Fleet and returning them to the operational control of the 1st Marine Division at Masan. There, the OYs of the Observation Squadron were waiting after an overland flight, and Major Vincent J. Gotchalk's unit was complete. With the Hungnam redeployment ended, the Navy offered to make its primary carrier-borne air effort in support of the 8th Army. There was no single overall commander of Navy and Air Force aviation in Korea, other than General MacArthur himself, and the two services were working under a system of mutual agreement and coordination. The Far East Air Forces, FIF, under Lt. Gen. George E. Stratemeyer, was the senior Air Force command in the Far East, on the same level as ComNav Phi, Vice Admiral C. Turner Joy. The largest FIF subordinate command was the 5th Air Force, commanded by Major General Earl E. Partridge, with headquarters at Tegu, alongside that of the 8th Army. Strictly speaking, land-based marine air had been under 5th Air Force operational control throughout the chosen reservoir operation. Actually, a verbal agreement between General Partridge and Major General Field Harris commanding the 1st Marine Aircraft Wing, MAW, had given the Marines a good deal of latitude in making decisions relative to close air support. This was often the salvation of Marine units during the breakout, when every minute counted. Later, during the Hungnam redeployment, control of Marine aircraft became the responsibility of Admiral Doyle. His control agency was Tactical Air Control Squadron 1, TACRON 1, in his flagship, the Mount McKinley. Tacron 1 kept in close touch not only with the 3rd Infantry Division, U.S. Army, defending the shrinking perimeter, but also with the 8th Army and 5th Air Force. During the last days of 1950, the four Marine Air Squadrons were kept busy. VMF-212 on the Bataan was attached to TF-77. The coastline of East Korea was its hunting grounds for such missions as knocking out warehouses, bridges, and railway tunnels between the 38th and 39th parallels. Along the west coast, VMF-214 on the Sicily and VMF-323 on the Badong Strait were commanded respectively by Major William M. London and Major Arnold A. Lund. These squadrons were part of Task Group 95.1 under Vice Admiral Sir William G. Andrews, Royal Navy. The Marine aviators found themselves in an organization made up of Royal Commonwealth Naval Forces and of French, Thai, and ROC units. 
TG 95.1 had the responsibility for patrolling the western coastline to prohibit enemy movement by water and military junks and by vehicle along the littoral. VMF 311, the jet squadron commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Neil R. McIntyre, remained the only land-based Marine air unit in Korea. The 5th Air Force had made space for it on crowded K-9, seven air miles northeast of Pusan, when General Harris expressed a desire to keep his jets in Korea for possible defense against Red Air attacks. McIntyre exercised his prerogative as squadron commander to fly the unit's first combat mission on 17 December. He was not, however, the first Marine aviator to pilot a jet in combat. That distinction went to Captain Leslie E. Brown on 9 September 1950. Assigned to the 5th Air Force's 8th Fighter Bomber Squadron as an exchange pilot, he made the first of several routine flights with an F-80 shooting star. On 20 December, 17 officers and 51 enlisted men arrived at K-9 to boost VMF 311's total to 27 officer pilots and 95 enlisted men. Under 5th Air Force control, they were employed to attack suspected CCF troop shelters, entrenchments, and gun positions on the eve of the expected enemy offensive. Missions of the jet planes averaged 12 a day at the end of the month. The Air Force System of Control It was seldom realized in the middle of the 20th century that for the first time since the Middle Ages, a single human being represented in his person a decisive tactical unit. Just as the mailed knight on his barded charter had ruled the battlefields of the medieval world, so did the pilot of a modern aircraft have the power to put an enemy battalion to flight with napalm or to knock out an enemy stronghold with a 500-pound bomb. A great deal depended, of course, on how the lightning of this human thunderbolt was controlled. The Marine Corps and the Air Force had different ideas on the subject. At the foundation of the Marine system was the concept that the needs of the ground forces came first and control of air support should be exercised by the troops being supported. In each Marine Infantry Battalion, a Tactical Air Control Party, TACP, included two aviators, one to be employed as a forward air controller, FAC, at the front, and the other as an air liaison officer in the Battalion Supporting Arms Center, SAC. In an emergency, both could quickly be assigned to companies or even platoons to talk airstrikes down on the enemy. The normal chain of command was bypassed in favor of direct radio from the TACP to the Cognizant Air Control Agency that had the authority to cross-check the request for possible conflict with other operations and to channel fighter bombers to the attack. Intermediate commands kept themselves informed of the overall air picture and controlled the employment of aviation by their own subordinates as they listened in on these requests. They indicated approval by remaining silent and disapproval by transmitting a countermand. The hub of the Air Force system was the Tactical Air Control Center, TACC, of the 5th Air Force, USAC, Joint Operations Center, JOC, known by the code name MELO. An aviator coming on duty called up Mello and received his instructions from Jock. Facts were assigned to U.S. Army and British units down to Corps, Division, and Regimental levels, and to Rock Corps and Divisions. Further assignment to smaller frontline units was possible but entailed a good deal of time and advanced planning. And even the most urgent requests had to be channeled through Division and Regimental levels to Jock for approval. If a Marine fac wasn't able to control an airstrike visually because of terrain conditions, he called for a Tactical Air Coordinator, Airborne, TACA, to locate the target from the air and direct planes to the attack. The 5th Air Force also used special airborne coordinators. Known as Mosquitoes, they flew low-winged, two-seater North American training planes, designated T-6s by the Air Force and SNJs by the Navy. This plan was capable under favorable circumstances of providing the 5th Air Force USAC tactical air control system with a mobile and flexible means of directing air power at the front. Its chief weakness, according to Marine doctrine, lay in the separation of air power from ground force control. The Air Force claimed the advantage of projecting tactical air power deep into enemy territory, but as the Marines saw it, 
This was deep or interdictory support and not to be compared to genuine close air support. Ten Corps Conference at Kyongju. The command and staff of the 1st Marine Division could only speculate during this interim period as to what the near future might hold for them. Rumors had been circulated during the first week at Masan that the division would be employed as rear guard to cover an 8th Army withdrawal from Korea, with Pusan serving as the port of debarkation. And while plans cannot be made on a basis of rumor, General Smith and Colonel Bowser went so far as to discuss the possibility seriously. At last, on 24 December, a more definite prospect loomed when the USAC staff requested the division to furnish logistical data for a move by rail and truck to Wanju, some 130 miles north of Masan. It was not known whether an actual move was contemplated or the intention was merely to have available a plan for future use if the occasion warranted. General Smith sent the data but added a strong recommendation to the effect that any commitment of the division be postponed until it was re-equipped and strengthened by replacements. At this time, the Marine General received a copy of a map prepared by the 8th Army staff which showed the phase lines of a 200-mile withdrawal from the combat zone to the Pusan port of debarkation. No enlightenment as to the employment of the division was forthcoming until 27 December 1950, however, when a USAC dispatch directed that the Marines be detached from 8th Army Reserve and reassigned to the operational control of 10 Corps. A message of the 28th requested General Smith to attend a conference at the 10 Corps CP at Kyongju, about 60 air miles northeast of Masan, on the 30th. He was directed to bring several members of his staff with him and to assign a liaison officer to 10 Corps. Two VMO-6 helicopters flew him to Kyonju along with his G-3 Colonel Bowser and his aide, Captain Martin J. Sexton. Tossed by high winds, they landed just in time to meet General Ridgway, who gave a talk emphasizing the necessity for reconnaissance and maintaining contact with the enemy. The new plan for 10 Corps employment, as modified after discussion with the 8th Army commander, called for the recently reorganized 2nd Infantry Division to be placed under operational control of General Almond. It was to move out at once to the Wanju Front, followed by the 3rd and 7th Infantry Divisions. The 1st Marine Division was to stage at Pohangdong on the east coast, some 65 miles north of Pusan, with a view to being eventually employed on this same front. Certainly no one could accuse General Allman, the 10 Corps commander, of defeatism, was a tribute paid by General Smith. On the contrary, the Marine General had sometimes differed with him on the grounds that he was aggressive to the point of giving too little weight to logistical considerations and time and space factors. It was realized at the conference that administrative decisions must depend to a large extent on the outcome of the impending enemy offensive. G-2 officers of the 8th Army, forewarned by prisoner interrogations, were not surprised when the blow fell shortly before midnight on the last night of the year. In spite of Air Force bombings of roads and suspected supply dumps, the Chinese Reds had been able to mount a great new offensive only three weeks after the old one ended. Attacking in the bitter cold of New Year's Eve, They made penetrations during the first few hours in rock-held sectors of the central and eastern fronts. By daybreak, it became evident that Seoul was a major objective, with the UN situation deteriorating rapidly. End of chapter 1, part 2. Chapter 2, Part 1 of U.S. Marine Operations in Korea, 1950-1953, Volume 4, The East Central Front, by Lynn Montross, Norman Hicks, and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The CCF January Offensive On the last day of 1950, the 1st Marine Division was alerted for two missions within an hour. At 1425, it was detached from 10 Corps after only four days and once more assigned to the operational control of the 8th Army. 
The Marines were directed to resume their former mission of training, reorganizing, and replacing the equipment so that they could be employed either to block enemy penetrations along the Olchen Yongju Yechon axis or to take over a sector along the main line of resistance, MLR. Forty minutes later, another USAC dispatch alerted the division to move to the Pohang Andong area, where it would be in position to block any CCF penetration. This warning order came as no surprise, since Tenkor had already contemplated such employment for General Smith's troops. In fact, General Craig and Deputy Chief of Staff Colonel Edward W. Snedeker had left Masan that very morning to select assembly areas and command posts. At a conference of G3 and G4 officers held at Masan on New Year's Day, it was recommended that the administrative headquarters remain in its present location when the rest of the division moved up to Pohong. Although this headquarters had accompanied the division CP in the past, it was believed that gains in mobility would result if the large number of clerical personnel and their increasing bulk of documents were left behind. In view of the changing situation at the front, there was less danger of losing valuable records if the headquarters continued to function at Masan, maintaining contact with the forward CP by means of daily courier planes. The plan was approved by the division commander and worked out to general satisfaction. UN forces give ground. Decisions were made during the first few days of 1951 in an atmosphere of suspense and strain as adverse reports came from the firing line. General Ridgway had assumed correctly, on the basis of prisoner interrogations, that the main Chinese effort would be channeled down the historical invasion corridor north of Seoul. He made his dispositions accordingly, and the 8th Army Order of Battle on 31 December 1950 was as follows. U.S. 1 Corps, Turkish Brigade, U.S. 25th Division, Rock 1st Division, from left to right northwest of Seoul, in Corps Reserve, British 29th Brigade, U.S. 9 Corps, Rock 6th Division, U.S. 24th Division, from left to right north of Seoul, in Corps Reserve, British Commonwealth 27th Brigade, U.S. 1st Cavalry Division, Rock 3 Corps, Rock 2nd, 5th, and 8th Divisions from left to right on Central Front. In Corps Reserve, Rock 7th Division. Rock 2 Corps. Rock 3rd Division on East Central Front. Rock 1 Corps. Rock 9th and Capital Divisions from left to right on Eastern Front. The U.S. 10 Corps, comprising the newly reorganized U.S. 2nd Infantry Division at Wanju and the 7th Infantry Division in the Chengju area, had been given a mission of bolstering the rock-held line in Central and East Korea and blocking enemy penetrations to the rear. An 8th Army Reserve was the 187th Airborne RCT, with Thailand Battalion attached, in the Suwon area. Also under USAC operational control in rear areas were the 1st Marine Division, Masan, the 3rd Infantry Division, Kyongju, the Canadian Battalion, Miryang, and the New Zealand Field Artillery Battalion, Pusan. Altogether, the United Nations forces in Korea numbered 444,336 men as of January 1951. The cosmopolitan character of the fight against communism is indicated by the aid given to the U.S. and ROC forces by contingents of combat troops from 13 other nations, Australia, Belgium, Canada, Ethiopia, France, Greece, Netherlands, New Zealand, Philippines, South Africa, Thailand, Turkey, and the United Kingdom. Enemy numbers at this time were estimated at a total of 740,000 men in Korea and nearby Manchuria. Seven CCF armies, the 37th, 38th, 39th, 40th, 42nd, 50th, and 66th were identified among the troops attacking on New Year's Eve. The NKPA 1 and 5 Corps also participated. Estimated strength of the assaulting force was 174,000 Chinese and 60,000 North Koreans. 
Previously identified but not reported in contact with U.S. forces on 31 December were the 24th, 48th, 49th, and 65th CCF Armies and the NKPA 1st, 3rd, and 15th Divisions. As another possibility which could not be overlooked, the five CCF Armies which had opposed 10 Corps in Northeast Korea might also take part in the new offensive. Elements of the 20th, 26th, 27th, 30th, and 32nd Armies identified in that area early in December had more than two weeks in which to reorganize and make their way to the 8th Army front. If they got into the fight, it would mean a formidable addition to the enemy's forces. With only five days at his disposal, after arrival in Korea, General Ridgway's preparations were limited. His dispositions could not be blamed, but it was the old story of the chain and its weakest link as the enemy scored a major breakthrough at the expense of the 1st Rock Division on the West Central Front. Unfortunately, this unit represented the tactical joint between 1 Corps and 9 Corps. The enemy widened the gap before dawn and drove on towards Seoul. Early in the morning, the USAC commanding general was on the road, waving his arms in an attempt to stop rock soldiers streaming rearward in their vehicles after abandoning crew-served weapons. The short training period for these troops, their tactical inexperience, and the language barrier were the dissonant notes tolling the ominous chords of defeat. The whole front was endangered as the enemy poured through an ever-widening gap, and Ridgway ordered that roadblocks be set up where MPs could halt the fugitives, rearm them, and send them back to the front. At his request, President Syngman Rhee appealed to rock soldiers over the radio and exhorted them to make a stand. By that time it was too late to save Seoul, and the commanding general gave orders for its evacuation. The withdrawal was initiated in mid-afternoon on the 3rd, he commented in retrospect. I stayed on the bridge site on the north bank until dark to watch the passage of the most critical loads. These were the 8-inch howitzers and the British Centurion tanks, both of which exceeded the safety limits of the bridge under the conditions existing at the time. It was a scene of terror and despair that Ridgway never forgot. Thousands of Korean civilian refugees were making their way over the thin ice of the River Han, many of them carrying children or old people on their backs. What impressed the observer most was the uncanny silence of this mass flight in the freezing winter dusk, broken only by the sound of a multitude of feet shuffling over the ice, a sound strangely like a vast whispering. It was as if these derelicts of war were trying incoherently to confide their misery to someone. From a strategic viewpoint, the only course left to the 8th Army was a continued retirement south of Seoul. We came back fast, Ridgway admitted, but as a fighting army, not as a running mob, we brought our dead and wounded with us, and our guns, and our will to fight. Further 8th Army Withdrawals USAC Fragmentary Operations Plan 20, issued as an order on 4 January, called for a further withdrawal to Line D. In preparation, 10 Corps had moved up to the front on the 2nd after assuming operational control of the U.S. 2nd and 7th Infantry Divisions and the ROC 2nd, 5th, and 8th Divisions and occupied a sector between U.S. 9 Corps and ROC 3 Corps. The U.S. 3rd Division was attached to 1 Corps, and the 187th Airborne RCT passed temporarily under operational control of 9 Corps. By 7 January, the U.N. forces had pulled back to a modified Line D extending from Pyeongtaek on the west coast to Samchak on the east and taking in Yeoju and Chechan. General Ridgway sent telegrams to all Corps commanders expressing dissatisfaction with the personnel and material losses inflicted on the enemy during the withdrawal. I shall expect, each message concluded, utmost exploitation of every opportunity in accordance with my basic directive. That evening, foreshadowing the offensive operations he was contemplating, the commanding general ordered a reconnaissance in force by a reinforced infantry regiment north to Osan to search out the enemy and inflict maximum punishment. No contacts were made, 
nor did strong patrols sent out by the U.S. 9 Corps flesh out any sizable groups of Chinese. But the 8th Army had served notice that it intended to regain the initiative at the first opportunity. One more blow remained to be absorbed. On the 8th, the Communists struck in the Wanju area with an attack of four divisions. Elements of the newly reorganized 2nd Infantry Division were forced to give up that important highway and rail center after counterattacks failed. The enemy now directed his main effort along the chunchon wanju chechon corridor, and North Korean guerrilla forces infiltrated through the gap between the U.S. 10 Corps and ROC 3 Corps. The salient created by this CCF attack caused Line D to be modified again so that in the center it dipped sharply downward to Chungju before curving northeast to Samchak. Marine Aircraft in the Battle The pilots and air crewmen of the three carrier squadrons and the land-based jet squadron were the only Marines in a position to take an active part in the battle. With but one TACP per division, Close air support was out of the question for the rocks on New Year's Day. Control facilities were severely strained when scores of UN flyers made use of the frequencies which the mosquitoes employed for tactical air direction. The voices were all in English language, but with more than one person doing the sending, shrill side noises sliced in to garble the hole into a cacophony of jungle sounds. A mosquito trying to coach a fighter bomber attack at the crossing of the Imjin might be drowned out by a distant pilot calling up a controller in the Huichan Reservoir area. As a consequence, there was no coordinated air ground attack in direct support of the man in the foxhole. Most of the jock effort was directed to the enemy's rear in an effort to block supporting arms, reinforcements, and supplies. The two marine squadrons attached to Admiral Rubel's carriers were at sea, some 80 miles south of Inchon, when the news of the Chinese offensive filtered through the tedious communication channels from Jock and USAC. Major Lund, CO of VMF-323, led an eight-plane attack which destroyed enemy trucks and some 40 huts believed to be occupied by CCF troops in a village south of the Imjin. Another Marine air mission of New Year's Day was the flight commanded by Major Kenneth L. Rooser for the purpose of wiping out a reported CCF concentration on the Central Front. Unfortunately, he could not get verification that the target consisted of enemy troops. Before a decision could be made, Rooser heard a mosquito of the 2nd Rock Division calling urgently for any flyer in the area to hit another CCF concentration, this time verified in a village to the enemy's rear of the Chorwan Huichan area. Under the Mosquito's direction, the Corsairs bombed and napalmed the village, then strafed survivors trying to escape. VMF-212, flying with Navy Task Force TF-77 on the eastern side of the peninsula, had a busy New Year's Day. Two eight-plane interdiction strikes were flown in the morning against rear area targets along the coastal highways. The afternoon brought an emergency call from Jock, and the squadron scrambled 14 planes which hit the east flank of an extensive enemy push south of the Huichan Reservoir. More than 300 UN fighter bombers were sent out under Jock, or Mello, control on the embattled first day of 1951. On the west coast, Takron 3 received more calls for air support than TG-96.8 could fill. Rear Admiral Lyman A. Thackeray sent a request to Admiral Struble in the Missouri for additional carrier planes, and within a few hours the Marines of VMF-212 were detached and on their way to the west coast to join the other two Corsair squadrons of TG-96.8. All four Marine fighter-bomber squadrons took part daily in air operations as the Chinese Reds continued their advance south of Seoul. VMF-311 was badly handicapped, however, by mechanical difficulties. Engine or radio trouble accounted for five aborts of the 15 sorties launched on 4 January. The remaining pilots could not make radio contacts with their assigned mosquito controller and had little choice other than to attack targets of opportunity. The jets continued in action, but it was realized that they were not giving the maximum of their capabilities. 
By mid-January, the squadron had become almost ineffective through no fault of its own. Technical representatives from the companies that had manufactured both engine and plane were flown to K-9, and on the 16th, all jets were grounded. These inspectors did not work on the planes. They were empowered only to report the nature of the trouble to the airplane companies concerned. The companies in turn reported to Buair in Washington, which sent instructions and, if necessary, mechanics to Itami, where major aircraft maintenance was done. Meanwhile, the fall of Seoul meant that the Air Force was evicted by enemy action from such major fields as Kimpo and K-16 on an island in the River Han. The Sabre jets and Mosquitoes had to be pulled back, and soon the F-51s were no longer secure at Suwon from an advancing enemy. Admiral Thackeray's Western Deployment Group completed the evacuation from Incheon of 70,000 tons of supplies, 2,000 vehicles, and about 5,000 troops. As the Navy closed out activities on the West Coast, TG-96.8 sent out its last combat air missions on 7 January. VMF-214 made its final reconnaissance patrols. VMF-212 flew 25 sorties in support of UN troops in Central Korea, and VMF-323 took part in a series of Air Force raids on enemy troop assembly areas in the Hungsong area. Until the last, the carrier marines alternated their 8th Army support missions with routine CAPs, coastal searches, and airfield bombings. Admiral Thackeray's redeployment group, including Tacron 3, completed its task in the Incheon area and departed on the 7th. On that same day, HMS Thesis, flying the flag of Admiral Andrews, was back in West Coast waters as the British pilots resumed their coastal patrols and naval air support on that side of the peninsula. Within a week, VMF-212 and the Bataan returned to fly alternate tours of duty with the pilots of the Thesis. The other two carrier squadrons found themselves unemployed for the time being. Not only were they out of a job, they were also homeless, since the United Nations had been forced to give up airfields at Yanpo, Wansan, Seoul, Kimpo, and Suwon. Only K-1, K-2, K-4, K-9, K-10, and two small fields near Tegu remained, and they would scarcely serve the needs of FIF. Thus it was that VMF-214 and VMF-323 found a temporary haven at Itami, along with VMF-311 and most of the administrative and service units of the first mall. There was nothing to do but wait until a new home could be found for the fighter-bomber squadrons. 1st Marine Division Assigned Mission the Marine aviators might have found some consolation in the fact that their comrades of the ground forces were also groping in a fog of uncertainty. At the most critical period of the CCF thrust in the Wanju area, General Smith was summoned to Tegu on 8 January for a conference with General Ridgway. The 8th Army commander proposed to attach one of the Marine RCTs to Ten Corps in the Andong area, about 95 air miles north of Masan. The remainder of the division would then move to the Pohang Kyungju Yongchong area, some 60 air miles northeast of Masan. Ridgway asked the Marine General to discuss the prospect with his staff. He realized, he said, that no commander liked to have his division split up, and he assured Smith that as soon as the Ten Corps zone became stabilized, the RCT would be sent back to him. They parted with this understanding but a few hours after his return by air to Masan, the following message was received from Ridgeway. Subsequent your departure, alternate plan occurred to me on which I would like your views soonest. It follows. First Mar Div, under Army control, move without delay to general area outlined to you personally today to take over responsibility at date and hour to be announced later for protection of MSR between Andong and Kyongju, both inclusive, and prevent hostile penetration in force south of Andong Yongdok Road. At 11.15 on the 9th, the plan was made official. An 8th Army dispatch ordered the 1st Marine Division to move without delay to the Pohong area, remaining under USAC control, with the following missions. A. Prevent enemy penetrations in force south of the Andong Yongdok Road. 
B. Protect the MSR connecting Pohong, Kyungju, Yongchon, Weehong, and Weesong. Based on these directives, Division Operation Order 1-51 was issued at 1600 on the 9th. RCT-1 was directed to move by motor to Yongchon and protect the MSR, Yongchon to Weesong inclusive, from positions in the vicinity of Yongchon and Weehong. The 1st and 7th Motor Transport Battalions, plus other division elements, were ordered to provide the required trucks. General Ridgway arrived at Masan by plane on the morning of 9 January. He was met by General Smith and driven to headquarters, where the division staff officers and regimental commanders were presented to him. In a brief talk, he reiterated the necessity for reconnaissance and for regaining and maintaining contact with the enemy. The Marine officers were told that limited offensive actions by 8th Army units would be put into effect soon. Division Operation Order 2-51, issued at 1300 on the 10th, provided for the completion of the division movement by road and water from Masan to the objective area. Shortages both of personnel and equipment were much reduced during the first two weeks of January. Returns to duty of battle and non-battle casualties added 945 to the division strength. Corresponding improvements had been made in the material readiness of the division. Early in January, a large resupply shipment arrived from Kobe, and a Navy cargo ship brought supplies and equipment which had been left behind at Incheon in October. Thus, the situation was generally satisfactory except for nearly 1,900 gaps in the ranks that remained to be filled. End of Chapter 2, Part 1《Chapter 2 Part 2 of U.S. Marine Operations in Korea, 1950-1953, Volume 4, The East Central Front, by Lynn Montross, Norman Hicks, and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The CCF January Offensive Replacements by Air and Sea Facilities for air transport across the Pacific were limited since the Army was also moving replacements to the Far East. A piecemeal process of shuttling Marines in plane load increments could not be completed before 30 January. Lieutenant General Lemuel C. Shepard, Jr., commanding FMF PAC, took a dim view of this delay. It would be better for the division, he maintained, to receive even a part of its replacements before it went back into action. As a compromise, he proposed a combined air-sea lift which met the approval of Rear Admiral Arthur H. Radford, commanding Pacific Fleet. Three replacement drafts were already on the way, with the third in Japan and the fourth and fifth at Camp Pendleton. General Shepard scraped the bottom of the manpower barrel so closely that he dug up an additional 700 men from Marine Security Detachments in Japan, the Philippines, and other Pacific Ocean bases. Seven train loads of Marines from Camp Lejeune arrived at San Francisco on 10 January to join those from Camp Pendleton. On the same day, 230 of these replacements were flown to Hawaii by the Military Air Transportation Service, MATS, by the R-5Ds of Marine VMR-352 and of Navy VR-5, and by the Mars flying boats of Navy VR-9. The next day, 799 Marines sailed on the fast transport USNS General W.O. Darby. The remainder were transported at the rate of one plane load a day by MATS and at the rate of three or four plane loads a day by the Navy and Marine transport planes of Fleet Logistics Air Wing, Pacific, Flog Air Wing, PAC. Five days later, on the 16th, the airlift had cleared the last Marine out of Treasure Island. On 21 January, 1,000 men of the Special Draft were already with the 1st Division at Pohong, and the 799 on board General Darby were due to dock at Pusan. It had been a fast job of coordination by the Navy, Army, Air Force, and virtually all major units of the Marine Corps. Much of the Special Airlift was flown by the R-5Ds of VMR-352 and of VMR-152. 
The former, commanded by Colonel William B. Steiner, had been flying the El Toro Tokyo flight since October, but most of its effort had been in shuttling between the mainland and Hawaii. VMR-152 had concentrated on the Hawaii-Japan leg of the long trip. During the chosen campaign, the squadron commander, Colonel Dean C. Roberts, had maintained his headquarters and ten planes at Itami to support the shuttle to Korea. He had barely returned to Hawaii from that job when his squadron was alerted not only for the special lift of marine replacements, but also for a return to the Far East. Hawaii had been the bottleneck in this special troop lift. Land and seaplanes were discharging their human cargo at Barbers Point, Hickam Air Force Base, and Kihai Lagoon. From there, Flog Air Wing Pack had to space the planes over the long stretches of sea at approximately four-hour intervals. The guiding factor was other air traffic over the same route and the servicing, messing, and rescue capabilities of Guam and other points along the way, such as Tiny Johnston Island. The latter was barely big enough for its single 6,100-foot runway. VMR-152 and the Navy's VR-21 were assigned the mission of flying the long Hawaii-Japan portion of the big lift. Itami became another collection center for the airborne replacements, and five of the VMR-152 planes were retained there to shuttle the troops the last 300 miles to K-3, near Pohang. On 21 January, the troop lift reached virtual completion, but Admiral Radford authorized the first MAW to retain a couple of R-5Ds at Itami a little longer. Thus, the Marines were able to avoid highway and rail traffic jams in Korea by flying men and materials from troop and supply centers in Japan to K-1, K-3, or K-9. Looking back at the troop lift from a historical distance, the observer is most impressed by its demonstration of teamwork on a gigantic scale. The Marine Corps had functioned as a single great unit, even though a continent and an ocean separated the vanguard in Korea from the rear echelons in North Carolina. The Move to Japanese Airfields The seven remaining UN airfields in Korea were of course not enough to accommodate the 25 FIF and Marine Tactical Squadrons. Logistics and lack of space proved to be knotty problems. 30 tank cars of gasoline a day were needed for normal flight operations of K-2 alone. Yet it took these cars 8 days to make the 120-mile Pusan-Tegu round trip. Such was the strain put on the railway system by the CCF offensive. FIF had standby plans to evacuate Korea entirely in an emergency. Some of the secondary airfields at the Itazu complex in Japan had been re-evaluated for this purpose. Originally built by the Japanese for World War II, they were obsolescent by 1951 and because of weather, neglect, and misuse badly deteriorated. The most promising of these secondary airfields were Tsuka, Ozuki, and Bofu, ranging from 30 to 65 miles east of Itazuk and facing one another around Japan's inland sea. Nearest to Itazuk and on the same island of Kyushu was Tsuka. Across the narrow Shimonoseki Strait, on the shoreline of Honshu, were Ozuki and Bofu. General Stratemeyer, the FIF commander, informed General MacArthur that it was necessary to start air operations from Ozuki and Bofu as soon as possible. A good deal of work had already been done on Tsuka, even to moving a major Japanese highway in order to lengthen the runway to 7,000 feet. The Air Force General wanted to repair Ozuki for his F-51 squadrons, and Bofu was to be reserved for the first maw. The decision meant a revision of plans for the Marines. MAG-12 had recently been lifting 100 men a day to K-1, Pusan West, with a view to making it into a major base. These preparations came to an abrupt halt, pending the final decision on Bofu. A Marine survey of that World War II airfield showed it to be in serious disrepair. The Air Force had already rejected it as a base for night harassing B-26s. Although the runway was only 7 feet above sea level, a 720-foot hill complicated the traffic pattern. 
Nevertheless, Bofu was considered suitable for the time being, and the Air Force assured the first Ma that its use would be but temporary. Fief proposed that the Marines start flying out of Bofu immediately, operating under field conditions. There were, however, essential repairs to be made. The 5,300-foot runway remained in fair condition, but much of the taxiway was not surfaced and couldn't stand heavy use by the Corsairs. Three of the four hangars needed extensive repairs, as did the barracks and mess hall. Fuel would have to be stored in drums. The wing had the capability for minor construction but lacked the equipment, men, and fiscal authority to handle major work on the runways and taxiways. The Air Force offered to furnish the labor and materials, provided the Navy pay for them. The Navy in its turn was too limited in funds to restore an Air Force field for only temporary use by Marines. Finally, a compromise solved the problem. The Navy agreed to have the engineering work done by a detachment of its Mobile Construction Battalion II, Seabees, and furnish the concrete for patching the runways and rebuilding the warm-up aprons. The Air Force was to provide the pierced steel planking for the runways. On 15 January, MAG-33 sent an advanced detachment of 125 officers and men to Bofu to do some of the preliminary work, and on the following day, the Seabees initiated the heavy construction. The restoration of K-1 was meanwhile resumed by MAG-12. Until these two airfields were made ready, VMF-212 on the Bataan would be the only Marine squadron in combat. Red China's Hate America campaign. The middle of January was also a transition period for the 1st Marine Division. In accordance with Division Orders 1-51 and 2-51, the movement from Masan commenced at 0545 on 10 January when the first serial of RCT-1 departed by motor for the Pohang-Andong area. LSTs 898 and 914 sailed the next day with elements of the tank, ordnance, engineer, and service battalions. The new division CP opened at Sinhung, about five miles southeast of Pohong, at 1600 on 16 January, and by the 17th all designated motor and water lifts were completed. Thus, the 1st Marine Division and 1st Marine Aircraft Wing were poised to begin new operations which will be described in the following chapter. By 15 January, relative quiet prevailed along the entire front. The Chinese Reds had shot their bolt. In terms of territorial gains, the Communists could claim a victory, for they had inflicted heavy losses both in troop casualties and equipment on the UN forces. Yet the CCF January offensive could not compare with the November to December attacks either in morale or material damage done to the 8th Army. This time the UN divisions had withdrawn for the most part in good order after the rout of rock units at the outset. Nor were Ridgeway's troops always driven from their positions by enemy action. Whenever he had an option between sacrificing men or Korean real estate, it was the latter he chose and by his insistence on good combat discipline, he made the enemy pay an exorbitant price. Nevertheless, the blunt fact remains that the United Nations forces had been beaten in spite of an overwhelming superiority in aircraft, artillery, armor, and transport, as well as command of the sea. Stateside Americans can scarcely be blamed for asking themselves why their well-equipped divisions had been defeated twice within six weeks by an Asiatic peasant army using semi-guerrilla tactics and depending largely on small arms, mortars, and light artillery. The answer cannot be given in simplified terms. Although the Chinese Reds were represented by a peasant army, it was also a first-rate army when judged by its own tactical and strategic standards. Military poverty might be blamed for some of its deficiencies in arms and equipment, but its semi-guerrilla tactics were based on a mobility which could not be burdened with heavy weapons and transport. The Chinese coolie in the padded cotton uniform could do one thing better than any other soldier on earth. He could infiltrate around an enemy position in the darkness with unbelievable stealth. Only Americans who have had such an experience can realize what a shock it is to be surprised at midnight with the grenades and submachine gun slugs of gnome-like attackers who seem to rise out of the very earth. 
Press correspondents were fond of referring to the human sea tactics of the Asiatic hordes. Nothing could be further from the truth. In reality, the Chinese seldom attacked in units larger than a regiment. Even these efforts were usually reduced to a seemingly endless succession of platoon infiltrations. It was not mass, but deception and surprise which made the Chinese Red formidable. They also had an advantage over Western soldiers in their ability to withstand hunger and cold while making long night marches. After all, the rigors of a winter campaign in Korea were not much worse than the hardships the Chinese peasant had endured all his life. Usually he was a veteran of at least five years' combat experience, for China had known little but war since the Japanese invasion of 1935. Many of Mao Zedong's troops, in fact, were former nationalists who had fought for Chiang Kai-shek. The Chinese Reds held another advantage in Korean terrain well suited to their tactical system. This factor has been ably summarized by U.S. Military Academy historians. The mountains are high and the deep gorges between them are a bar to traffic even when the streams are dry or frozen. Roads are few and those that do exist are not suited for heavy traffic. Transportation then becomes a problem for the pack mule and the human back rather than the self-propelled vehicle. Telephone wires are difficult to lay and, with gorillas on every hand, are doubly hard to maintain. Even radio is limited by such terrain, with a considerable reduction in range. In all, most observers have agreed that American forces have seldom fought in terrain to which modern means of war are less adaptable. The fanaticism and political indoctrination of the CCF soldier must also be taken into account. His introduction to communism began when he was persuaded that China's small farms would be taken away from the hated landlords and divided among the people. This is the first stage of every communist upheaval. Next comes a reign of terror calculated to liquidate the entire class of landlords and small shopkeepers. Communist China, almost literally wading in blood, had reached this second phase in 1951, the year of violence. Mass trials were held in which the People's Tribunals, keyed up to a frenzy of fury, sentenced group after group of capitalist oppressors to death without bothering about the evidence. The executions were public spectacles. An estimated million and a half of them took place in 1951 alone as loudspeakers on street corners blared out first-hand descriptions. Drives were organized for everything in Red China. So rapidly did they multiply that humorless communist leaders saw no absurdity in announcing a new drive to reduce the number of drives. And when the Youth League tried too zealously to please, a drive was launched to correct the undesirable habit of filing false reports. Under these circumstances, it is understandable that great emphasis was placed on Red China's Hate America drive in early 1951. The illiterate masses were made to believe that Americans practiced all manner of bestialities, including even cannibalism. This was the indoctrination of the CCF soldier in Korea, and political commissars with the captain's authority were attached to each company to see that no backsliding occurred. In case of doubt, it was a simple matter to compel the suspected political deviate to kneel at the roadside and await a bullet from behind. A Tactical Formula for Victory It might well be inquired where Red China raised the funds, for even wars waged with human cannon fodder do not come cheaply. Much of the money was donated by new farm owners as voluntary contributions exceeding by far the rent and taxes of pre-communist years. The slave labor of millions of Chinese sent to concentration camps also helped to foot the bill. In the long run, however, The communist lords found perhaps their most effective means in the extortion of ransom from Chinese living outside the country on pain of torturing or killing relatives dwelling within its borders. Enormous sums were collected in spite of the efforts of foreign governments to put an end to this form of secret terrorism. Altogether, the Army of Red China may be appraised as a formidable instrument on terrain suited to its tactics. 
Several of America's foremost military thinkers were convinced, nevertheless, that Eighth Army reverses of the first few months in Korea were the penalty paid for a national preoccupation with airborne atomic weapons at the expense of preparations for limited wars. It was only natural that the American public and its political and military leaders in Washington should have been much concerned about a weapon with the capability of wiping out a medium-sized city in a minute. Their anxiety was heightened by President Truman's announcement on 23 September 1949 that Soviet Russia had exploded an atomic bomb. A great many Americans, probably a majority, sincerely believed that it was hardly worthwhile to prepare for an old-fashioned limited war when the Armageddon of the future would be fought to an awesome finish with thermonuclear weapons. National policy was shaped by this line of reasoning, and though we had every opportunity to study Chinese tactics prior to 1950, few if any preparations were made to cope with them. The outbreak of Korean hostilities found four U.S. skeleton divisions in Japan woefully unready, both morally and materially. At a later date, three high-placed U.S. Army generals, Matthew B. Ridgway, James M. Gavin, and Maxwell D. Taylor, would retire because they could not reconcile their views with the national policy which they interpreted as placing all of our strategic eggs in the basket of intercontinental bombers and guided missiles. Afterwards, as advocates of preparedness for limited as well as atomic warfare, they published books presenting their side of the case. On 15 January 1951, these developments were still in the future, of course. But even at the time, it had already been made evident that the armed forces of Red China were not an exception to the age-old rule that there is no such thing as an invincible army. When they came up against well-trained and led U.S. Army outfits in both of their offensives, they always had a fight on their hands and frequently a repulse. The Marines had proved beyond doubt in their chosen reservoir campaign that the Chinese Reds could be beaten by ground and air firepower engendered by sound training, discipline, and combat leadership. Five Chinese armies, of three or four divisions each, were identified in Northeast Korea during the November to December operations. Three of them were directly or indirectly opposed to the 1st Marine Division, with the U.S. Army Battalion and smaller Army units attached. Yet the beleaguered American forces seized the initiative and fought their way for 13 days and 35 miles through enveloping CCF units which had cut the mountain MSR in five places. Throughout the CCF January offensive, USAC G-2 officers anxiously sought every scrap of evidence as to the whereabouts of the five CCF armies identified in Northeast Korea as late as 10 December. Even if reduced by casualties, they would have been a formidable and perhaps even decisive reinforcement to the seven CCF armies engaged. But they did not appear. Nor were they encountered again until the middle of March 1951, when similarly numbered units filled with replacements reached the front. The full story may never be known, since the Chinese Reds are not fond of acknowledging their disasters but it is a likely conjecture that the fatal combination of marine firepower and General Winter created terrible havoc among communists who had been so certain of an immediate victory that they were neither armed, clothed, nor supplied for a 13-day campaign in sub-zero weather. End of chapter 2, part 2. Chapter 3, Part 1 of U.S. Marine Operations in Korea, 1950-1953, Volume 4, The East Central Front, by Lynn Montross, Norman Hicks, and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Pohang Gorilla Hunt on 15 January 1951, a reinforced regiment of the U.S. 25th Infantry Division drove northward from Line D to a point about a half a mile from Suwon in the One Corps sector. VMF-212, flying from the CVE Bataan, supported the movement along with land-based Air Force planes. No CCF troops were encountered during a two-day thrust dignified with the name Operation Wolfhound. Its only importance lay in its distinction as the first 8th Army counterstroke in reply to the enemy's January offensive. 
Other USAC advances were soon to follow, each more ambitious than the last and bearing a more bristling code name. General Ridgway proposed by this means to exert continual and increasing pressure on an enemy paying for victory with extended supply lines. Meanwhile, he hoped to build up the morale of his own troops without asking too much of them at first. In less than seven weeks, from 1 December 1950 to 15 January 1951, the Eighth Army had been pushed back an average distance of 200 miles. Never before in the nation's history had an American army given up so much ground and equipment in so short a time, and damage to morale was inevitable. Yet the commanding general was confident that a cure would be effected by better combat leadership and discipline. He planned to emphasize the need for these remedies until he restored the 8th Army to tactical health. The New Marine Zone of Operations Ridgway agreed with Marine generals that the 1st Marine Division had come out of its 13-day battle in the Chosen Reservoir area with its fighting spirit undulled. Minor respiratory ills seemed to be the only consequences felt by the survivors. A hacking cough, recalled the Marine staff officer long afterwards, was the symbol of the bean patch. Such ills soon responded to rest and medical care, and it was a physically fit division that made the move to the new zone of operations. About one man out of three in the infantry and artillery battalions was a newcomer to Korea. These replacements were shaping up nicely, and the new operation promised to be ideal combat training. The move took nearly a week. While the other troops proceeded by motor, LSTs 898 and 914 sailed with elements of tank, ordnance, engineer, and service battalions. The Division CP opened at Sinhung, about five miles southeast of Pohong, on 16 January. By the following day, all designated motor and water lifts were completed. On the 18th, the Marines were assigned a threefold mission by Division Operation Order 3 51. 1. The protection of the Pohong Kyungju Andong MSR, main supply route. 2. The securing of Andong and the two airstrips in the vicinity. And 3. The prevention of hostile penetrations in force to the south of the Andong Yondok Road. The following zones of patrol responsibility were assigned to Marine units. Zone A, RCT-1, an area about 10 miles east and west of the Wisong Andong Road, including both Wisong and Andong. Zone B, RCT-5, an area some 15 to 20 miles wide astride the Kyongju Yongchon Wisong Road, including Kyongju but excluding Wisong. Zone C, RCT-7, an area about 20 to 25 miles wide from east to west and extending north from the latitude of Pohong to the Andong Yongdok Road. Zone D, 11th Marines, a strip 7 miles wide along the coast to stride the road from Pohong to a point about 10 miles north of Yongdok. Zone E, 1st Tank Battalion. The area bounded by the road from Pohong to Kyongju and thence to the east coast at a point about 19 miles southeast of Pohong. Keeping open the 75-mile stretch of MSR from Pohong to Andong was considered the principal mission of the division. Strong points were set up at Pohong, Yongchong, Wisong, and Andong. Captured documents indicated that enemy forces in unknown numbers had already infiltrated through gaps in the eastern sectors of the 8th Army's Line D. Guerrilla activity was reported as far west as Tanyang, on the MSR of 9 Corps, and as far south as Taejon, threatening the supply line of 1 Corps. Train ambushes occurred on 13 January in the Namchang area and to the south of Wanju. Other attacks took place on the rail line about 60 miles north of Tegu. In expectation of further attempts, trains were provided with a sandbag car, pushed ahead of the engine, to absorb the shock of landmine explosions. Another car was occupied by guards who had the duty of dealing with direct guerrilla attacks. 
The tactical problem of the Marines was quite simple, on paper. About 1,600 square miles, most of them standing on end in mountainous terrain, were included in the new zone of operations. The experience of World War II had demonstrated how effective guerrilla warfare could be as an adjunct to large-scale military operations. Officers of the 1st Marine Division had no illusions about their mission, therefore, when they received unconfirmed reports of NKPA guerrilla infiltrations behind the USAC lines toward Andong. All uncertainty vanished on 18 January, shortly after the issuing of Operation Order 3-51, when a patrol of the 3rd Battalion 1st Marines flushed out an undetermined number of North Korean troops east of Andong. They took to their heels so earnestly that the Marines barely managed to catch three of them after a long chase. The prisoners identified their unit as the 27th Infantry of the NKPA 10th Infantry Division. The other two regiments, the 25th and 29th, were also in the general area. All three were supported more in theory than in fact by artillery, mortar, medical, and engineer units organic to the division. In reality, however, the estimated total of 6,000 troops consisted largely of infantry. A few mortars, according to the prisoners, were the largest weapons. Following the Inchon Seoul operation, the remnants of the badly mauled NKPA 10th Infantry Division had straggled back across the 38th parallel to the Hoichan area. There they were reorganized by the Chinese for guerrilla operations and placed under the command of NKPA Major General Li Ban Nam. Late in December, the rebuilt division, still short of arms and equipment, departed Huichan with a mission of infiltrating through the UN lines to cut communications and harass rear installations of the Andong Tegu area. Shots were exchanged with United Nations troops near Wanju, but General Li Ban Nam and his troops contrived to slip to the east through the mountains. Stealthily moving southward, marching by night and hiding by day, they were soon in a position to heckle the rear of the Ten Corps sector. This advantage did not last long. Before they could strike a blow, the element of surprise was lost along with the three prisoners taken by the Marines. As the Marine units moved into their assigned zones, General Ridgway flew to Pohong to confer with General Smith. Not only did he express confidence that the Marines would soon have the situation well under control, he also suggested the possibility of small amphibious landings along the east coast. The purpose was to block a possible southward advance of the three CCF armies that had operated in northeast Korea during the Chosen Reservoir campaign. The East Coast littoral was considered the most likely route of approach. Smith was of the opinion, however, that an amphibious landing should be made in strength, if at all, and there the matter rested. First Maul moves to Bofu. During the operations of the first few days, the Marine ground forces had to depend for air support on fief planes sent by a jock. The 1st Marine Aircraft Wing had its hands full at this time with housekeeping activities. Work began at Bofu on 20 January as a CB detachment arrived with its graders and bulldozers. They were assisted by details of Marines from MAG-33. The job went ahead with typical CB efficiency. While specialists installed plumbing for the galleys and barracks, other crews graded taxiways, laid pierced steel planking, and poured concrete to patch up runways, parking ramps, and warm-up aprons. MAG-12 kept busy at the task of moving men and equipment from Itami and other Japanese fields to Korea. Aircraft of VMR-152, commanded by Colonel Dean C. Roberts, provided transportation. Since safety measures precluded the use of the K-1 runway during construction activity, K-9 substituted temporarily. As fast as the planes unloaded, passengers and gear were trucked 15 miles through Pusan to K-1. It was a transition period in more ways than one for the first maw. Following are the changes of commanders that took place during the last two weeks of January. 
Colonel Radford C. West, relieved by Lieutenant Colonel Paul J. Fontana as commanding officer of MAG-33. Lieutenant Colonel Frank J. Cole, Join MAG-33 staff as personnel officer after being relieved of VMF-312 command by Major Donald P. Frame. Major Arnold A. Lund of VMF-323, relieved by Major Stanley S. Nicolay and assigned to General Harris's staff as assistant operations officer. Major William M. London, relieved of VMF-214 command by Major James A. Feeney, Jr., and transferred to the command of Service and Maintenance Squadron 33, SMS 33. This left only Lieutenant Colonel Richard W. Wachowski of VMF 212 and Lieutenant Colonel Max J. Volkansik, Jr. of VMF N 542 still in command of the tactical squadrons they brought to Korea, and the latter was to be relieved by Lieutenant Colonel James R. Anderson in February. The only combat operations of the 1st Ma during the week of housekeeping from 16 to 23 January were carried out by VMF-212 from the deck of the Bataan. This CVL carrier alternated with the British Light Fleet carrier HMS Thesis on the Korean West Coast blockade. Their activities were coordinated by Vice Admiral Andrews, Royal Navy, commanding the group blockading the Korean West Coast. VMF-212 sent out a morning and afternoon reconnaissance flight each day up the coastline as far as the 39th parallel. On the trip north, the pilots scanned the coastal waters for small enemy shipping which might indicate reinforcements from Chinese ports on the Yellow Sea. The return trip along the highways and railroads of the littoral was made to detect signs of any new enemy activity on land. Four aircraft flew each of the two coastal sweeps. Eight maintained a defensive patrol over the carrier itself, and any remaining flights were under control of Jock, with FIF mosquitoes providing liaison between fighter bombers and ground forces. To ensure sea room beyond the islands and mud banks of the west coast, the baton had to stay outside the 100 fathom curve. This meant that the pilots must fly across 65 to 80 miles of open sea in order to reach the coast. The winter weather varied from unbelievable to unbearable, and bulky, uncomfortable survival suits were a necessity. They could be a death trap, however, if a leak developed or if they were not adjusted tightly at the throat and wrists. Captain Alfred H. Agin, for instance, was shot down southeast of Incheon and had to choose between landing in enemy territory and ditching in the sea. He tried for a small island offshore, but crash-landed into the surf. Before a helicopter from the Bataan could fly 65 miles to the rescue, he died from shock of icy water which partially filled his survival suit. The pilots of VMF-212 reported an increase in enemy aircraft fire, particularly in the CCF rear areas. They were amazed to find troops dug in along the coast as far back as 50 or 60 miles from the battle lines. These precautions were the enemy's tribute to marine capabilities for amphibious warfare. The fear of another Inchon caused the Chinese to immobilize thousands of men on both coasts to guard against another such decisive landing far behind the front. On the squadron's third day of sea operations, Three planes were hit by rifle and machine gun fire on reconnaissance missions. One of them, flown by Captain Russell G. Patterson, Jr., was shot down behind the enemy lines, but a FIF helicopter rescued the pilot. First Lieutenant Alfred J. Ward was not so fortunate. His plane was riddled the following day by enemy fire, and he crashed to his death in the midst of CCF soldiers. Not until 22 January did the reconditioning of BOFU reach such an advanced stage that Lt. Col. Fontana could set up his MAG-33 command post. VMF-312 moved in the next day and the first combat missions were launched to the vicinity of Seoul, 300 miles away. On the 24th, General Harris established his headquarters. A few hours later, VMF-214 and VMF-323 arrived from Itami, where they had put in an idle week, with no place to go, after their carrier duty. 
On the 26th, when they flew their first missions as land-based squadrons, MAG-33 was back in business and BOFU was a going concern. No such claim could have been made for MAG-12 and K-1. Although Colonel Booker C. Batterton set up his command post on 27 January 1951, two more weeks were to pass before the K-1 runway was fit for flights to tactical aircraft. Meanwhile, the MAG-12 squadrons had to make out as best they could at K-9. Marine Rice Paddy Patrols Operations of the first few days demonstrated to 1st Marine Division ground forces that locating the enemy was more of a problem than defeating him. Obviously, the NKPA 10th Division had few, if any, of the advantages which make for effective guerrilla warfare. Far from receiving any voluntary support from the inhabitants, the Korean Reds had their own movements promptly reported to the Marines. Retaliations on civilians, such as burning mountain villages, were not calculated to improve relations. Nor did the enemy possess any of the other requisites for successful operations in an opponent's rear, a base, a source of supply, good communications, and a reliable intelligence system. If it came to a fight, there could be little doubt about the outcome but Marine staff officers must have been reminded of the old recipe for rabbit pie which begins, First Catch Your Rabbit. Such a situation called for systematic patrolling in all Marine zones of action. Secondary roads and mountain trails were covered by rice paddy patrols. Numbering from four men to a squad, these groups ranged far and wide on foot in an area that was more often vertical than horizontal. On a single day, the 5th Marines alone had 29 of these rice paddy patrols in action. No better training for replacements could have been devised. Sometimes the men were on their own for several days, depending for supplies on helicopter drops. And while casualties were light, there was just enough danger from sniping and potential ambushes to keep the replacements on the alert. Roads fit for vehicles, especially the 75-mile stretch of MSR from Pohang to Andong, were under the constant surveillance of motorized patrols, each supported by at least one tank or 105mm howitzer. The farthest distance was 15 miles between the main marine strong points at Pohang, Yongchong, Wisong, and Andong. Close air support was seldom needed against such an elusive enemy as the Marines faced. General Craig put in a request, however, for an air squadron to be based at Pohang or Pusan. The two Marine all-weather squadrons, VMFN-513 and VMFN-542, were General Harris's first and second choices. They had been flying under Air Force, 314th Air Division, control in the defense of Japan, a mission of dull routine and waiting for something to break the monotony of patrolling. The twin-engined F7F3N Tiger Cats of VMFN-542 were well equipped with electronics equipment for night interceptor work. VMFN-513 flew F4U-5Ns, the night fighter modification of the latest Corsair. General Harris's plan for VMFN-542 to take over the duties of VMFN-513 at Itazuk had the approval of General Partridge. This made it possible to send the latter squadron to K-9 at Pusan to replace the VMF-311 jets, which in turn left for Atami to await corrections of engineering defects. VMFN-513 flew its first combat missions from K-9 on 22 January. These consisted of routine armed reconnaissance flights and an occasional deep support mission for the 8th Army. Not until the 25th did the squadron respond to a request from Marine ground forces. And out of 49 combat missions, 110 sorties, during the remaining six days of the month, only three, 10 sorties, were in support of the 1st Marine Division. For routine operations, the Marine ground forces found the support of VMO-6 sufficient. The nimble little OI observation planes were ideal for seeking out an enemy who had to be caught before he could be fought. 
and the helicopters did their part by dropping supplies, evacuating casualties, and laying wire. Meanwhile, the 1st Marine Aircraft Wing strengthened its administrative ties with the 1st Marine Division. Although the two organizations had no common operational commander other than General MacArthur, they maintained a close liaison. Harris attached two TBM Avengers to VMO-6 for use as radio relays when ground-to-ground -ground communications failed in the mountainous Pohang Andong area. He also set up daily courier flights, at General Smith's request, to provide fast administrative liaison between widely dispersed marine air and ground units in Korea and Japan. Operations Thunderbolt and Roundup on 25 January, two corps of the 8th Army jumped off in Operation Thunderbolt. Advancing side by side, one corps and nine corps had orders to launch limited objective attacks and regain solid contact with the enemy, who was obviously preparing for a new offensive. The USAC commander moved his CP from Tegu to Chonan, the one corps headquarters, in order to maintain personal control of the operation. He requested the Navy to step up offshore patrolling on the West Coast as left flank protection. Emphasis was also placed on aerial reconnaissance, both visual and photographic, as well as deep support directed by the Mosquitoes. Even VMFN 542 at Itazuk had orders to conduct long flights to Seoul and maintain continuous patrols to report any attempts of the enemy to retire across the frozen Han River. The F-7F-3N pilots shot up camp areas, convoys, and other lucrative targets, but found no indication of large-scale crossings over the ice. So varied were the missions of the squadron that it came as no surprise to be assigned to naval gunfire spotting for the USS St. Paul and the other British and American cruisers shelling Incheon. All Marine tactical squadrons were in action on 28 January for the first time since December. Nearly two-thirds of the flights from Bofu and K-9 were diverted from armed reconnaissance to troop support. A typical operation was carried out by four VMF-312 planes on their second day of duty at Bofu. After reporting to Mello, they were directed to Mosquito Cobalt, which had received a message that enemy troops were hiding in a village just north of Suwon, occupied that day by the U.S. 35th Infantry. Under the Mosquito's direction, they bombed, strafed, and napalmed some 40 buildings containing CCF soldiers. The fall of Suwon opened the way to Inchon and Seoul as Chinese resistance stiffened. Eighth Army progress was anything but reckless, but Ridgeway had served notice on the enemy that he held the initiative and intended to keep it. Operation Roundup followed on the heels of Thunderbolt. Merely a change in name was involved for the advance continued at the same prudent pace without any important amendments to the original mission. End of chapter 3, part 1. Chapter 3, part 2 of U.S. Marine Operations in Korea, 1950-1953, Volume 4, The East Central Front, by Lynn Montross, Norman Hicks, and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Pohang Guerrilla Hunt Action in the Pohang Andong Zone The Marines in the Pohang Andong Zone had their first brush with the elusive enemy on 22 January. A patrol of the 1st Battalion 1st Marines flushed out a guerrilla force near Mukye Dong, several miles southeast of Andong. Captain Robert P. Ray's Charlie Company deployed for action at sunset and shots were exchanged. The Marines had no casualties and the enemy could not have suffered many losses before he disappeared into the winter dusk. Even at this early date, the Korean Reds seemed to have lost confidence in their guerrilla operations. In a message dated 23 January taken from a prisoner, the commanding general of two NKPA corps directed General Lee Ban Nam to withdraw if possible. It read as follows. Get all of your troops out of the enemy encirclement and withdraw to north of Pyeongchang without delay. 
Liaison team sent with radio. If you will inform us of your escape route, we will assist by clearing your advance. If you cannot escape, stay in the rear of enemy as guerrillas. By the 24th, an enemy drift southeast from the zones of the 1st and 5th Marines to 7th Marines territory was apparent. The 17 Command Post and Company A received scattered mortar fire late that afternoon. Action picked up the next morning when dawn brought an attack by an estimated 100 guerrillas on the regimental command post. After a brisk 90-minute firefight, the Korean Reds withdrew to the east, leaving seven dead behind and taking with them an unknown number of wounded. Later that morning, the 7th Marines teamed up with the National Police against the Chiso Dong area. Nine bodies were counted as the 3rd Battalion seized its objective, but 1-7 was slowed by an entrenched enemy who offered an unyielding defense. The Marine Battalion ground to a halt just one mile short of Chiso Dong and dug in for the night as artillery continued to pound the enemy. The airstrikes on the 25th were flown by VMFN-513 and VMF-323, both based at K-9, but the pilots could not contact the FAC and had to make dummy runs over the enemy. Marine planes and artillery cleared the way on 26 January as 1-7 advanced against scattered opposition. Nearly 400 guerrillas put up a ragged and futile resistance, but by 1530 Marine firepower prevailed and Chiso Dong was taken. The 2nd Battalion had meanwhile occupied Hapton Ni, 8 miles southeast of Tapyong Dong. A light enemy counterattack was repulsed with ease. Altogether, enemy casualties for the day accounted for 161 KIA or POW. The VMF-323 flight led by Captain Don H. Fisher and Captain Floyd K. Fulton's VMFN-513 flight merit recognition as the first successful instance of Marine Air Ground Cooperation since the Chosen Reservoir campaign. While the 7th Marine served eviction notices on the enemy in its area, action elsewhere was light. Task Force Puller hastened on the 26th to Chongjong Dong, seven miles northeast of Wisong, to investigate a police report that 300 enemy had seized the town. A Marine attack, following an artillery preparation, was planned for 1,500. Captain Thomas J. Bohannon led Abel Company in, but discovered that the shells had fallen on empty huts. During the next few days, the rice paddy patrols continued to range over the countryside, searching out the enemy. Combat units were sent to areas where the G-2 Red Arrows indicated an NKPA buildup. On the morning of the 29th, the 5th Marines tried to organize an attack on a large enemy force reported near Chechong Dong, 12 miles west of Tapyong Dong. Captain Jack R. Jones's Charlie Company, moving out at night in small foot patrols to maintain secrecy, scoured the area in an attempt to pin down the enemy. Marine intelligence reports had warned of a dawn raid on the town for the purpose of plundering food from the inhabitants and arms from the Korean police station. First Lieutenant Richard J. Shenning, executive officer, led a scouting force ahead of the main body to reconnoiter the area. He urged that a trap be set for the enemy, and the company commander has left a description of one of the most elaborate ambushes ever attempted by the Marines during the war. Well before daylight, a cordon was stealthily braided around Chechon Dong and we settled down to await the raiders. A later daylight inspection of the deployment showed that the men had done a splendid job of locating themselves so as to avoid detection. They were concealed under porches, beneath the brambles, and in the heaviest foliage and trees. But no guerrilla attack materialized probably due to a grapevine warning of our movement and intent. During the remaining days in the village, we conducted extensive patrolling in an attempt to catch at least one guerrilla for our effort. Patrols were kept small to maintain secrecy. We even dressed Marines in clothing worn by the locals and sent them out in the hills with wood-gathering details. Larger patrols up to a platoon in size were sent on combat missions at night, one thing was certain, 
It was easier to talk about capturing guerrillas than it was to lay a hand on them. The elusiveness of the enemy could not always be credited to effective guerrilla tactics. Often it was due to a distaste for combat. As evidence of low NKPA morale, Major Yu Dung Nam, a battalion commander, was condemned to death and shot late in January because he planned to surrender, according to POW testimony. Rations were at a bare subsistence level and typhus had claimed many victims. Unrelenting marine pressure throughout the first week of February wore the guerrillas down until groups larger than 50 men were seldom encountered. On the 3rd, an NKPA 2nd lieutenant surrendered voluntarily to a RCT-7 patrol and brought three of his men with him. NKPA morale had sunk so low, he divulged, that all ranks were striving only for survival. The division commander, Major General Lee Ban Nam, had apparently become a victim of acute melancholia. He spent nearly all his time, according to the prisoner, in the solitude of foxholes dug into the slopes of hills for added protection. There he brooded constantly over his predicament, but without arriving at any better solution than alternate hiding and flight. Certainly, the military situation didn't offer much to gladden this hamlet of the rice paddies, and the Marines continued to give him fresh cause for pessimism. His footsore remnants eluded RCT-5 only to stumble into the zone of RCT-1, northeast of Wisong. Neither rest nor sanctuary awaited them, for the 1st and 2nd battalions penetrated into the mountains near Sangyong to surprise and rout a force estimated at 400 men. KMC Regiment Joins 1st Marine Division Late in January, the 1st KMC Regiment got into the fight after being attached once more to the 1st Marine Division by a USAC dispatch of the 21st. Lieutenant Colonel Charles W. Harrison headed a new group of division liaison and advisory officers as the 4 KMC battalions moved out from Chinhe by LST and truck convoy to the Pohong area. Division Operation Order 4-51, 26 January, assigned the Regiment Sector F astride the Yongdok Andong Road, which had been carved out of Sector C and D, held by the 7th and 11th Marines respectively. The KMCs were ordered to conduct daily patrolling from positions near Yongdok, Chagok Tong, and Chinundong and prevent enemy concentrations in their sector. Although the Rock Army and 8th Army had the responsibility for supplying the KMCs, it proved necessary for the 1st Marine Division to cope with some of the gaps in equipment and rations. Contrary to a prevalent Western belief, Koreans did not subsist on a diet of rice alone. They were accustomed to having side dishes with their rice, such as eggs, meat, fish, or vegetables. Colonel Kim Sung-un, the regimental commander, had an allotment of money for these purchases, but the sum was insufficient to meet inflation prices even if there had been enough food left in a district eaten bare. As a consequence, the KMCs had to get along on a monotonous and vitamin-poor diet until the Rock Army belatedly came to the rescue with issues of food for side dishes. On 29 January, the KMC Regiment opened its CP at Yongdok. Regimental Operation Order 1 of that date divided Sector F into three parts, assigning the Western, Central, and Eastern subsectors to 3rd, 1st, and 2nd Battalions, respectively. The 5th Battalion was attached to the 1st Marines and assigned to patrolling operations in the Yongdong area. The first few days of February saw a brief flurry of activity before NKPA guerrilla resistance breathed its last gasps. Reports that the remnants of the NKPA 25th and 27th regiments were in flight toward the zone of the 5th Marines led to a concentration for a knockout blow, but the enemy stole away to the north in the vicinity of Tapyongdong. There he discovered that he had jumped from the frying pan into the fire. The 2nd and 3rd Battalions of the 1st Marines closed in from one side, while the 1st and 3rd Battalions of the KMC Regiment blocked roads in the vicinity of Samgori and Pekchadong. 
Only a wild fight in small groups saved the guerrillas from annihilation. The nearest approach to effective NKPA resistance was encountered on 5 February after the 1st and 2nd KMC battalions had established blocking positions in zone at the request of the 7th Marines, which was driving the enemy northward. A platoon-sized patrol of the 2nd KMC Battalion came up against Korean Reds dug in with 81mm mortars and heavy and light machine guns a few miles southwest of Yongdok. The KMCs were scattered with losses of 1 KIA, 8 WIA, and 24 MIA in addition to all arms and equipment, though the missing men returned later. It was the single NKPA success of the entire campaign. An assault was launched the following morning on this enemy stronghold by a composite KMC battalion, supported by four VMFN 513 aircraft which attacked with rockets and bombs. The largest combat of the guerrilla hunt appeared to be in the making, but again the enemy vanished after putting up an ineffectual resistance with small arms and mortars. An unusual air tactic was tested on 4 February in the 7th Marine Zone when an interpreter in an R-4D plane hailed the guerrillas by loudspeaker in their own language with the demand that they surrender or suffer the consequences. Marine fighter bombers were on station to back the threat, and about 150 supposed NKPA soldiers came in with uplifted hands while VMF-323 planes delivered the consequences to the holdouts in the form of bombs, rockets, and napalm. Unfortunately, it developed that practically all of the prisoners were terrified civilians seeking an escape from the slave labor imposed upon them by the guerrillas. 10th NKPA Division Scattered Reports of enemy activity were received daily from Korean civilians and police, and seldom was a smaller number than about 2,000 mentioned. In reality, Marine patrols had difficulty in tracking down as many as 10 of the skulking, half-starved fugitives split up into small bands hiding in the hills. On 5 February, the situation was summed up by General Smith in reply to a USAC request for an estimate of the time required to complete the Marine mission. The original 10th NKPA Div forces in the 1st Marine Division area have been dispersed into many groups, reduced to an effective strength of 40%, and are no longer capable of a major effort while dispersed. It is considered that the situation in the division area is sufficiently in hand to permit the withdrawal of the division and the assignment of another mission at any time a new force to be assigned the responsibility for the area assumes such responsibility and the 1st Marine Division can be reassembled. Patrolling continued as usual in all Marine regimental zones during the second week in February. Some units, such as the 11th Marines and the Division Reconnaissance Company, had made few enemy contacts throughout the operation. But at least the cannoneers had found good pheasant hunting and enjoyed a change in the bill of fare. It was just as well that the tactical situation seldom made it necessary to call for air support at this stage, since the first mall was once again in the throes of moves which will be described in the following chapter. Bofu had been only a temporary base for MAG-33 squadrons, which were making another transfer to K-9 while MAG-12 completed its shift to K-1. VM-06 took care of the reduced air requirements of the division adequately. Another helicopter first was scored when 1st Lieutenant John L. Scott received credit for the first night casualty evacuation by a HTL, Bell, which then had no instruments for night flying. For a harrowing moment, however, it would be hard to beat the experience of Captain Clarence W. Parkins and Corpsman R. E. Kriske. While they were flying a casualty to the hospital ship Consolation, the patient became wildly delirious. It took the combined efforts of pilot and corpsman to subdue him and make a safe landing. Any excitement would have been welcomed by the troops in general for the area was as tranquil as if the guerrillas had never troubled its snowbound heights. Recently arrived Marines might have been pardoned for concluding that the NKPA 10th Division and its gloomy commander were but creatures of the imagination, phantoms to be compared to the crew of the Flying Dutchman, 
that legendary ship condemned to sail on endlessly until the Day of Judgment. The NKPA 10th Division also seemed doomed to perpetual flight as its ghostly survivors made their way from crag to crag of the remote ridge lines. Thanks to the rice paddy patrols, the replacements were ready for combat and the division was organizing a rotation draft for return to the States. Five officers and 600 men had already been selected on a basis of combat time, wounds received, and length of service. Major General Edward A. Craig, who commanded the 1st Marines to land in Korea, was given a farewell dinner and congratulated on his second star. Two new Brigadier Generals were named, with Louis B. Chesty Puller relieving Craig as ADC and Gregan A. Williams accompanying him on the voyage back to the States. Captain Eugene R. Bud Herring, Medical Corps, U.S. Navy, was also returning with the gratitude of all Marines for his care of casualties in the Frozen Chosen campaign. All Marine missions in the guerrilla hunt had been successfully accomplished, so that the division could be relieved at any time by the 2nd Rock Division. There were 120 counted enemy dead and 184 prisoners. Only estimates are available for the wounded, but there is no doubt that the total NKPA casualties were crippling. At any rate, the NKPA 10th Division was destroyed as a fighting force without accomplishing any of its objectives. Marine casualties from 18 January to 15 February were 19 KIA, 7 DOW, 10 MIA, 148 WIA, and 1,751 of a non-battle classification, largely frostbite cases soon restored to duty. New Mission for the Marines on 11 February, General Smith flew to Tegu to discuss the next Marine mission with General Ridgway. The USAC commander spoke favorably of employing the 1st Marine Division to relieve the 24th Infantry Division in the critical Han River Corridor, where recent UN advances had been made. He also recognized the advantages of committing the Marines to the East Coast so that they could be held in readiness for an amphibious operation. A third possibility was the Yoju Corridor of the Nine Corps Zone. As the most powerful division in Korea, said Ridgway, the Marines would be astride what he considered the logical route for an expected enemy counterthrust. No decision was reached that day. At midnight, the CCF attack materialized, and the Central Front was the area of decision, as Ridgway had predicted. Naturally, the next mission for the Marines had to be reconsidered in the light of this development. On 12 February, USAC warning orders alerted the 1st Marine Division to be prepared to move to Chungju, in the rear area of the Nine Corps Front where the heaviest CCF attacks were taking place. The division was further directed to make an immediate reconnaissance of the Chungju area while the 1st KMC Regiment prepared for a move to Samchak on the east coast and attachment to the Rock Capital Division. The following day brought orders from the 8th Army to initiate these movements on 15 February 1951. Thus, the Pohong Andong guerrilla hunt came to an end with the Marines on their way to new employment in the battle line of the 8th Army. End of chapter 3, part 2. Chapter 4, part 1 of U.S. Marine Operations in Korea, 1950-1953, Volume 4, The East Central Front, by Lynn Montross, Norman Hicks, and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Operation Killer the CCF counterattack, which began northeast of Wanju on 11 February 1951, came in reaction to the unremitting pressure exerted during the previous month by the 8th Army. Twice beaten during a recent six-week period and pushed back some 200 miles, USAC had shown amazing powers of recuperation. It is hard for me to put into words the magnificent competence, the fierce, combative, aggressive spirit of that force once it picked itself off the ground and waded back into the fight, commented General Ridgway in retrospect. 
During Operations Thunderbolt and Roundup, he had kept a tight rein on the 8th Army by insisting on vigorous artillery preparations and close lateral contacts between units. On 10 February, however, caution was relaxed as CCF resistance suddenly collapsed west and south of Seoul. That day, the U.S. 24th Infantry Division forged ahead 11,000 yards to occupy the Port of Incheon and Kimpo Airfield, both so wrecked that weeks of repair would be necessary to make them operational. Seoul was within sight of the U.S. forces on the left bank of the Han when an aroused enemy struck back on the sub-zero night of the 11th. Apparently, the CCF drive on the Central Front had as its objective the relieving of UN pressure on the Seoul area to the west. The CCF 40th and 66th Armies and the NKPA 5 Corps struck in the 9 Corps sector north of Hoingsong. Two rock divisions being dislodged by the initial blows, the retreat made necessary the withdrawal of other 9 Corps units. As a consequence, Hoensong had to be abandoned on 12 February to the communists hammering out a salient northeast of Wanju. The UN forces were not bound by any unrealistic concept of holding ground to the last ditch. General Ridgway deemed it more important to inflict maximum punishment on the enemy at a minimum cost in casualties. While fighting on the defensive, he had already made up his mind to launch an offensive of his own to catch the Chinese off balance the moment their counterattack ground to a halt. His new limited objective operation emphasized the destruction of the enemy's fighting strength as the major objective rather than the acquisition of territory. A high attrition rate would preclude the communist capacity to hold and enable USAC commander to recover the critical hill mass north of Wanju. It was for this purpose, he informed Major General Bryant E. Moore, 9 Corps Commanding General, that the 1st Marine Division would be employed. The force which holds Wanju, he said, has the situation in hand. The Move to the Chengju Area The 1st Marine Division had instructions to report its order of march to the 8th Army and to keep the Tegu headquarters informed of progress. Meanwhile, the Marines were to remain under USAC operational control but would pass to 9 Corps control at a date and hour to be announced. General Polar flew to Chengju with a reconnaissance party on 13 February to look over the road and select CP sites. On the following morning, Major Walter Gall's Division Reconnaissance Company arrived at Chengju for patrol duty, and movement by rail and road commenced on the 15th in accordance with Division Operation Order 5-51, issued the day before. The 1st Marines, with the 7th Motor Transport Battalion attached, led the motor march, and the 5th and 7th Marines followed in that order. Tracked vehicles were outloaded by rail from Andong and Pohong in a total of 67 flat cars. Owing to a shortage of cars, Company B and H&S Company of the 1st Tank Battalion made the move of 120 miles by road. These tankers claimed the all-time Marine distance record for armor. While the Marine move was in progress, the CCF counterattack went on full blast along the central front. Driving southeast from the 9 Corps area to the 10 Corps front, the Chinese cut off and surrounded the 23rd Infantry of the 2nd Infantry Division, U.S. Army. Colonel Paul Freeman and his men put up a fight that is one of the classics of the war. Supported by Marine and Air Force planes, they gave more fire than they received and held out until rescued by a tank column. February was also a transition period for Marine fighter squadrons, which had been more or less on the move since the middle of January. Even before the transfer to Bofu, it had been decided that K-3, four miles south of Pohong, was to be the ultimate home of MAG-33. While awaiting completion of this field, VMFs 214, 312, and 323 would find temporary lodging at K-1, near Pusan, recently assigned to MAG-12. On 6 February, Brigadier General Thomas J. Cushman, Assistant Commanding General of the 1st MAW, radioed General Harris that K-1 would be ready to receive a squadron a day, starting on the 8th. 
Harris ordered squadrons 323, 214, and 312 to make their moves on 8, 9, and 10 February, respectively. Transport aircraft were to lift ground crews, extra pilots, and light equipment directly to K-1. Pilots had orders to fly combat missions en route. By the 13th, most of the vehicles, heavy equipment, and general supplies had been loaded on a train for Kobe, there to be transshipped on LSTs to Pohang. That same day, Lieutenant Colonel Fontana set up his MAG-33 command post at K-3 and directed the three fighter squadrons to report from K-1. The new field occupied a bench overlooking a wide, sandy beach. Built originally by the Japanese, the strip had 5,200 feet of concrete runway. The Air Force had extended it to 5,700 feet with pierced steel planking. This addition brought the end of the runway to the brink of a 60-foot drop-off, a hazard in the event of a hot landing to the northwest or too low an approach from the southeast. Next to arrive at K-3 were the F-9-F-2Bs of VMF-311. Four weeks of adjustments at Atami had restored the jets to operative condition. An advance echelon went ahead to establish squadron living and operating areas, and the pilots ferried the 19 aircraft. Ground crews and equipment followed on transport planes. Plans were made for VMF N-513 to move from Atami to K-3 before the end of the month. The other all-weather squadron, VMF N-542, now commanded by Lt. Col. James R. Anderson, completed the transfer from Atami and Itazuk to K-1. This field was also the destination of the photo pilots of Headquarters Squadron, 1st Ma, who flew their F-7F-3P and F-4U-5P fighters from Itami. Major Donald S. Bush commanded a unit, formerly a squadron, which had been one of the first aviation organizations to see action in Korea. Among its accomplishments were the preliminary beach studies for the Incheon and Wonsan landings. With the completion of the moves of February 1951, the first mall was again based on Korean soil. Fifteen types of marine aircraft were being flown. For the heavy hauling, the R-4D and R-5D transports shifted troops and supplies. Included among the fighters were F-9F Panthers, F-4U Corsairs, and two models of F-7F Tiger Cats, a stripped-down photo plane, and a radar-armed night fighter. Stinson OY Grasshoppers, TBM Avengers, and Beechcraft SNBs rounded out the list of conventional planes. Three types of rotary wing aircraft were represented, the Sikorsky HO-3S-1 and two models of the Bell HTL. Marine Planes in Action by 15 February, the brief CCF counterstroke had spent its force. Hoang Song had fallen to communists who hammered out a salient on a 20-mile front extending as far southward as the outskirts of Wanju. But the enemy's main purpose had failed of accomplishment, for the grip of the 8th Army on Inchon and Kimpo Airfield was not shaken. Nor did the Chinese gain a breathing spell in their preparations for a third great offensive as a follow-up to the December and January drives. More by coincidence than design, the 5th Air Force launched a new system of air tactics a few days after the beginning of the CCF counterstroke. Called Reconnaissance Plan Fighter, it was based on a division of enemy-held Korea into 22 sections. Squadrons were given the mission of making hourly surveys of the same areas, day after day, until pilots became so familiar with them that any change hinting a CCF activity would be noticed at once. If these surveys revealed any sign of any enemy concentration, either of men or supplies, Jock scrambled special bombing strikes against them. Although Marine flyers could readily see the advantages of covering the same ground daily, it made for monotony on reconnaissance missions. Only a highly unusual spectacle would startle a pilot, but First Lieutenant Weldon R. Mitchell blinked when he saw a camel in his gun sights. 
Shaggy little Mongolian horses were no novelty as ammunition bearers, and after recovering from his first astonishment, the VMF-311 pilot cut loose with 50 caliber machine gun slugs. As he suspected, the camel's pack contained ammunition, and the animal was all but vaporized in the explosion. Major Bush's photographic unit had an important part in keeping the enemy under constant surveillance. The 5th Air Force directed on 16 February that all photo requests were to be screened by the 5th Air Force's 543rd Tactical Support Group at Tegu. Under the tactical coordination of this group, the Marine unit was to fill all Navy and Marine Corps requests. When not on such missions, it would be fitted into the 5th Air Force Photographic Reconnaissance Program. Pinpoint photos of suspected troop areas and such terrain features as defiles, junctions, detours, and bridges were in demand. The fact had to be faced that the enemy was almost unbelievably clever at camouflage and concealment. In one instance, it was found that the Chinese had constructed bridge sections which they hid by day and put to use at night. On another occasion, they sank a bridge by means of weight so that it remained far enough beneath the surface of the water in the daytime to avoid detection by reconnaissance aircraft. When the photoplanes carried out missions as far north as MIG Alley, they flew in pairs. A fighter circled overhead to protect the photopilot from an enemy air attack while he paid full attention to the task of shooting the terrain with his camera. Planning for the New Operation Adaptability to changing circumstances had already become perhaps the outstanding quality of the revitalized 8th Army. No better example could be found than the evolution of Operation Killer, which completed the cycle from concept to plan and execution in just three days. On 18 February 1951, General Ridgway learned that the enemy was apparently withdrawing. Nine Corps and Ten Corps units had probed forward that morning without meeting any opposition. Before nightfall, the commanding general decided to launch a limited objectives offensive by the entire Eighth Army. He called a planning conference for the 19th and set the 21st as D-Day for the new operation. The 1st Marine Division found itself detached from Ten Corps on the 19th and placed under the operational control of General Moore of Nine Corps. This was not the first time in Marine Corps history, of course, when soldiers of the sea have fought alongside U.S. Army units in conventional land warfare. One of the best-known occasions was in World War I, when two Marine regiments distinguished themselves in France as a brigade of the U.S. 2nd Infantry Division. The Marines had been a part of X Corps in 1950, but always under tactical circumstances which permitted more or less independent operations with the support of organic aircraft. Now the division was to be closely integrated with the other major nine Corps units, the 24th Infantry Division, the 1st Cavalry Division, the 6th Rock Division, and the 27th British Commonwealth Brigade. Marine calls for airstrikes would continue to be made through Jock, as they had been since the Hungnam redeployment. General Ridgway was on hand for the planning conference held on 19 February in General Moore's CP at Yoju and attended by officers from 9 and 10 Corps. General Smith, Colonel McAllister, and Colonel Bowser represented the 1st Marine Division. The scheme of maneuver called for the Marines to relieve elements of Ten Corps and attack in a northeasterly direction from a line of departure north of Wanju through the Wanju Basin. The object was to cut off enemy forces which had penetrated south and east of Hunsong and to recover control of the roads running eastward by seizing the high ground just south of the town. In the Ten Corps zone to the east, on the right flank of the Marines, the 7th Infantry Division was to attack to the north along the Yongwo Pyeongchang Road. On the other Marine flank would be elements of the 6th Rock Division. Simultaneous advances were planned for one corps to the west, where patrols had found evidence that Seoul was lightly held. Two U.S. Army units were designated at the 19 February conference to support the 1st Marine Division the 74th Truck Company, and the 92nd Armored Field Artillery, then en route to the Chengju area. These cannoneers and their commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Leon F. Lavoie, U.S. Army, 
were well and favorably known to the Marines, having given effective support during the chosen reservoir operations. 1st Marine Division Operation Order 6-51, issued on 20 February, directed the two assault regiments, the 1st and 5th Marines, to jump off at 0800 on the 21st and seize the first objective, the ridge line about 3.5 miles south of the high ground dominating Hoinsong. RCT-1, with Division Recon Company and Sea Engineers attached, was to pass through elements of the 2nd Infantry Division in zone while RCT-5, with A Engineers attached, passed through elements of the 187th Airborne Infantry, U.S. Army. RCT-7 had been designated the Reserve Regiment, but since it could not arrive from the Pohang Andong area in time, a battalion of the 5th Marines was assigned this mission. The objective area was believed to be defended by the 196th Infantry Division of the 66th CCF Army and unknown elements of the 39th and 40th CCF Armies. Ahead of the Marines and other nine Corps units lay some uninviting terrain. Rocky heights and narrow valleys were laced by swift streams, the largest being the River Somme, running from northeast to southwest through a defile cutting across the western part of the division sector. Bordering this twisting stream was the Wanju Hoinsung Highway, a poor dirt road even by Korean standards. Through the right half of the division zone, an even more primitive road, scarcely fit for vehicular traffic, wound northeast from Wanju. All 8th Army forces were to be tightly buttoned up and to keep in close physical contact while maintaining integrity of units. Patrol observation and reconnaissance were stressed by the USAC commanding general, and even lack of opposition would not justify a unit in advancing ahead of schedule. Again, as in previous operations, real estate was to be secondary to the inflicting of maximum personnel and material damage. On the eve of Operation Killer, a message from Nine Corps emphasized to all units the necessity for making sure that no hostile force of sufficient strength to jeopardize the safety of your forces has been bypassed. Maintenance of lateral contact between all units is of prime importance. Marine ground force and aviation officers alike realized that the forthcoming offensive would be the first real test of the operational control of First Maw by the 5th Air Force and the 8th Army. General Smith was uneasy about the outlook. On 13 February 1951, the day he was alerted for the move to Chonju, he had requested in a message to USAC that First Maw be assigned to the support of his division. Both Marine ground and air officers, he said, believed that this change would fit into the jock overall air control system without any disruption. But no approval of General Smith's proposal had been received before D-Day. The Jump Off on 21 February From the outset, the transport and supply situation was a G-4 officer's nightmare. Heavy traffic broke the back of the MSR before the jump off, so that mud delayed the 5th Marines in reaching the line of departure, LD. General Puller, the ADC, telephoned the division commander for a decision in the event that all elements of the regiment were unable to arrive in time. This question was already under discussion by General Moore and General Smith in the new 1st Marine Division CP, just opened at Wanju. After later reports of troop arrivals reached him, Smith decided with few minutes to spare that he would attack with only the troops able to reach the LD in time, three battalions of the 1st Marines, a battalion of the 5th Marines, two battalions of the 11th Marines, and a company of tanks. Moore then confirmed 1000 as H hour and notified Puller of the decision. The last minute arrival of the 1st Battalion 5th Marines reminded Smith of the occasion in France 32 years before when the 5th Marines of World War I had to double time across the wheat fields in order to attack on schedule at Saisons on 18 July 1918. For at Wanju, the lone battalion scrambled out of trucks on the double and advanced without taking time for reorganization. Snarl traffic conditions were complicated by the arrival of high-ranking officers for the jump-off. General MacArthur visited the zone of the 187th Airborne RCT, recently attached to 10 Corps. 
General Ridgway and General Moore were on hand when the Marines attacked. The USAC commander, surveying the scene from a snow-covered embankment, was disturbed to see a Marine corporal stumbling over an untied shoelace while carrying a heavy radio. I hesitated just a moment, commented Ridgway, knowing that what I wanted to do might be misconstrued as showmanship. Then I slid down the bank on my tail, landed right at his feet, knelt down and tied his shoe. Later, when this incident was reported in the States, there were some who did report it as a theatrical gesture. This was not true. It was purely an impulse to help a fighting soldier, a man in trouble. The 8th Army commander was not the only one to see the advantages of tobogganing in terrain consisting of mud on the sunny slope of hills and snow on the shady side. When Captain Jack R. Jones's Charlie Company of 1-5 reached its first steep decline, the Marine leading the 2nd Platoon slipped and fell in the snow, sliding about a 100 feet down the embankment. The man behind him profited from his example to make a purposeful slide, as did the rest of 1st Lieutenant William E. Kerrigan's men. This was but one of the unwarlike incidents which enlivened the jump-off of Operation Killer. Seldom, if ever, have Marines taken part in an offensive which began so inoffensively. For 21 February was distinguished for lack of enemy resistance in the Marine zone. Only a few rounds of scattered rifle fire were encountered until late afternoon. Then the 1st Battalion, 5th Marines, leading the column of attack, had two long-distance firefights before digging in for the night. Three Marines were slightly wounded, and the enemy withdrew with such casualties as he may have suffered. The word light could never have been applied to the resistance put up by the weather and terrain. Lieutenant Colonel Joseph L. Stewart, commanding 3-5, described it as a mixture of thawing snow, rain, mud, and slush. His men spent the night in foxholes half filled with water. Every one of them was wet to the bones, including his clothes, parka, weapons, and ammo. The 1st Marines led the attacking column of battalions on 22 February, with 1-1 in the lead. More long-distance small arms fire was encountered than on the first day, but again there was no close contacts with the retreating enemy. End of chapter 4, part 1. Chapter 4, part 2 of U.S. Marine Operations in Korea, 1950-1953, Volume 4, The East Central Front by Lynn Montross, Norman Hicks, and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Operation Killer Stiffening of Chinese Resistance Not until the 23rd did either Marine Regiment run into determined opposition. Then the 1st and 2nd Battalions of the 1st Marines, advancing abreast, had a fight while going up against two hills of a ridge just south of the first phase objectives. So far the Marines had found jock air support satisfactory in quantity. The statistics show that the 5th Air Force supported the 8th Army during the first phase of Operation Killer, 21-24 February inclusive, with an average of 600 sorties a day. There was no room for complaint until the morning of the 23rd, when an airstrike the 5th Marines requested the preceding evening for 0800 failed to materialize on time. On this occasion, the combination of an intense Marine artillery preparation and light enemy resistance compensated for lack of air support and the hill was taken with ease. That afternoon it took a brisk fight to evict an enemy and estimated battalion strength from log-covered bunkers on the second hill. This time, Jock responded to Marine requests with two effective airstrikes. Sixty Chinese dead were counted, and the Marines reported one KIA and 21 WIA. On the whole, however, the 5th Marines encountered only slight resistance. About all we did was walk, 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 recalled Captain Franklin B. Mayer, commanding Easy Company of 2-5. I don't think I've ever been so tired or footsore in my life, exception the retreat from Chosen, but not by much. On the 24th, the 1st and 3rd Battalions of the 5th Marines had little trouble in taking two hills designated as the main Phase 1 objectives. 
The 1st Marines on the left sent a tank and infantry patrol into Hoingsung after artillery preparation and an airstrike. Captain Robert P. Ray, commanding Charlie Company of 1-1 and a platoon of tanks, entered the ruins of the town only to encounter machine gun and mortar fire from the hills to the west. When the antennae were shot off two tanks, Ray directed their 90mm fire by runner and knocked out the enemy positions. After proceeding further into the town, he was recalled by his battalion commander, Lt. Col. Donald M. Schmuck, because an aerial observer had reported that Chinese were waiting to ambush the patrol. An airstrike was directed on them while Ray rescued several survivors of Massacre Valley, northwest of Hungsung, where a U.S. Army truck convoy had been ambushed during the recent CCF counterattack. The patrol returned before the ground had completely thawed. Only a few hours later, a jeep passing over the same road was blown up by a landmine which killed the driver. This was one of the first object lessons illustrating the danger from enemy mines which were harmless until the midday sun thawed out the ground. Chinese artillery fire from the hills north of Hoingsung accounted for one Marine KIA and four WIA late that afternoon before counter-battery fire by 211 silenced the enemy. This exchange ended the first phase of Operation Killer at dusk on 24 February with all preliminary objectives seized. Air support had been rendered, for the most part, by 5th Air Force planes. This gave rise to grumbling by Marine ground forces who felt that they had been unnecessarily deprived of their own close air support. The fact was, however, that U.S. Army and British Commonwealth troops also preferred Marine air and were outspoken about it. As a disgruntled Marine ground force officer put it, Marine air was too good for our own good. During the first phase of Operation Killer, most of the sorties by 1st Maw planes were in support of U.S. Army units. On 23 February, the Marines flew 101 of the 5th Air Force total of some 800 sorties for that day. The experience of VMF-312 was fairly typical of the other Marine fighter-bomber squadrons. In the morning, VMF-312 took part in a 16-plane strike behind the CCF lines. That afternoon, two special flights of four planes each were scrambled in support of the 2nd and 7th Infantry Division units of 10 Corps. The following morning, Major Daniel H. Davis, executive officer of the squadron, scrambled with four planes and reported to a FAC attached to the Canadian and Australian battalions of the British Commonwealth Division. These troops were engaged near Chipyong Ni in the hottest fight of the first phase of Operation Killer. After the FAC marked the CCF strongholds with white phosphorus, the Corsairs came snarling in with napalm, rocket, and strafing runs just ahead of the infantry. The enemy was driven out of positions defended by 20mm anti-personnel fire, but Major Davis paid with his life on the 8th run when he lost a wing and crashed to his death. General Smith in command of 9 Corps On 24 February 1951 came the news that General Moore had suddenly died as the indirect result of a helicopter accident. The aircraft had plunged into the Han River after hitting a telephone wire, and the 9 Corps commander was rescued unhurt only to die of a heart attack half an hour afterwards. Commander of the 8th Infantry Division in European operations of World War II, General Moore later became superintendent of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. As his successor, pending a permanent appointment, General Ridgway named General Smith to the command of 9 Corps. When announcing his decision, the 8th Army commander said, General Smith is to be taken into their hearts in 9 Corps, and, by definite action, made to feel that he belongs there. Marines with an interest in Corps history could recall only two similar occasions when Marines commanded major U.S. Army units. Major General John A. Lejeune had headed the 2nd Infantry Division in World War I, and Major General Roy S. Geiger led the U.S. 10th Army to victory during the closing days of the Okinawa operation after a Japanese shell killed Lt. Gen. Simon Boulevard Buckner, Jr., U.S. Army. On 24 February, with Gen. Puller taking command of the 1st Marine Division, Gen. Smith flew to Yoju by helicopter to begin his new duties. 
His military competence and complete lack of ostentation made him cordially accepted at the Nine Corps CP. The following day, General Ridgway arrived for a conference. Wishing to change the boundary between Nine and Ten Corps so as to orient the former more to the north, he directed the Marine General to reach an agreement with Ten Corps. He also asked for a recommendation as to future operations of the Marines, and General Smith replied that he knew of no better employment for his division than to continue attacking along the Hoingsong Hongchon axis. The change in boundaries, as decided at a conference of Corps commanders, meant that in the zone of the 1st Marine Division, the 5th Marines on the right would be pinched out by the 3rd Rock Division of 10 Corps. On the left, the zone was to be extended by bringing the 7th Marines into line to the left of the 1st Marines, while the 5th Marines dropped back into reserve. Logistics became the better part of valor on 25 February as Ridgeway called a halt in the fighting until enough ammunition, fuel, and other supplies could be brought up for a resumption of the attack toward the final objective, Phase Line, Arizona. Napoleon's famous remark that mud should be recognized as a separate element was apt as violent rains turned all roads into swamps. Operations might have come to a standstill except for airdrops. On the 25th, the Combat Air Command flew 480.7 tons of freight and 1,004 passengers, followed by 604.9 tons and 1,193 passengers the following day. Corps and Division Engineers strove, meanwhile, with indigenous labor to repair the roads. By a prodigious effort, enough progress in logistics was made so that the USAC Commanding General could issue orders on 25 February for the second phase of Operation Killer to commence on 1 March. He made it known that he was not satisfied with the results so far. The assigned physical objectives had been taken, but the enemy's withdrawals had saved him from the full extent of the personnel and material losses Ridgway had hoped to inflict. He called on his staff officers, therefore, for plans aiming at a new operation, having the primary intent of destroying as many enemy and as much equipment as possible and, by continued pressure, allowing the enemy no time to mount a counteroffensive. A secondary mission was that of outflanking Seoul and the area between Seoul and the Imjin River, so that this territory may be taken either by attack from the east or by enemy default. The name of the new drive was to be Operation Ripper, and it was to jump off as soon as possible after the finish of Killer. The Advance to Phase Line, Arizona from newly won positions in the high ground south of Hoingsong, the Marines could look across the soggy plain to their Phase II objectives, the hills to the north of the battered town. Hoingsong occupied a valley at the confluence of two rain-swollen streams. Thus a triangular area of low, flat ground lay between the ruins and the hills which must be taken in the final phase of Operation Killer. The 1st and 7th Marines were the combat units, with the 5th Marines in reserve. The KMC Regiment, it may be recalled, had been temporarily detached for service with the ROC Army. Before the 1st and 7th Marines could launch their combined attack, the latter had to fight its way up to the point of junction after relieving elements of the 6th ROC Division. The scheme of maneuver then called for Lt. Col. Virgil W. Banning's 3-1 to side-slip into the zone of Major Maurice E. Roach's 3-7 in order to be in position for the advance across the Hoingsong Plain. This meant a crossing of the River Somme for 3-1 and a combined assault with 3-7 on the high ground along the west bank. The problem of crossing the river, 200 feet wide and chest deep at the most likely site, was turned over to Banning with the explanation that the engineer company supporting the regiment could not be diverted from road repairs. To meet this emergency, Major Edwin H. Simmons, commanding weapons company of 3-1, produced a field manual with instructions for building a Swiss bent bridge. His anti-tank assault platoon was given the task under the command of energetic technical sergeant Carmelo J. Randazzo, a veteran on his third enlistment. There was no lack of trees for timbers, and rolls of telephone wire were sworn to be beyond salvaging by the battalion communications officer. The A-shaped bents, or trusses, were lashed together with wire and enthusiasm, 
then carried out into the ice-cold water to be attached to spars and stringers. It was a great triumph for war by the book. Before dark on 28 February, two spans, one 120 feet long and another half that length, were linked by a sandbar in midstream. The improvised bridge stood up well next morning when the battalion crossed to the west bank. There, 3-1 echeloned itself behind 3-7, which gained the first thousand yards under cover of a vigorous artillery preparation and belated airstrikes. On the left, Major James I. Glendinning's 2nd Battalion of the 7th Marines ran into increasingly stubborn opposition from CCF mortar and small arms fire. Before noon, the attacks of both battalions of the 7th Marines were brought almost to a halt in difficult terrain which the Communists had booby-trapped. Neither artillery nor airstrikes had a decisive effect against an enemy sheltered by log-covered bunkers. So many delays were encountered that it was decided in mid-afternoon to postpone the advance until the following morning, 2 March. Artillery and airstrikes supported 2-7, 3-7, and 3-1 as they attacked at 0800 west of the river. Meanwhile, 1-7 patrolled on the division left flank while maintaining contact with the 6th Rock Division. Apparently, the enemy put up a hard fight only when he could not withdraw in time to avoid one. Resistance was light on the west bank, and east of the river, Lt. Col. Allen Sutter's 2-1, supported by tanks, had little trouble. His battalion linked up with 3-1 in the afternoon and dug in after taking its assigned objective, Hill 208, with casualties of three men wounded. The only determined opposition of 2 March took place during the afternoon in the zone of 2-7, there the attackers could only itch forward over rocky terrain which the enemy defended, ridge by ridge, in spite of airstrikes and 1,600 artillery rounds fired by the 11th Marines. At daybreak on the 3rd, the men of the 1st and 7th Marines could look to the north and see their final objectives. Five hills lay along Phase Line, Arizona from west to east, hills 536 and 333 in the zone of the 7th Marines, and Hills 321, 335, and 201 in the zone of the 1st Marines. The last two positions were in the path of 2-1, which seized them after several brisk firefights. Casualties of 3 KIA and 28 WIA were incurred while inflicting losses of 70 counted CCF dead. The terrain gave 3-1 more trouble than the enemy in taking Hill 321, where the CCF troops had already begun their withdrawal. It was in the zone of the 7th Marines that the Communist resistance was hottest. The 1st Battalion was summoned to cover the regimental left flank and aid in the attack of 2-7 on Hill 536, while 3-7 continued its struggle for Hill 333. Both battalions had their hardest fight of the entire operation that afternoon. They lost most of the 14 KIA and 104 WIA, which the division reported for 3 March, and the enemy still held the topographical crests. The 1st Marines had reached the mopping up stage on 4 March, while the 7th Marines prepared to go up against an expected last-ditch stand of the enemy on Hills 536 and 333. The parkas of the assault troops were powdered with snow as the men moved out to the attack at 0800, following an intensive artillery preparation. There was something ominous about the silence in the objective area, but no trap had been set for the attackers. The communists actually had pulled out under cover of darkness, leaving behind only enough outpost troops for delaying operations. Operation Killer ended at nightfall on the 4th for the Marines, though mopping up continued throughout the following day. Total Marine casualties for the eight days of fighting were 395, 48 KIA, 2 MIA, and 345 WIA. Enemy losses amounted to 274 counted dead and 48 prisoners. It is certain, however, that the actual KIA and WIA figures were much higher since the withdrawing communists buried their dead and took their wounded with them. Any evaluation of this limited objective operation must credit it with achieving its main purpose, keeping the communists off balance while they were striving desperately to make ready for another great offensive. This explains why the enemy as a whole put up a half-hearted resistance. 
He preferred to withdraw whenever possible and fight another day. Jock Air Control System Criticized Operation Killer was the first real test of the Jock system as far as the Marines were concerned, and both the Flying and Ground Force Marines felt that it had shown grave shortcomings. Air support on 1 March proved so disappointing that General Puller, as temporary commander of the 1st Marine Division, reported the situation to General Shepard, commanding FMF PAC. His letter is quoted in part as follows. We are having very little success in obtaining Marine Air for CAS, close air support, missions, and practically no success in having Marine Air on station for CAS missions. Most of our CAS missions in the current operation have been Air Force or Navy carrier planes. They do a good job and we are glad to have them, but our Marine Air, with whom we have trained and operated, can do a better job. We have attempted to ensure that Marine Air would support us, and to cut down the delays in receiving such support, as evidenced by the attached dispatches. We have received no decision relative to our requests. Apparently, the answer is no by default. General Puller's report was obviously written for the record, since General Shepard was present at the 1st Marine Division CP at the time. He witnessed personally the Marine attacks of 2 and 3 March and the air support they received. On the 3rd, the day of heaviest fighting in the entire operation, there could be no complaint that few Marine aircraft supported Marine ground forces. The Corsairs flew 26 CAS sorties that day and cleared the way more than once for the 2nd and 3rd Battalions of the 7th Marines. The trouble was that air support as administered by Jock was so often late in arriving, even when requested the evening before. More than once, the infantry had to go ahead with only artillery support. Such delays threw the whole plan of attack out of gear, for air and artillery had to be closely coordinated to be at their best. General Shepard had a series of talks with General Harris. Both then conferred with General Partridge, commander of the 5th Air Force. They requested that he authorize the 1st Maw to keep two planes on station over the 1st Marine Division whenever it was engaged. General Partridge did not concur. He maintained that Marine aircraft should be available to him if needed elsewhere in an emergency. He did consent, however, to permit 1st Maw armed reconnaissance sorties to check in with Devastate Baker for any CAS requests. This conference did much to clear up the situation. On 5 March, no less than 48 Marine sorties reported to Devastate Baker, though there was little need for them in mopping up operations. And during the next two weeks, an average of 40 sorties a day was maintained. End of Chapter 4, Part 2 Chapter 5, Part 1 of U.S. Marine Operations in Korea, 1950-1953 Volume 4, The East Central Front, by Lynn Montross, Norman Hicks, and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Operation Ripper The new Nine Corps commander, Major General William H. Hogue, U.S. Army, arrived at Yeoju on 4 March 1951. He relieved General Smith the next day, and a color guard turned out to render honors to the Marine commander when he returned by helicopter to his own division CP. Upon Smith's arrival, General Puller resumed his former duties as ADC. The jump-off of the new operation was scheduled for 0800 on 7 March, so little time remained for last-minute preparations. The basic plan called for the drive of 9 and 10 Corps toward the 38th parallel on the Central Front. Protection was to be given on the left flank by one corps in the area south and east of Seoul. On the right, the ROC divisions had the mission of maintaining lateral security with a limited northward advance. It was no secret that General Ridgway had been disappointed in the numbers of enemy soldiers put out of action during Operation Killer. The primary purpose of Ripper was to inflict as many communist casualties as possible, and by means of constant pressure to keep the enemy off balance in his build-up for a new offensive. A secondary purpose was to outflank Seoul and the area between that city and the River Imjin, thus compelling the enemy to choose between default and a defense on unfavorable terms. 
CCF's strategy in the early spring of 1951 was obviously conditioned by preparations for a third grade offensive. The enemy's emphasis on caution is shown in a translation of a CCF training directive of this period. There must absolutely be no hasty or impatient attitude toward warfare. Consequently, even though we have a thorough knowledge of the enemy situation and the terrain, if one day is disadvantageous for us to engage in combat, it should be done the next day. If day fighting is disadvantageous, fighting should be conducted at night, and if engagements in a certain terrain are not to our advantage, another location should be selected for combat engagement. When the enemy is concentrated and a weak point is difficult to find, one must be created by agitating or confusing them in some way or wait until the enemy is deploying. Engagements must be conducted only when the situation is entirely to our advantage. Light resistance the first day. United Nations forces held a line extending across the peninsula from Incheon in the west by the way of Hoinsong to the east coast in the vicinity of Chamunjin. The Nine Corps order called for the 1st Marine Division to maintain lateral contact with the 1st Cavalry Division on the left and the 2nd Infantry Division on the right. Hong Chan and Chun Chan, two of the main objectives of Operation Ripper, lay directly in the path of the Nine Corps advance. Both were important communications centers which could be utilized to advantage by the enemy for his forthcoming offensive. The first phase line in the Nine Corps zone was Albany. The Marines did not need a map to locate an objective just beyond Oem Mountain, a stark 2,900-foot peak about five and a half miles from the line of departure. Distance in this area was conditioned by terrain, and it was a natural fortress of wooded hills and swift streams that confronted the 1st Marine Division. Highways were conspicuous by their absence, and extensive maintenance would be required to utilize the Hoingsong Hanchan Road as an MSR. So few and poor were the secondary roads that it would sometimes prove necessary for vehicles to detour along the rocky stream beds. The last offensive had not developed major or prolonged resistance at any point, yet that possibility had to be anticipated by Marine planners. At least the enemy was an old acquaintance, the 66th CCF Army, commanded by General Shoshu Kwai, the 196th Division was on the left and the 197th on the right, with the 198th in reserve. These units were believed to comprise about 24,000 men. Wednesday, 7 March, dawn cold and clear, with snow falling in the afternoon. The Hoingsong Hanshan Road, winding through Kansama Pass, paralleled the boundary between the two Marine assault regiments, the 7th Marines on the left and the 1st Marines on the right. They jumped off to attack in line abreast, employing all three battalions when the broken terrain permitted, while the 5th Marines continued its patrolling activities in the Hoinsong area as division reserve. The 11th Marines had to ration its artillery ammunition, owing to supply shortages. Jock came to the rescue nobly by ordering MAG-33 to place 11 flights of four planes each at the disposal of Devastate Baker on D-1. These aircraft reported at hourly intervals to work over targets in the area of the next day's marine operations. For the ground forces, it was an embarrassment of riches. They had more air support than they could use at times, and Devastate Baker sent the surplus to hit reserve concentrations and other targets of opportunity in the enemy's rear. The two marine assault regiments met with light resistance on D-Day. Both took their objectives with little trouble except for scattered bursts of machine gun fire. Total casualties for the day were seven men wounded. It was like old times to have marine planes supporting marine ground forces. MAG-12 aircraft were on the job the next day, when CCF resistance stiffened without ever becoming serious. Heavy CCF mortar and small arms fire was received by 3-1 supported by Company A of the 1st Tank Battalion. Well-placed rounds by the 11th Marines silenced the enemy in this quarter, and both battalions of the 1st Marines reached their assigned positions by nightfall. The second day's advances gave added proof that the enemy was up to his old trick of putting up a limited defense while pulling back before the Marines could come to grips. Log bunkers were ideal for these CCF delaying tactics, 
Each was a little fortress that might enable a squad to stand off a company while larger CCF units withdrew. The Marine Assault Troops found that a preliminary treatment of napalm from MAG-12 aircraft, followed by a well-aimed 90mm fire from the tanks, did much to soften up the bunkers for an infantry attack with hand grenades. Company A of the 7th Marines had the hardest fight of all Marine units on 8 March. 2nd Lieutenant Clayton O. Bush and the 2nd Platoon led the attack on the company objective, a hill mass to the left of Oum San. With 300 yards still to be covered, the Marines were pinned down by well-aimed CCF small arms and mortar fire, including white phosphorus. A high-explosive shell scored a direct hit on the platoon, killing two men and wounding three. Bush was evacuated with his right arm mangled. First Lieutenant Eugenius Hovatter, the company commander, ordered the first platoon to pass through the second and continue the attack with air and tank support. The flat trajectory fire of the 90mm rifles did much to help the company clear the enemy from the hill and the 7th Marines reached all assigned regimental objectives for the day. The Marine advance came to a halt on 9 March to wait for Army units to catch up on the right. While the 2nd Battalion of the 1st Marines took blocking positions, the 1st and 7th Marines sent out patrols on both flanks in an effort to regain lateral contact. For the next two days, 1st Marine Division operations were limited to patrolling. A good deal of activity took place in the rear, however, as Marine service units moved up to Hoinsong. Soul Abandoned by Enemy The advance was resumed on 11 March after the relief of 2-1 by Major Walter Gall's Division Reconnaissance Company, reinforced by a platoon of tanks. Although the enemy withdrew from most of his positions without putting up much resistance, a patrol of George Company, 3-1, had a hot firefight on Hill 549. Opening fire at 50 yards from camouflaged, log-faced bunkers, the Chinese killed one man and wounded nine. Marine infantrymen, supported by flat trajectory 90mm fire, approached within grenade-throwing range to destroy five bunkers and kill 16 of the defenders. As the patrol withdrew, it called on the 11th Marines to finish the job. The cannoneers were credited with several direct hits. Chinese resistance continued to be light as the two Marine regiments occupied rather than seized ground on 12 and 13 March. By the 14th, all units were dug in along Phase Line Albany. CCF withdrawals were also reported by other 8th Army units. On 15 March, a patrol from the 1st Rock Division of 1 Corps found Seoul abandoned by the enemy. The Chinese Reds had made their choice, and UN forces took over a devastated city with some 200,000 civilians dragging out a miserable existence in the ruins. Dead power lines dangled over buildings pounded into rubble, and even such a famous landmark as the enormous red, brass-studded gates of the American Embassy compound had been destroyed. It was the fourth time that Seoul had changed hands in nine months of war. Air reconnaissance having established that the enemy had withdrawn about 15 miles to entrench positions in the Weijanbu area, General Ridgeway enlarged the mission of One Corps by directing it to advance on the left of Nine Corps. During the first phase of Operation Ripper, from 7 to 13 March, Counted casualties inflicted on the enemy by 10 Corps amounted to 6,543 KIA and 216 POW. Nine Corps casualties during the same period were reported as 158 KIA, 965 WIA, and 35 MIA, a total of 1,158. The total strength of the 8th Army, less the Marines, was 185,229 officers and men in March 1951. Adding the 25,642 of the 1st Marine Division, the 4,645 of the 1st Marine Aircraft Wing, plus 11,353 of the American Air Force and 355 attached from the U.S. Navy, 227,119 Americans were serving in Korea. This does not count 13,475 South Koreans serving in various U.S. Army divisions. 
The 1st Marine Aircraft Wing, with an authorized total of 728 officers and 4,216 enlisted men, had an actual strength of 626 and 4,019 respectively on 31 March 1951. Of an authorized 29 officers and 93 enlisted men from the Navy, 22 and 83 in these categories were on duty. Troops to the number of 21,184 from the ground forces of other United Nations were represented as follows. United Kingdom and Australia, 10,136. Turkey, 4,383. Philippines, 1,277. Thailand, 1,050. Canada, 858. New Zealand, 816. Greece, 777. France, 749. Belgium, Luxembourg, 638. Netherlands, 500. Total, 21,184. The 249,815 officers and men of the ROC Army make a total UN combat strength of 493,503. There were an additional 671 in three non combat units the Danish hospital ship Jutlandia, 186, the 60th Indian Ambulance Group, 329, and the Swedish Evacuation Hospital Unit, 156. Chinese forces in Korea, including confirmed and probable, totaled 16 armies, each comparable to a U.S. Corps. Eight others were reported. Assuming that these CCF units averaged a field strength of 24,000 officers and men, the total would have been 384,000 for the 16 armies. The reorganized forces of the North Korean People's Army, NKPA, were credited with five armies. Adding these 120,000 men to the 16 Chinese armies, the enemy had 504,000 troops in Korea plus whatever might have been the strength of the eight reported armies and the rear area service elements. In addition, large reserves stood just over the border in Manchuria. Second Phase of the Operation With scarcely a pause on Phase Line Albany, the second phase of Operation Ripper began on 14 March with a drive toward Phase Line Buffalo. Despite the difficulty of maneuver over muddy roads and mountainous terrain, an 8th Army directive of that date called for a pincers movement to be initiated by means of a rapid advance of the 1st Marine Division on the right and the 1st Cavalry Division on the left. It was hoped that the Chinese forces south of Hongchong might be trapped and destroyed after the 187th Airborne Regiment cut off escape by landing north of the town. General Ridgway having urged his corps commanders to stress maneuver, nine corps sent this message to division commanders. It is desired that more use be made of maneuver within and between division zones with a view toward trapping and annihilating the enemy through such maneuver. Movement should be less stereotyped. It is not desirable that units always advance toward the enemy abreast. Well-planned and successfully executed maneuver using companies and battalions has previously been conducted. This should be extended to include regiments. This headquarters is studying and will continue to study and order into execution the maneuver of divisions with the same intent and purpose. Both the 1st Marine Division and 1st Cavalry Division made rapid progress toward Phase Line Baker, established by 9 Corps as an intermediate control. Unfortunately, for the purposes of the envelopment maneuver, the Chinese withdrew from the Hongchan area before the pincers could close or the 187th Airborne make an airdrop. CCF resistance was confined to machine gun fire covering hasty retirements. The 7th Marines on the left occupied its objective without once calling for air or artillery support, and the 1st Marines was virtually unopposed. Division casualties for the 14th were six men wounded. Flash floods and roads churned into hub-deep mud were the greatest enemies of progress. Serious as the resulting supply problems were, they may have been worse but for the efforts of the recently organized Civil Transport Corps formed from members of the ROC National Guard who lacked the necessary training for military duties. There was no shortage of willing indigenous labor, for these auxiliaries received pay as well as rations and clothing. Formed into companies, they worked with the wooden A-frames, so-called because of their shape, 
used from time immemorial in Korea as a rack for carrying heavy burdens. The Civil Transport Corps proved to be a boon for the 8th Army. Veteran porters could manage a load of 100 to 125 pounds over ground too rugged for motor vehicles. Several hundred were attached to each regiment during Operation Ripper. Any lingering hope of rounding up Chinese prisoners in the Hongchang area was blasted on the 15th when evidence of Chinese withdrawal came in the form of an enemy radio message intercepted at 12.30. We cannot fight any longer, the translation read. We must move back today. We will move back at 1400. Enemy troops will enter our position at 1300 or 1400. Enemy troops approaching fast. Hong Chan fell without a fight to the 1st Battalion of the 7th Marines on the afternoon of 15 March. Major Webb D. Sawyer, the commanding officer, sent a motor patrol through the ruins without flushing out any Chinese, but on the return trip, a truck was damaged by a butterfly bomb. This led to the discovery that the Hong Chan area was covered with similar explosives that had been dropped by U.S. planes to slow up the CCF counterattacks in the middle of February. Butterfly bombs, so-called because of the whirling veins that controlled the drop and armed the four-pound projectiles, could be set for air or ground burst. Usually, however, they were dropped in clusters to remain on the ground until disturbed. Apparently, the enemy had not trouble to clear them from the Hong Chan area, and that three-day task was begun by Company D of the 1st Engineer Battalion while 1-7 seized the high ground northwest of the town. Changes in 1st Maw Units Air support for the ground forces continued to be more than adequate in quantity. Since the agreement between Generals Partridge and Harris, 40 1st Maw sorties a day had been allotted to the 1st Marine Division. The timing was not all that could have been asked on occasion, but on a whole the Marine infantry had no complaint. The 1st Maw had undergone an extensive reshuffling of units on the eve of Operation Ripper. VMFN 542 was sent back to El Toro, California for conversion to F-3D jet all-weather fighters. The squadron's F-7F-3Ns and two F-82s were left with VMFN 513. The former commanding officer of 542, Lieutenant Colonel James R. Anderson, assumed command of 513. He relieved Lieutenant Colonel David C. Wolfe, who returned to the States. The California-bound cadre of 542 included 45 officers and 145 enlisted men under Major Albert L. Clark. VMFN 513 was now a composite squadron, attacking from K-1 during the day with its F-4U-5Ns and at night with its F-7F-3Ns. Another change took place when VMF-312 replaced VMF-212 on the CVE Baton. The former squadron had been preparing for weeks to perform carrier duty so that the change was made without a hitch. VMF-212, after nearly three months on the Baton, established itself at K-3 under a new commanding officer, Lt. Col. Claude H. Welch, who relieved Lt. Col. Wachowski. The transportation jam in Korea made necessary the permanent assignment of a VMR-152 detachment to 1st Ma headquarters. Transports had heretofore been sent to the wing on a temporary basis and returned to Hawaii when missions were completed. Mud and inadequate rail facilities doubled the demands on FIFA's aerial supply of combat forces. The Wing's courier service to Marine Air and ground forces scattered over Korea reached the limit of its capabilities. As a solution, General Harris requested a five-plane VMR-152 detachment on a long-term assignment, and Colonel Dean C. Roberts took command of this forward echelon at Atami. It was now possible to handle cargo and troop transport at the cargo and passenger terminals of all Marine Air bases. In one four-day period, Early in April, approximately 2,000 replacement troops were lifted from Masan to Hoingsong by the 5R5Ds. About 1,000 rotated veterans were flown back on the return trips. A further change involved the coordination of the wing's air control organizations. As the enemy's air power increased, obviously the problems of UN air defense multiplied. 
At K-1, the Marine Ground Intercept Squadron 1, MiG SIS-1, and the Air Defense Section of Marine Tactical Air Control Squadron 2, MTAX-2, were hard-pressed to identify and control the hundreds of aircraft flying daily over Korea. There was no adequate system of alerting these air defense stations to the effect that planes were departing or incoming. Many of them failed to send out their standard identification friend or foe, IFF, signals, and those that did were still suspect, since U.S. electronics equipment on U.N. planes had fallen into enemy hands. As a consequence, McSIS-1 was kept busy vectoring air defense fighters to verify that certain bogies were friendly transports, B-29s, or enemy bombers. In an effort to cope with the situation, General Harris requested that another Marine Ground Control Intercept Squadron, MiG-SIS-3, be sent to Korea. He desired that Marine Air Control Group 2, MACG-2, also be made available to coordinate the wing's air control functions. These units sailed on 5 March from San Francisco. Until March 1951, the Air Force's 606th Aircraft Control and Warning Squadron had participated in the air surveillance of the Pusan area from the top of 3,000-foot Chongsan, the encroaching mountain that made K-9's traffic pattern so hazardous. The Air Force unit displaced to Taejeon early in March, and the MiG-SIS-1 commanding officer, Major H.E. Allen, moved his radio and radar vans to the mountaintop to take over the job. End of chapter 5, part 1. Chapter 5, part 2 of U.S. Marine Operations in Korea, 1950-1953, Volume 4, The East Central Front, by Lynn Montross, Norman Hicks, and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Operation Ripper General MacArthur Visits Marine Battalion Following the occupation of Hongchon on the 15th, the Marine ground forces ran into stiffening enemy opposition during the next two days. The 2nd and 3rd Battalions of the 7th Marines were pinned down by intense CCF mortar and artillery fire when attacking Hill 356. Three out of six friendly 81mm mortars were knocked out on 15 March in the 3rd Battalion area, and at dusk, 2-7 and 3-7 had barely won a foothold on the hill. The 1st Marines also met opposition, which indicated that the enemy planned to make a stand on the high ground east and north of Hongchan. An intricate maneuver was executed when Lt. Col. Robert K. McClellan's 2-1 swung from the right flank, where no enemy was encountered, to the extreme left. As a preliminary, the battalion had to circle to the rear, then move by truck up the MSR and through the zone of the 7th Marines as far as the village of Yangjamal. Dismounting, the men made a difficult march across broken country toward Hill 246. At 12.30 on the 15th, the column deployed to attack Hill 428 in conjunction with Lt. Col. Virgil W. Banning's 3rd Battalion. Easy Company, Captain Jack A. Smith, and Item Company, First Lieutenant Joseph R. Fisher, engaged in a hot firefight with the enemy. Both sides relied chiefly on mortars, but the Chinese had the advantage of firing from camouflage bunkers. Smith called for an airstrike and four planes from VMF-214 responded immediately. Fox Company, Captain Goodwin C. Groff, and Dog Company, Captain Welby D. Cronk, were committed in the attempt to carry Hill 428, but the enemy continued to resist stubbornly until dusk. McClellan then ordered a withdrawal to night defensive positions around Hill 246. The two assault battalions had suffered 7 KIA and 86 WIA casualties. Counted enemy dead were reported as 93. Lieutenant Colonel Donald R. Kennedy's 3-5 was attached to the 1st Marines to protect the right flank as the Marines prepared to resume the attack on the morning of the 16th. But the enemy had pulled out from Hill 428 during the night and patrols advanced more than 300 yards without making contact. Another hard action awaited the 7th Marines on the 16th when Major Sawyer's 1st Battalion moved up to line Baker. The Chinese resisted so hard on Hill 399 that the Marines had to attack bunker after bunker with grenades. 
The following morning was the occasion of a visit to the front by General MacArthur. Accompanied by Generals Ridgway and O.P. Smith, he drove in a jeep from Wanju over the mountain pass to Hongchon, where the Marine engineers were still clearing mines. The jeep stalled after crossing the Hongchon gang at a ford and a tow was necessary. This did not deter the commander-in-chief, who had asked to visit a Marine battalion in a combat area. He was taken to the CP of Major Sawyer, whose 17 was mopping up on Hill 399 after the hard fight of the day before. Five hours of riding over miserable roads had not daunted the 71-year-old veteran of two world wars. He seemed fresh and rested as he shook hands with 17 officers. Although we had not passed the word regarding General MacArthur's visit, commented General Smith, there were dozens of cameras in evidence. Nine Corps orders were received on the 17th for the 1st Marine Division to attack from Line Baker to Line Buffalo. The division plan of maneuver called for the 5th Marines to pass through and relieve the 7th Marines while the 1st Marines continued to advance on the right. Again, the enemy chose withdrawal to resistance, and five of the 6th Marine battalions reached Line Buffalo on 20 March after encountering only sniper fire and a few scattered mortar rounds. Enemy opposition was reserved for 2-1 on the 19th, when Fox Company was pinned down by enemy small arms and mortar fire from a long, narrow ridge running north and south to the west of Hill 330. Fortunately for the attackers, a parallel valley enabled the platoon of tanks from Baker Company, 1st Tank Battalion, to knock out unusually strong CCF bunkers with direct 90mm fire while Fox Company riflemen followed along the ridgeline with a grenade attack before the enemy had time to recover. Thanks to intelligent planning, not a single Marine was killed or wounded as the battalion dug in for the night on Hill 330. Adopting the same tactics on the 20th, after artillery preparation and an airstrike by VMF-214 and VMF-323 planes, Easy Company of 2-1 advanced along the ridgeline connecting Hills 330 and 381 while tanks moved forward on either side providing direct flat trajectory 90mm fire. By 1315, the Marines had overrun the enemy's main line of resistance without a casualty. 1st KMC Regiment returns to division. As the 8th Army jumped off on 20 March from Line Buffalo toward Line Cairo, the 1st KMC Regiment was attached again to the 1st Marine Division. This was the third time that Lt. Col. Charles W. Harrison had been directed to reorganize and reassemble a KMC Liaison Advisory Group. The 3rd Battalion of the 11th Marines, commanded by Lt. Col. William McReynolds, was placed in direct artillery support. When the advance was resumed, the KMC's attack between the 1st Marines on the right and the 5th Marines on the left. The high esprit de corps of the KMC's shines forth from a comment written in his own English by 1st Lieutenant Kim Sik Tong. The KMC ideal is to complete the mission, regardless of receiving strong enemy resistance, with endurance and strong united power, and always bearing in one's mind the distinction between honor and dishonor. The zone of the KMC regiment was a roadless wilderness, making it necessary to airdrop ammunition and supplies for the attack on Hill 975. This was the hardest fight of the division advance to line Cairo. Excellent artillery support was provided for the 2nd and 3rd battalions as they inched their way forward in three days of bitter combat. Not until the morning of 24 March was the issue decided by maneuver when the 1st Battalion moved around the left KMC flank into a position threatening the enemy's right. Resistance slackened immediately on Hill 975 and the KMCs took their objective without further trouble. The 1st and 5th Marines were already on line Cairo, having met comparatively light opposition from NKPA troops who had relieved the 66th and 39th CCF armies. Apparently, the enemy was using North Koreans as expendable delaying elements while massing in the rear for an offensive that could be expected at any time. A smokescreen, produced by burning green wood, shrouded the front in an almost constant haze. Although the objectives of Operation Ripper had been reached, General Ridgway planned to continue the UN offensive for the purpose of keeping the enemy off balance during his offensive preparations. 
The 8th Army had been attacking with few and brief pauses for regrouping even since 21 February, and the commanding general wished to maintain this momentum. An advance of the 1st Marine Division to a new line Cairo was ordered by 9 Corps on 26 March. This was simply a northeast extension of the old line to the boundary between 9 and 10 Corps. There was no need for the 5th Marines to advance, and the 1st Marines and KMC Regiment moved up to the new line on schedule without opposition. 8th Army units had made average gains of about 35 miles during the last three weeks while driving nearly to the 38th parallel. On 29 March, General Ridgway published a plan for Operation Rugged. It was to be a continuation of the offensive, with Line Kansas as the new objective. While other 1st Marine units were being relieved by 10 Corps elements, the 7th Marines was to be moved up from reserve near Hongchan and attached to the 1st Cavalry Division for the attack beyond Chunchan, evacuated by the retreating enemy. On 1 April, the Marines were informed of sweeping changes in 9 Corps plans. Instead of being relieved, the 1st Marine Division was to continue forward with two infantry regiments plus the KMCs. Its new mission called for a relief of the 1st Cavalry Division, with the 7th Marines attached, north of Chunchan. This modification gave General Smith the responsibility for nearly 20 miles of front. I visited this front frequently, commented Major General A.L. Bowser, the G3 of that period, and it was difficult at times to even locate an infantry battalion. Visitors from the States or FMF PAC were shocked at the wide frontages. 38th Parallel Recrossed by Marines Further 9 Corps instructions on 2 April directed that the 1st Marines go into Division Reserve near Hongchan while the 5th Marines and the 1st KMC Regiment attacked. The deep, swift Soyoung Gang, fordable in only a few places, lay squarely in the path of the 5th Marines. Speculations as to the method of crossing became rife just as air mattresses were issued. And though the officers denied any such intent, the troops were convinced that inflated mattresses would be used. As it happened, the regimental executive officer, Lt. Col. Stewart, worked out a plan that did not include any such novelty. A narrow ford was discovered that would get the 1st and 2nd battalions across while the 3rd rode in DUKWs. Light enemy opposition of a rear guard nature was encountered, but the regiment completed the operation without casualties. Stuart reported to the regimental CP and learned that a jeep waited to take him on the initial lap of his homeward journey. He was the last man to leave Korea of the 1st Provisional Marine Brigade, which had landed at Pusan on 2 August 1950. After reaching their prescribed objectives, the 5th Marines and KMC Regiment were relieved on 5 April by elements of the 7th Infantry Division of 10 Corps. Meanwhile, the 7th Marines, attached to the 1st Cavalry Division, advanced northward with the 7th and 8th Cavalry Regiments. Little opposition developed, and on 4 April, the Marines were among the 1st 8th Army troops to recross the 38th Parallel. General Ridgway published another operation plan on 6 April 1951 and designated new 8th Army objectives to the northward. The purpose was to threaten the buildup for the forthcoming CCF offensive that was taking place behind the enemy lines in the so-called Iron Triangle. This strategic area, one of the few places of comparatively level real estate in Central Korea, was bounded by Kumwa, Chorwan, and Pyongyang. A broad valley containing a network of good roads, it had been utilized by the Chinese for the massing of supplies and troops. Experience had proved that interdictory bombing could not prevent the enemy from nourishing an offensive, even though the fief had complete control of the air over roads and rail lines of a mountainous peninsula. The Chinese, though hampered in their efforts, had been able to bring up large quantities of supplies under cover of darkness. General Ridgway determined, therefore, to launch his ground forces at objectives threatening the Iron Triangle, thus forcing the enemy to fight. On 8 April, in preparation for the new effort, the 1st Marine Division was directed by 9 Corps to relieve the 1st Cavalry Division on Line Kansas and prepare to attack toward Line Quantico. 
Renewal of Division's Cass Problems By this time, after three months of various sorts of operational difficulties, VMF 311 was riding a wave of efficiency. The distance from the operating base to the combat area emphasized the superior speed of the F-9Fs. The Panther jets could get into action in half the time required by the Corsairs. The jets were more stable in rocket, bombing, and strafing runs. They were faster on armed reconnaissance and often were pouring it into the enemy before he could disperse. These advantages offset the high fuel consumption of the F-9Fs and made them ideal planes for close air support. On the morning of 8 April, an opportunity arose for the Marine jets to help the 7th Marines. It started when 3-7 patrols encountered 120mm mortars, small arms, automatic weapons, and grenades employed by an enemy force dug in on a ridge looming over the road near the west end of the Huichon Reservoir. The battalion forward air controller radioed Devastate Baker at Hongchan for air support. At the time, Major Roy R. Hewitt, an air officer on General Shepard's FMF PAC staff, was visiting the air support section of Marine Tactical Air Squadron 2, MTAX-2. His blow-by-blow -blow report of events is as follows. A. At 0900, a request for an air support strike on an enemy mortar position was received by the 7th Marines. It took the air support section until 0945 to get through to Jock, and then it had to be shunted through K-1 in order to get the request in. B. The G-3 1st Marine Air Wing had arranged with Jock to have four F-9Fs scramble alert for use by the 1st Marine Division. The F-9Fs were requested, and Jock authorized their use, but when Marine Aircraft Group 33 was contacted, they informed the air support section that Jock had already scrambled the aircraft and sent them to another target. C. Air support section again contacted Jock, and Jock said aircraft would be on station in one hour. At the end of one hour, Jock was again contacted concerning aircraft. This time, Jock said they would have two flights on station within one hour. At the end of the second one-hour period, no aircraft were received. D. Again, the air support section contacted Jock and was informed that any air support for the 7th Marines would have to be requested through the 1st Cavalry Division to which the 7th Marines were attached. In fact, Jock notified Devastate Baker that any such requests from the 1st Marine Division would not be honored until the division went back into action. During all this time, 10 Marine planes, 6 from VMF-311 and 4 from VMF-214, had reported in and out of the area. They had been sent by Mello to work under the control of Mosquito Strategy, the Tactical Air Controller, Airborne, TAC-A, of the 1st Cavalry Division. The flights also supported the 6th Rock Division patrols on the Marines' left, hit troops in a small settlement three miles to the Marines' front, and aided the 7th and 8th Cavalry regiments which were encountering resistance on the commanding ground to the right. None of the flights supported the Marines. Meanwhile, the 3-7 Marines employed artillery and tanks on the enemy positions, and late in the day a Mosquito brought in a flight of four Air Force F-80s. Major Hewitt's report continued. E. At the end of six hours, air support was finally received by the 7th Marines. It was brought in by a Mosquito who would not relinquish control of the aircraft to the forward air controller who could see the target much better than the Mosquito. F. After having the fighters make a couple of passes, the Mosquito took the fighters and went to another target without having completely destroyed the position. This was the beginning of a deterioration in air support for Marine ground forces that can be charged in large measure to the jock system of control. Major Hewitt's report was read with great interest by high-ranking Navy and Marine Corps officers. By now, they were devoting a lot of thought to the breakup of the Marine Air Ground Team. End of Chapter 5, Part 2「Chapter Six, Part One of u s Marine Operations in Korea, nineteen fifty 1950 to nineteen fifty three Volume Four, The East Central Front by Lynn Montross, Norman Hicks, and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The CCF Spring Offensive. 
On 10 April 1951, the 1st Marine Division was poised on Line, Kansas for a drive to Line, Quantico. Then a new 9 Corps directive put on the brakes, and for 10 days Marine activities were limited to patrolling and preparation of defensive works. Boundary adjustments between the Division and the 6th Rock Division on the left extended the Marine zone about 2,000 yards to the west, and General O.P. Smith's CP was advanced to Sapyong Ni, just south of the 38th parallel. Out of a blue sky came the announcement on the 11th that General MacArthur had been recalled by President Truman for failure to give wholehearted support to the policies of the United States government and of the United Nations in matters pertaining to his official duties. General Ridgway was appointed to the UN command, and he in turn was relieved on 14 April by Lieutenant General James A. Van Fleet, U.S. Army. The new 8th Army commander, youthful in appearance for his 59 years, was no novice at fighting communists. In 1949 and 1950, he had been director of the Joint Military Aid Group that saved Greece from falling into the clutches of communism after Moscow fomented a civil war. Van Fleet also brought to his new command a World War II reputation as a vigorous leader with a preference for offensive doctrines. Prisoners reveal date of offensive. Chinese prisoners taken during the first weeks of April 1951 told all they knew with no apparent reluctance, just as Japanese captives had given information in World War II. Inconsistent as it may seem that fanatical Asian soldiers should prove so cooperative, such was the penalty the enemy paid for insisting on resistance to the last ditch. Since the possibility of surrender was not considered, CCF prisoners were taught no code of behavior and answered questions freely and frankly. POW interrogations were supplemented by captured documents revealing that the Chinese prided themselves on a new tactical doctrine known as the Roving Defensive, put into effect in the spring of 1951. It meant not to hold your position to the death, but to defend against the enemy through movement, explained a secret CCF directive dated 17 March 1951. Therefore, the wisdom of the roving defensive is based on exhausting the enemy without regard for the loss or gain of some fighting area or the immediate fulfillment of our aims. It was admitted that the CCF soldier must work harder, because the troops will have to construct entrenchments and fieldworks in every place they move. But the advantages were that roving warfare can conserve our power, deplete the enemy's strength, and secure for us more favorable conditions for future victory. Meanwhile, the enemy will make the mistake once again and collapse on the Korean battlefield. The last sentence evidently refers to the U.N. advance of late November 1950 that was rolled back by a surprise CCF counteroffensive. Chinese strategists seem to have concluded that their roving defensive had made possible another such offensive victory in the spring of 1951. At any rate, prisoners questioned by the 1st Marine Division and other 9 Corps units agreed that the CCF 5th Phase Offensive was scheduled to begin on 22 April 1951. The 9 Corps zone was said to be the target area for an attempted breakthrough. Marine G-2 officers recalled that prisoners gave information on the eve of the CCF offensive in November 1950 that proved to be astonishingly accurate in light of later events. For it was a paradox that the Chinese Reds, so secretive in other respects, let the man in the ranks know about high-level strategic plans. In the spring of 1951, it mattered little, since air reconnaissance had kept the 8th Army well informed as to the enemy buildup. Prisoners were taken in the 9 Corps zone from the following major CCF units during the first three weeks of April. 20th Army, 58th, 59th, and 60th Divisions. Estimated strength, 24,261. 26th Army. 76th, 77th, and 78th Divisions. Estimated total strength, 22,222. 39th Army, 115th, 116th, and 117th Divisions. Estimated total strength, 
19,538. 40th Army, 118th, 119th, and 120th Divisions. Estimated total strength, 25,319. The 20th and 26th, it may be recalled, were two of the CCF armies opposing the 1st Marine Division during the Chosen Reservoir breakout. It was a satisfaction to the Marines that their opponents of December 1950 had evidently needed from three to four months to reorganize and get back into action. In CCF Reserve on 21 April 1951 were the 42nd and 66th Armies, both located in the Iron Triangle to the enemy's rear. The former included the 124th, 125th, and 126th Divisions, the 124th being the unit cut to pieces from 3 to 7 November 1950 by the 7th Marines in the war's first American offensive action against Chinese Red adversaries. Huichan occupied by KMC Regiment. At 0700 on the 21st, the 1st Marine Division resumed the attack toward Line Quantico with the 7th Marines on the left, the 5th Marines in the center, the KMC Regiment on the right, and the 1st Marines in reserve. Negligible resistance awaited the Marines and other 9 Corps troops during advances of 5,000 to 9,000 yards. An ominous quiet hung over the front as green wood smoke limited visibility to a few hundred yards. On the Marine left, the 6th Rock Division lost touch, opening a gap of 2,500 yards, according to a message from Corps to the 1st Marine Division. The Rock Commander was ordered by Corps to restore lateral contact. This incident would be recalled significantly by the Marines when the CCF blow fell. The KMC Regiment had the mission of finishing the fight for control of the Huichan Reservoir area. Early in April, the 1st Cavalry Division and the 4th Ranger Company, U.S. Army, had been repulsed in attempts to fight their way across the artificial lake in rubber boats. The enemy retaliated by opening the penstocks and spillway gates. Considering that the dam was 275 feet high and the spillway was 826 feet long, it is not surprising that a wall of water 10 feet high roared down the Pukan Valley into areas recently occupied by nine Corps units. Both Army and Marine engineers were on the alert, having been warned by aerial observers. They cut three floating bridges loose from one bank or another so that they could ride out the crest of the flood. Thanks to this precaution, only temporary damage and interruption of traffic resulted. The 1st Engineer Battalion, commanded by Lt. Col. John H. Partridge, was given the mission by Corps of jamming the gates of the dam at the open position. Compliance would have to wait, of course, until the KMCs took the dam. Partridge conferred meanwhile with Colonel Bowser, and it was decided to take no action after the anticipated capture until a demolitions reconnaissance could be made. As early as 18 April, a KMC patrol had crossed the Pukan into the town of Huichan, which was found abandoned except for 11 Chinese soldiers, who were taken prisoner. The Marine engineers installed a floating bridge on the 21st for the advance of one KMC battalion the next morning. The other two battalions were to cross the river several miles downstream by DUKWs. Corps plans for the attack were made in full realization of air reconnaissance reports for 20 and 21 April, indicating that the enemy offensive buildup was in its final stages. This intelligence was gleaned in spite of all enemy efforts to frustrate the airmen. CCF spotters were placed on mountaintops to give the alarm, and relays of men fired shots to pass on warnings of approaching planes. Anti-aircraft defenses were increased at such vital spots as bridges and supply areas. The communists even went so far as to put out decoys, fake trucks, tanks, and tank cars, to lure UN fighter bombers within range of anti-aircraft guns. These efforts resulted in 16 Marine planes being shot down from 1 to 21 April 1951. Nine of the pilots were killed, one was captured, three were rescued from enemy territory, 
one walk back to friendly outposts, and two managed to bail out or crash land behind the UN lines. This total was equivalent to two-thirds of the average tactical squadron. Because of the disruption to the first small pilot replacement program, the Commandant arranged for 20 pilots to be flown to Korea to augment the normal rotation quotas. Direct opposition from enemy aircraft was also on the increase. CCF flights even reached the USAC battle line as unidentified light planes flew over positions or dropped small bombs. Evidently, the enemy was using well-camouflaged airfields in North Korea. An air battle took place on 20 April when two VMF-312 pilots from the Bataan, Captain Philip C. DeLong and First Lieutenant Harold D. Dai, encountered four Yak fighters in the heavily defended pyongyang Chinampo area. They gave chase and shot down three of the enemy planes. Marine aircraft were on station when Marine ground forces resumed their forward movement at 0830 on the morning of 22 April. A CCF prisoner taken that very afternoon confirmed previous POW statements that the 22nd was the opening day of the 5th phase offensive. The front was quiet, however, as the three Marine infantry regiments advanced almost at will. A motorized patrol of Division Reconnaissance Company, led by the commanding officer, Major Robert L. Autry, had the initial contact with the enemy while advancing on the division left flank. The two platoons, supported by Marine tanks, found their first indications when searching a Korean roadside hut. Although the natives denied having seen any Chinese soldiers, Corporal Paul G. Martin discovered about 50 hidden rice bowls waiting to be washed. Upon being confronted with this evidence, the terrified Koreans admitted that Chinese soldiers had reconnoitered the area just before dawn. Farther up the road, an ammunition dump of hidden mortar shells was discovered. The enemy had also put up several crude propaganda signs with such sentiments as, Your folks like see you home, and HALT! Forward means death. The patrol dismounted and proceeded with caution, guided by an OI overhead. Although the choppers were the favorite aircraft of VMO-6, the OIs also earned the gratitude of the troops on many an occasion such as this. The pilot gave the alarm just before hidden communists opened fire. Thus the marines of the patrol were enabled to take cover, and the tanks routed the enemy force with well-placed 90mm shells. The KMCs meant no resistance worth mentioning when they secured the town of Hoichan and the north bank of the Pukan, just west of the reservoir. Only light and scattered opposition awaited the 5th Marines, Colonel Richard M. Hayward, and the 7th Marines, Colonel Herman Nickerson, Jr., on their way to the occupation of assigned objectives on Line Quantico. CCF Breakthrough Exposes Marine Flank For weeks, the communist forces in Korea might have been compared to an antagonist backtracking to get set for taking aim with a shotgun. There could be no doubt, on the strength of daily G2 reports, about both barrels being loaded. And on the night of 22 April, the enemy pulled the trigger. The KMCs, after taking their objectives, reported a concentration of enemy small arms fire. At 1800, the command of the 1st Marine Division directed a renewal of the advance at 0700 on the morning of the 23rd. This order was canceled at 2224 by a message calling for all Marine units to consolidate and patrol in zone, pending further instructions. One of the reasons for the sudden change was the receipt of a message by the 1st Marine Division at 2120, informing that the 6th Rock Division was under heavy attack to the west of the Marines. Meanwhile, an on-the-spot questioning of a CCF prisoner just taken by the KMCs convinced the command and staff of the 1st Marine Division that the CCF 5th Phase Offensive was only hours away and gathering momentum. Thanks to this timely interpretation, all forward Marine units were alerted two hours before the main blow fell. It was on the left of the 1st Marine Division that the situation first became critical. 
The 6th Rock Division had never quite succeeded in closing up the gap on its right and restoring contact with the Marines. But this failure was trivial as compared to the collapse of the entire Rock Division an hour before midnight, leaving the gap wide enough for a major breakthrough. The 1st Marine Division took prompt measures to cope with the emergency. As early as 2130, the 1st Marines, in reserve just north of Chunchon, were alerted to move one battalion to contain a possible enemy threat to the division left flank. A second message an hour later called for immediate execution. And at midnight, the division provost marshal was directed to stop rock stragglers and place them under guard. The division reconnaissance company received orders to aid the military police. Colonel Francis M. McAllister, commanding the 1st Marines, selected Lt. Col. Robley E. West's 1st Battalion to carry out division orders. By midnight, we were all on trucks and rolling on the roads north, wrote 2nd Lt. Joseph M. Riesler in a letter home. Mile after mile, all the roads were covered with remnants of the rocks who had fled. Thousands of them were straggling along the roads in confusion. Despite these preparations for trouble on the left flank, the KMCs on the right and the 5th Marines in the center were first in the division to come under attack. During the last minutes of 22 April, the 2nd KMC Battalion had it hot and heavy on Hill 509. To the left of the 1st KMC Battalion, partially encircled, notified the 5th Marines of a penetration. The effects were felt immediately by 1-5, with its CP and Huichan. Hill 313 was the key to the town, being located at the Huichan end of a long ridge forming a natural avenue of approach from the northeast. Captain James T. Cronin's Baker Company of 1-5 had the responsibility for protecting the CP and shifting troops to the right flank if necessary. He sent 2nd Lieutenant Harvey W. Nolan's platoon to run a race with the enemy for the occupation of Hill 313. Attached in excess of T.O. for familiarization was 2nd Lieutenant Patrick T. McGann. About 220 yards from the summit, the slope was so steep that the Marines clawed their way upward on hands and knees. The company commander posted the attached light machine gun section while Nolan, McGann, and Sergeant William Piner organized the assault. The three squads of riflemen advanced a few yards, only to be pinned down by well-directed CCF machine gun fire. Another rush brought the Marines closer to the enemy, but a stalemate ensued in the darkness. Seven of the platoon were killed and 17 wounded. The situation in the 1-5 area was so serious that Fox Company of 2-5, Lt. Col. Glenn E. Martin, sent reinforcements. At dawn, however, Hill 313 proved to be abandoned by the enemy. A vigorous KMC counterstroke had swept the communists from Hill 509, so that the front was relatively quiet in this area. The courage and determination of the KMC regiment was praised by General Smith, who sent this message on the morning of the 23rd to Colonel Kim, the commanding officer. Congratulate you and your fine officers and men on dash and spirit in maintaining your positions against strong enemy attacks. We are proud of the Korean Marines. It is taking no credit away from the KMCs and 5th Marines to point out that they appear to have been hit by enemy holding attacks. The main CCF effort was directed at the left of the division line, held by the 7th Marines. The heaviest fighting took place in the sector of 1-7 on the extreme left, commanded by Major Webb D. Sawyer. It was obvious that the enemy planned to widen the penetration made at the expense of the 6th Rock Division. The 358th Regiment of the 120th Division, CCF 40th Army, hurled nearly 2,000 men at the Marine Battalion. Charlie Company, commanded by Captain Eugene H. Haffey, took the brunt of the assault. The thin battalion line bent under sheer weight of numbers, but it did not break. It held through three hours of furious fighting, with the support of Marine and Army artillery, until the 1st Battalion of the 1st Marines came up as reinforcements under the operational control of the 7th Marines. The newcomers took a position to the left of 1-7, 
so that the division flank was no longer completely in the air. This was one of the first examples of the corps and division maneuvering that played such a large part throughout in the blunting of the CCF offensive. Troops were not left to continue a desperate fight when a shift of units would ease the pressure. Marine air in support everywhere. At first light on the 23rd, the FIF Mosquitoes and fighter bombers went into action. The Marines had four two-plane flights of Corsairs airborne before sunup. VMF-323 responded to a call from Baker Company 1-5, only to find that the enemy had abandoned Hill 313. A low-flying OY of VMO-6, commanded by Major D.W. McFarlane, guided the Corsairs to the withdrawing Chinese, who were worked over thoroughly. VMF-214 planes, meanwhile, supported 1-7 in that battalion's desperate fight at the left of the line. A pilot's eye view showed fighting in progress from one coast to another, although the enemy was making his main effort in the 9 Corps sector. The U.S. 24th Infantry Division, to the left of the 6th Rock Division, was having to bend its right flank southward to defend against the CCF penetration. Toward the rear, the 27th Brigade of the British Commonwealth Division, in 9 Corps Reserve, was being alerted to meet the Communists head-on and bring the breakthrough to a halt. Elements of the U.S. 24th and 25th Divisions on the edge of the Iron Triangle were giving ground slowly. Seoul was obviously an objective of CCF units that had crossed the Imjin in the moonlight. But General Ridgway had decided that the city was not to be abandoned. Considerable importance was attached to the retention of Seoul, he explained at a later date, as it then had more value psychologically than its acquisition had conferred when we were still south of the Han. Near the junction of 10 Corps and 1 Rock Corps, the 7th Rock Division had been hard hit, although the enemy attack in this area was a secondary effort. Air support helped this unit to hold its own until it could be reinforced. Of the 205 Marine aircraft sorties on 23 April, 153 went to support the fighting front. The 1st Marine Division received 42 of these cast strikes, 24 went to the Rock 7th Division, 59 to 1 Corps to check the advance on Seoul, and 28 to pound the Communists crossing the Imjin. Only about 66% of the landing strip at K3, Pohong, could be used. The remainder was being repaired by the Seabees. In order to give the Panther jets more room, VMF-212 shifted its squadrons for two days to K-16 near Seoul. A detachment of VMF-323 planes from K-1, Pusan, also made the move. Since K-16 was only 30 miles from the combat area along the Imjin, the Corsairs were able to launch their attacks and return for rearming and refueling in an hour or less. Plugging the gap on the Marine left. At first light on 23 April, the entire left flank of the 1st Marine Division lay exposed to the Chinese who had poured into the gap left by the disintegration of the 6th Rock Division. Nine Corps orders called for the Rock to reassemble on the Kansas line, but most of them straggled from 10 to 14 miles behind the position they held prior to the CCF attack. The 1st Marine Division ordered Reconnaissance Company to stop Rock stragglers at the river crossing, and several groups were turned back. The reasons for the Rock collapse are variously given. Weak command and low morale have been blamed for the debacle, yet the shattered division did not lack for defenders. No less an authority than General Van Fleet declared himself reluctant to criticize the 6th Rock Division too severely. I do not believe they deliberately threw away their equipment. I am inclined to believe such equipment was abandoned due to the terrain, lack of roads, and weight. Our check at the time indicated that the Korean soldiers held on to their hand weapons. It is interesting to know that General Chang, who commanded 6th Rock Division at the time, is today, March 1958, Vice Chief of Staff of the Korean Army. As a first step towards setting up a defense in two directions, the 1st Marine Division received orders from 9 Corps to fall back to Line Pendleton. 
This was one of the 8th Army lines assigned to such profusion that they resembled cracks in a pane of glass. Pendleton ran generally southwest and northeast through the 7th Marine sector, then turned eastward just north of the town of Huichan. By occupying this line, the 7th Marines could bend its left to the south in order to refuse that flank. Still farther to the south, the 1st and 3rd Battalions of the 1st Marines were to take positions facing west. Thus the line of the 1st Marine Division would face west as much as north. On the center and right, the KMCs and 5th Marines would find it necessary to withdraw only about 1,000 yards to take up their new positions. It was up to 1-1 to make the first move toward plugging the gap. At 0130 on the 23rd, Captain John Coffey's Baker Company led the way. Moving north in the darkness along the Pukan and then west along a tributary, the long column of vehicles made its first stop about 1,000 yards from the assigned position. Here, the 92nd Armored Field Battalion, U.S. Army, was stationed in support of the 6th Rock Division and elements of the 1st Marine Division. The commanding officer, Lt. Col. Leon F. Lavoie, was an old acquaintance of 1-1, having supported that battalion during the final days of the Chosen Reservoir breakout. Lavoie was held in high esteem by the Marines, who found it characteristic of him in this fluid situation his cannoneers were formed into a tight defensive perimeter, ready to fight as infantry if need be. Another Army artillery unit, the 987th Armored Field Artillery Battalion, had been roughly used by the Chinese who routed the Rock Division. Losses in guns and equipment had resulted, and Coffee moved with his company about 1,500 yards to the west to assist in extricating from the mud all the 105s that could be saved. Resistance was encountered in the form of machine gun fire from Chinese who had set up a roadblock. Upon returning to 1-1, Coffee found it occupying what was in effect an outpost to the southwest of the 7th Marines. Baker Company was assigned to the left of Captain Robert P. Ray's Charlie Company, holding the curve of a horseshoe-shaped ridge, with Captain Thomas J. Bohannon's Able Company on the right. In support, along the comparatively level ground to the immediate rear, was Weapons Company, Major William L. Bates. With 1-1 facing in three directions to block a CCF attack, 1-7 managed to disengage and withdraw through 3-7, which occupied a position on Line Pendleton. VMO-6 helicopters and troops of 2-7 helped to evacuate the 1-7 casualties incurred during the night's hard fighting. During the early morning hours of the 23rd, the Marines of 3-1 had boarded trucks to the village of Todan-Ni on the west bank of the Pukan. Their assigned position was Hill 902, a 3,000-foot height dominating the surrounding terrain. The Chinese were also interested in this piece of real estate, since it overlooked the river crossing of the 1st Marine Division. Pressure to beat the Communists to the crest mounted as NCOs urged the men to their utmost efforts over steep uphill trails. The Marines won the race. Once in position, however, it was evident to Lt. Col. Banning that three ridgelines leading up to the hill mass would have to be defended. This necessity imposed a triangular formation, and he placed Captain Horace L. Johnson's George Company at the apex, with 1st Lieutenant William J. Allert's Howe Company on the left, and 1st Lieutenant William Swanson's Item Company on the right. The heavy machine guns of Major Edwin A. Simmons's Weapons Company were distributed among the rifle companies, and the 81mm mortars placed only 10 to 20 yards behind the front lines. The KMCs and 5th Marines completed their withdrawal without interference. Thus, the line of the 1st Marine Division on the afternoon of the 23rd might have been compared to a fishhook with the shank in the north and the barb curling around to the west and south. The three Marine battalions plugging the gap were not tied in physically. Major Maurice E. Roach's 3-7 was separated by an interval of 1,000 yards from 1-1, and the other two Marine battalions were 5,500 yards apart. But at least the 1st Marine Division had formed a new front under fire and awaited the night's attacks with confidence.
End of chapter 6, part 1. Chapter 6, Part 2 of U.S. Marine Operations in Korea, 1950-1953, Volume 4, The East Central Front, by Lynn Montross, Norman Hicks, and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The CCF Spring Offensive Repulse of Communist Attacks Bugle calls and green flares at about 20 hundred announced the presence of the Chinese to the west of 1-1 one one on Horseshoe Ridge. They came on in wave after wave, hundreds of them, wrote Lieutenant Riesler, whose platoon had an outpost in advance of Charlie Company. They were singing, humming, and chanting, Awake, Marine! In the first rush, they knocked out both our machine guns and wounded about ten men, putting a big hole in our lines. We held for about 15 minutes, under mortar fire, machine gun fire, and those grenades. Hundreds of grenades. There was nothing to do but withdraw to a better position, which I did. We pulled back about 50 yards and set up a new line. All this was in the pitch black night with Chinese cymbals crashing, horns blowing, and their god-awful yells. For four hours the attacks on Horseshoe Ridge were continuous particularly along the curve held by Ray's company. He was reinforced during the night by squads sent from Coffey's and Bohannon's companies. Ray realized that the integrity of the battalion position depended on holding the curve of the ridge, but his main problem was bringing up enough ammunition. Men evacuating casualties to the rear returned with supplies, but the amount was all too limited until Corporal Leo Marquez appointed himself a one-man committee. His energy equaled his courage as he carried grenades and small arms ammunition all night to the men on the firing line. Marquez emerged unhurt in spite of bullet holes through his cartridge belt, helmet, and a heel of his shoe. About midnight it was the turn of 3-1. These marines had dug in as best they could, but the position was too rocky to permit much excavation. Ammunition for the mortars had to be hand-carried from a point halfway up the hill. Several hours of harassing mortar fire preceded the CCF effort. George Company, at the apex of the ridge, was almost overwhelmed by the first communist waves of assault. The courage of individual Marines shone forth in the ensuing struggle. Technical Sergeant Harold E. Wilson, second in command of the center platoon, suffered four painful wounds but remained in the fight, encouraging his men and guiding reinforcements from Howe Company as they arrived. Steady artillery support was provided by Colonel McAllister, who rounded up a jury-rigged liaison party and three forward observer teams composed mainly of officers from the 987th AFA Battalion. They registered 11th Marines and 987th Battalion defensive fires, which had a large part in stopping the CCF attack as it lapped around George Company and hit Howe and Item on the other two ridges. Colonel McAllister and Colonel Nickerson paid a visit to the CP of 1-1 which remained under the operational control of the 7th Marines until morning. The two regimental commanders arranged for artillery and tank support to cover the gap between 1-1 and 3-7. The enemy, however, seemed to be wary about infiltrating between the three battalion outposts. This reluctance owed in large part to the deadly flat trajectory fire of the 90mm rifles of Companies A and B of the 1st Tank Battalion, whose commanding officer... Lieutenant Colonel Holly F. Evans, had relieved Lieutenant Colonel Harry T. Milne that day. Attacks on 3-1 and 3-7 also continued throughout the night. At daybreak, the close air support of Marine aircraft prevented further communist efforts, though dug-in enemy groups remained within machine gun range. Identification of Chinese bodies at daybreak indicated that the 359th and 360 regiments, 120th Division, 40th CCF Army had been employed. Withdraw to the Kansas Line Now came the problem for the three Marine battalions of letting loose of the Tiger's tail. Corps orders were received on the morning of 24 April for all units of the division to pull back to line Kansas. 
This was in accordance with General Ridgway's policy, continued by General Van Fleet, of attaching more importance to destruction of enemy personnel than the holding of military real estate. Some of the most seriously wounded men of 1-1 required immediate evacuation, in spite of the obvious risks. A VMO-6 helicopter piloted by First Lieutenant Robert E. Mathewson attempted a landing at the base of Horseshoe Ridge. As he hovered over the panel markings, CCF small arms fire mangled the tail rotor. The machine plunged to earth so badly damaged that it had to be destroyed. Mathewson emerged unhurt and waved off a helicopter flown by Captain H.G. McRae. Then the stranded pilot asked for a rifle and gave a good account of himself as an infantryman. While 1st Lieutenant Norman W. Hicks's 2nd platoon fought as the rear guard, 1st Lieutenant Neil B. Mills's 1st platoon of Charlie Company led the attack down the hill, carrying the wounded behind. In an attempt to rout the Chinese from a flanking hill, Mills was wounded in the neck by a bullet that severed an artery. Corpsman E.N. Smith gripped the end of the artery between his fingers until a hemostat could be applied, thus saving the lieutenant's life. Just before losing consciousness, Mills looked at his watch. It was 1000 and 1-1 had weathered the storm. The 3rd Battalion of the 7th Marines, which had beaten off probing attacks all night, coordinated its movements with those of the two Marine battalions as they slowly withdrew toward the Pukan. Despite marine air attacks, the communists not only followed but infiltrated in sufficient numbers to threaten the perimeter of Lavoie's cannoneers. The training this army officer had given his men in infantry tactics now paid off as the perimeter held firm while mowing down the attackers with point-blank 105mm shells at a range of a thousand yards. The marines of Captain Bohannon's company soon got into the fight, and the 92nd repaid the courtesy by supporting 1-1 and 3-7 during their withdrawal. Counted CCF dead numbered 179 at a cost to the 92nd of 4 KIA and 11 WIA casualties. As the morning haze lifted, the OYs of VMO-6 spotted for both Army and Marine artillery. Devastate Baker fed close support to the forward air controllers as fast as it could get planes from K-16 at Seoul only a 15-minute flight away. Not only 49 Corsairs, but also 40 of the Navy's ADs and Air Force F-51s and jets aided the Marine ground forces in their withdrawal to line Kansas. To speed the fighter bombers to their targets, some of the Marine pilots were designated Tactical Air Coordinators, Airborne, TACA. The familiarity with the terrain was an asset as they led incoming pilots to ground force units most in need of support. It was a confusing day in the air. The mutual radio frequencies to which planes and ground controllers were pre-tuned proved to be inadequate. The consequence was all too often the blocking out of key information at a frustrating moment. Haze and smoke made for limited vision. The planes needed a two-mile circle for their attacks, yet the battalions were at times less than 1,000 yards apart. Devastate Baker had to deal with this congested and dangerous situation as best it could. In addition to its strong support of Marine ground forces, the 1st Ma sent 10 sorties to the rocks in East Korea and 57 to 1 Corps in its battle along the Imjin. By this time, the Gloucestershire Battalion of the 29th British Brigade was isolated seven miles behind enemy lines and receiving all supplies by airdrop. The outlook grew so desperate that officers ordered their men to break up and make their way back to the UN lines if they could. Only 40 ever succeeded. In the former 6th Rock Division sector, units of the 27th Brigade of the British Commonwealth Division had done a magnificent job of stopping the breakthrough. The 2nd Battalion of the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry and the 3rd Battalion of the Royal Australian Regiment distinguished themselves in this fight, which won a distinguished unit citation for the division. Enemy stopped in 9 Corps sector. Spring had come at last to war-ravaged Korea, and the hills were a misty green in the sunshine. 
Looking down from an aircraft on the warm afternoon of 24 April 1951, the marine sector resembled a human anthill. Columns of weary men toiled and strained in every direction. Chaotic as the scene may have seemed, however, everything had a purpose. The 1st Marine Division was in full control of all troop movements, despite enemy pressure of the last two nights. The 5th Marines and KMCs had no opposition as they continued their withdrawal. Marine air reduced to a minimum the harassing efforts of the Chinese following the 1st Marines. As frontline units disengaged and fell back, the length of the main line of resistance was contracted enough for the 7th Marines to be assigned a reserve role. The 1st and 2nd Battalions were given the responsibility for the defense of Chunchan as well as the crossing sites over the Pukan and Soyang rivers. Major Roach had reached the outskirts of Chunchan when 3-7 was ordered back across the Chunchan to be attached to the 1st Marines on the left flank. Throughout the night of 24 to 25 April, the enemy probed the Marine lines, seeking in vain a weak spot where a penetration could be made. It was already evident that the breakthrough in this area had given the communists only a short-lived advantage. By the third night, they were definitely stopped. Only minor patrol actions resulted, except for two attacks and company strength on 2-1 at 0050 and 0150. Both were repulsed with total CCF losses of 25 counted dead. Contrary to the usual rule, the Marines saw more action during the daylight hours. A company-sized patrol from 1-1 became heavily engaged at 1350 and three Company A tanks moved up in support. The fight lasted until 1645 when the enemy broke off action and the tanks evacuated 18 wounded Marines. Early in the afternoon, a 3-1 patrol had advanced only 200 yards along a ridgeline when it was compelled to withdraw after running into concentrated mortar and machine gun fire. Sporadic mortar rounds continued until a direct hit was scored on the battalion CP, wounding Colonel McAllister, Lieutenant Colonel Banning, Major Reginald R. Myers, the executive officer, and Major Joseph D. Trompeter, the S-3. Banning and Myers were evacuated and Trompeter assumed command of 3-1. Losses of 18 KIA and 82 WIA for 24 to 25 April brought the casualties of the 1st Marines to nearly 300 during the past 48 hours. A simple ceremony was held at the 1st Marine Division CP on the afternoon of the 24th for the relief of General Smith by Major General Gerald C. Thomas. The new commanding general, a native of Missouri, was educated at Illinois Wesleyan University and enlisted in the Marine Corps in May 1917 at the age of 23. Awarded the Silver Star for bravery at Belle Wood and Saisons, he was commissioned just before the Musée Argonne Offensive in which he was wounded. During the next two decades, Thomas chased bandits in Haiti, guarded the U.S. mails, protected American interests in China, and served as naval observer in Egypt when Rommel knocked at the gates of Alexandria in 1941. As operations officer and later chief of staff of the 1st Marine Division, he participated in the Guadalcanal campaign in 1942. The next year he became chief of staff of 1st Marine Amphibious Corps in the Bougainville operation. Returning to Marine Headquarters in 1944 as Director of Plans and Policies, he was named Commanding General of the Marines in China three years later. General Smith had won an enduring place in the hearts of all Marines for his magnificent leadership as well as resourceful generalship during the Inchon Seoul and Chosen Reservoir campaigns. Speaking of the Marines of April 1951, he paid them this tribute in retrospect. The unit commanders and staff of the division deserve great credit for the manner in which they planned and conducted the operations which resulted in blunting the Chinese counteroffensive in our area. In my opinion, it was the most professional job performed by the division while it was under my command. The night of 25 to 26 April passed in comparative quiet for the Marines. A few CCF probing attacks and occasional mortar rounds were the extent of the enemy's activity. All Marine units had now reached the modified line Kansas, 
but General Van Fleet desired further withdrawals because the enemy had cut a lateral road. Nine Corps also directed that the 1st Marine Division be prepared on the 26th to move back to Chunchon, where it would defend along the south bank of the Soyang until service units could move out their large supply dumps. The division was to tie in on the right with the lower extension of the Huichan Reservoir, and contact was made in that quarter with the French Battalion of the 2nd Infantry Division, 10 Corps. On the Marine left flank, the 5th Cavalry of the 1st Cavalry Division had relieved elements of the British Commonwealth Division. Marine regimental officers met with Colonel Bowser, G3, to plan the continued withdrawal. It was decided that four infantry battalions, 1-1, 2-1, 3-5, and 3-7, were to take positions on the west bank of the Pukan to protect the Mojin Bridge and ferry sites while the other units crossed. The execution of the plan went smoothly, without enemy interference. After all other Marine troops were on the east side, 3-7 disengaged last of all and forded the chest-deep stream as a prelude to hiking to Chunchon. The enemy was kept at a discreet distance throughout the night by continuous artillery fire supplemented by ripples from Captain Eugene A. Bush's Battery C 1st 4.5-inch rocket battalion. An acute shortage of trucks made it necessary for most of the troops to hike. Then came the task of organizing the new division defenses on a line running northeast and southwest through the northern outskirts of Chunchan. Planning continued meanwhile for further withdrawals to positions astride the Hongchan Chunchan MSR. It was apparent by this time that the enemy had been badly mauled on the Nine Corps front. The Communists were now making a supreme effort to smash through the One Corps area and capture Seoul. It was believed that they had set themselves the goal of taking the city by May Day, the worldwide Communist holiday. In this aspiration, they were destined to be disappointed. They tried to work around the 8th Army's left flank by crossing the River Han to Kimpo Peninsula, but airstrikes and the threat of naval gunfire frustrated them. Another flanking attempt 35 miles to the southeast met repulse, and before the end of the month it was evident that the Chinese Reds would not celebrate May Day in Seoul. Generally speaking, the 8th Army had kept its major units intact and inflicted frightful losses on the enemy while trading shell-pocked ground for Chinese lives. The night of 27 to 28 April saw little activity on the Nine Corps front, adding to the evidence that the enemy had shot his bolt. The next day, the 1st Marine Division, along with other 8th Army forces, continued the withdrawal to the general defensive line designated No-Name Line. Further withdrawals were not contemplated, asserted the 9 Corps commander, who sent this message to General Thomas. It is the intention of CG 8th Army to hold firmly on general defense lines as outlined in my Operation Plan 17 and my message 9639, and from this line to inflict maximum personnel casualties by an active defense utilizing artillery and sharp armored counterattacks. Withdrawal south of this line will be initiated only on personal direction of Corps Commander. FIF placed the emphasis on armed reconnaissance or interdiction flights for Marine aircraft during the last few days of April. First MAW pilots reported the killing or wounding of 312 enemy troops on the 29th and 30th, and the destruction of 212 trucks, 6 locomotives, and 80 boxcars. On the other side of the ledger, the wing lost a plane a day during the first eight days of the CCF offensive. Of the flyer shot down, five were killed, one was wounded seriously but rescued by helicopter, and two returned safely from enemy-held territory. The shortage of vehicles slowed the withdrawal of Marine ground forces, but by the 30th, the 5th Marines, KMC Regiment, and 7th Marines were deployed from left to right on no-name line. The 1st Marines went into reserve near Hongchan. On the division left was the reorganized 6th Rock Division, and on the right the 2nd Infantry Division of 10 Corps. Nobody was in a better position to evaluate Marine maneuvers of the past week than Colonel Bowser, the G3, and he had the highest praise. Whereas the chosen withdrawal was more spectacular than the April retrograde, he commented seven years later, 
The latter was executed so smoothly and efficiently that a complex and difficult operation was made to look easy. The entire division executed everything asked of it with the calm assurance of veterans. 1st Marine Division returns to 10 Corps. UN estimates of enemy casualties ranged from 70,000 to 100,000. The fifth phase offensive was an unmitigated defeat for the communists so far, but USAC G2 officers warned that this was only the first round. Seventeen fresh CCF divisions were available for the second. General Van Fleet called a conference of Corps commanders on 30 April to discuss defensive plans. In the reshuffling of units, the 1st Marine Division was placed for the third time in eight months under the operational control of 10 Corps, commanded by Lt. Gen. Edward M. Almond. The Marines were to occupy the western sector of 10 Corps after its boundary with 9 Corps had been shifted about 12 miles to the west. Van Fleet put into effect a reshuffling of units all the way across the peninsula in preparation for the expected renewal of the CCF offensive. Thus on 1 May the UN line was as follows from left to right. U.S. 1 Corps, 1 Rock Division, 1st Cavalry Division, and 25th Infantry Division in line, the 3rd Infantry Division and British 29th Brigade in reserve. U.S. 9 Corps, British 27th Brigade, 24th Infantry Division, 5th and 6th Rock Divisions, and 7th Infantry Division in line, the 187th Airborne RCT in reserve, U.S. 10 Corps, 1st Marine Division, 2nd Infantry Division, 5th and 7th Rock Divisions, Rock 3 Corps, 9th and 3rd Divisions, Rock 1 Corps, Capital Division, and Rock 11th Division. I don't want to lose a company, Certainly not a battalion, Van Fleet told the Corps commanders. Keep units intact. Small units must be kept within supporting distance. Give every consideration to the use of armor and infantry teams for a limited objective counterthrust. For greater distances, have ready and use when appropriate regiments of infantry protected by artillery and tanks. From the foxhole to the command post, a confident new offensive spirit animated an 8th Army which only four months previously had been recuperating from two major reverses within two months. The 8th Army, in short, had been welded by fire into one of the finest military instruments of American military history, and the foreign units attached to it proved on the battlefield that they were picked troops. With the Weichan Dam now in enemy hands, the Communists had the capability of closing the gates, thus lowering the water level in the Pukhan and Han rivers to fording depth. As a countermeasure, USAC asked the Navy to blast the dam. It was a difficult assignment, but Douglas A.D. Sky Raiders from the Princeton successfully torpedoed the floodgates on 1 May. An atmosphere of watchful waiting prevailed during the next two weeks as the Marines on No Name Line improved their defensive positions and patrolled to maintain contact with the enemy. 8th Army evolved at this time the patrol base concept to deal with an enemy retiring beyond artillery range. These bases were part of a screen called the Outpost Line of Resistance, OPLR, established in front of the MLR. Their mission was to maintain contact with the enemy by means of patrols, give warning of an impending attack, and delay its progress as much as possible. When it came to artillery ammunition, the 11th Marines found that it had progressed from a famine to a feast. Where shells had recently been rationed because of transport difficulties, the 8th Army now directed the cannoneers along No Name Line to expend a unit of fire a day. The 11th Marines protested, since the infantry was seldom in contact with the enemy. One artillery battalion submitted a tongue-in-cheek report to the effect that the required amount of ammunition had been fired in target areas cleared of friendly patrols. The requirement was kept in force, however, until the demands of the renewed CCF offensive resulted in another ammunition shortage for the 11th Marines. Marine tanks were directed by division to use their 90mm rifles to supplement 11th Marine howitzers in carrying out core fire plans. 
The tankers protested that their tubes had nearly reached the end of a normal life expectancy with no replacements in sight. This plaint did not fall upon deaf ears at Corps headquarters and two Army units, the 96th AFA Battalion and 17th FA Battalion, were assigned to fire the deep missions. Eighth Army staff officers concluded that the enemy would launch his next effort in the center. Intelligence, according to General Van Fleet, had noted for some two weeks prior to the May attack that the Chinese communists were shifting their units to the east. Nevertheless, the blow fell much farther east than was expected. Although the east offered the best prospects of surprise, a rugged terrain of few roads imposed grave logistical handicaps on the enemy. Moreover, UN warships dominated the entire eastern littoral. Despite these disadvantages, an estimated 125,000 Chinese attacked on the morning of 16 May 1951 in the area of the Three and One Rock Corps between the U.S. 2nd Infantry Division and the coast. Six CCF divisions spearheaded an advance on a 20-mile front that broke through the lines of the 5th and 7th Rock Divisions. Pouring into this gap, the Communists made a maximum penetration of 30 miles that endangered the right flank of the U.S. 2nd Infantry Division. General Van Fleet took immediate steps to stabilize the front. In one of the war's most remarkable maneuvers, he sent units of the 3rd Infantry Division, then in reserve southeast of Seoul, on a 70-mile all-night ride in trucks to the threatened area. The 1st Marine Division was not directly in the path of the enemy advance. During the early morning hours of 17 May, however, an enemy column made a thrust that apparently was intended as an end-run attack on the left flank of the 2nd Infantry Division. Avoiding initially the Chunchan Hongchan Highway, Chinese in estimated regimental strength slipped behind the patrol base set up by a KMC company just west of the MSR. For several days, Colonel Nickerson and his executive officer, Lieutenant Colonel Raymond G. Davis, had been apprehensive over the security of this road on which the 7th Marines depended for logistical support. On the afternoon of the 17th, they pulled back Lieutenant Colonel Bernard T. Kelly's 37, Less Company G, to establish a blocking position, generally rectangular in shape, at the vital Moray Koge Pass on the Chunchan Road. This move was not completed until sunset and George Company did not rejoin the battalion until midnight, so that the enemy probably had no intelligence of this new position. The main road ran along a shelf on one shoulder of the pass, but the Chinese avoided it and came by a trail from the northwest. The surprise was mutual. A platoon of D tanks, a weapons company platoon, and an item company platoon, defending the northern end of the perimeter, opened up with everything they had. A desperate firefight ensued as the enemy replied with a variety of weapons, mortars, recoilless rifles, satchel charges, grenades, and machine guns. Two CCF soldiers were killed after disabling a marine tank by a grenade explosion in the engine compartment. A satchel charge knocked out another tank, and the enemy made an unsuccessful attempt to kill a third by rolling up a drum of gasoline and igniting it. Captain Victor Stoyanow's item company, at the critical point of this thinly stretched 3-7 perimeter, was hard-pressed. The enemy made a slight penetration into one platoon position, but was repulsed by a counterattack that Stoyanow led. Marine infantry and tanks were well supported by artillery that sealed off the Chinese column from the rear. The action ended at daybreak with the routed enemy seeking only escape as marine artillery and mortars continued to find lucrative targets. Air did not come on station until about 10.30, when it added to the slaughter. Scattered enemy groups finally found a refuge in the hills, leaving behind 82 prisoners and 112 counted dead. Captures of enemy equipment included mortars, recoilless rifles, and Russian 76mm guns and machine guns. Friendly losses were 7 KIA and 19 WIA. First MAW squadrons were kept busy furnishing close air support to the 2nd Infantry Division and the two ROC divisions hit by the enemy's May offensive. Because of the patrolling in the Marine sector, 
The OYs of VMO-6 took over much of the task of controlling airstrikes. They flew cover for the infantry tank patrols and in the distant areas controlled almost as many airstrikes as they did artillery missions. From the 1st to the 23rd of May, VMO-6 observers controlled 54 airstrikes involving 189 UN planes, 159 Navy and Marine F-4Us, F-9Fs, and ADs, and 30 Air Force F-80s, F-84s, and F-51s. About 40% of the aircraft controlled by the OYs were non-Marine planes. On the 18th, the 1st Marine Division, carrying out 10 Corps orders, began a maneuver designed to aid the U.S. 2nd Infantry Division on the east by narrowing its front. The 7th Marines pulled back to No Name Line to relieve the 1st Marines, which side-slipped to the east to take over an area held by the 9th Infantry. The 5th Marines then swung around from the division left flank to the extreme right and relieved another Army regiment, the 38th Infantry. This permitted the 2nd Infantry Division to face east and repulse attacks from that direction. By noon on 19 May, the enemy's renewed 5th Phase Offensive had lost most of its momentum as CCF supplies dwindled to a trickle along a tenuous line of communications. That same day, when Colonel Wilbert S. Brown took over the command of the 1st Marines from Colonel McAllister, all four Marine regiments were in line, from left to right, the KMCs, the 7th Marines, the 1st Marines, and the 5th Marines. A new no-name line ran more in a east-west direction than the old one with its northeast to southwest slant. Thus, in the east of the Marine sector, the line was moved back some 4,000 yards while remaining virtually unchanged in the west. Enough enemy pressure was still being felt by the 2nd Infantry Division so that General Van Fleet ordered a limited offensive by 9 Corps to divert some of the CCF's strength. While the rest of the 1st Marine Division stood fast, the KMC Regiment advanced with 9 Corps elements. At the other end of the line, the Marines had the second of their two fights during the CCF offensive. Major Morris L. Holliday's 3-5 became engaged at 0445 on the 20th with elements of the 44th CCF Division. Chinese and regimental strength were apparently on the way to occupy the positions of the Marine Battalion, unaware of its presence. This mistake cost them dearly when 3-5 opened up with every weapon at its disposal while requesting the support of Marine air, rockets, and artillery. The slaughter lasted until 0930 when the last of the routed Chinese escaped into the hills. Fifteen were taken prisoner and 152 dead were counted in front of the Marine positions. From 20 May onward, it grew more apparent every hour that the second installment of the CCF Fifth Phase Offensive had failed even more conclusively than the first. The enemy had only a narrow penetration on a secondary front to show for ruinous casualties. Worse yet, from the Chinese viewpoint, the UN forces were in a position to retaliate before the attackers recovered their tactical balance. The 8th Army had come through with relatively light losses, and it was now about to seize the initiative. End of Chapter 6, Part 2 Chapter 7, Part 1 of U.S. Marine Operations in Korea, 1950-1953, Volume 4, The East Central Front, by Lynn Montross, Norman Hicks, and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Advance to the Punch Bowl Only from the air could the effects of the UN counterstroke of May and June 1951 be fully appreciated. It was more than a CCF withdrawal. It was a flight of beaten troops under very little control in some instances. They were scourged with bullets, rockets, and napalm as planes swooped down upon them like hawks scattering chickens. And where it had been rare for a single Chinese soldier to surrender voluntarily, remnants of platoons, companies, and even battalions were now giving up after throwing down their arms. There had been nothing like it before, and its like would never be seen in Korea again. The enemy was on the run. 
General Van Fleet, after his retirement, summed up the double-barreled Chinese Spring Offensive and the UN Counterstroke in these words. We met the attack and routed the enemy. We had him beaten and could have destroyed his armies. Those days are the ones most vivid in my memory. Great days when all the 8th Army, and we thought America too, were inspired to win. In those days in Korea, we reached the heights. Communist casualties from 15 to 31 May were estimated by the 8th Army at 105,000. This figure included 17,000 counted dead and the unprecedented total of some 10,000 prisoners, most of them Chinese Reds taken during the last week of the month in frantic efforts to escape. Such results were a vast departure from past occasions when Mao Zedong's troops had preferred death to surrender. In all probability, only the mountainous terrain saved them from a complete debacle. If the 8th Army had been able to use its armor for a mechanized pursuit, it might have struck blows from which the enemy could not recover. As it was, the communists escaped disaster by virtue of the fact that a platoon could often stand off a company or even a battalion by digging in and defending high ground commanding the only approach. Every hill was a potential Thermopylae in the craggy land of few roads. It was the misfortune of the 1st Marine Division to have perhaps the least lucrative zone of action in all of Korea for the peninsula-wide turkey shoot. A chaos of jagged peaks and dark, narrow valleys, the terrain alone was enough to limit an advance. Even so, the Marines inflicted 1,870 counted KIA casualties on the Communists in May and captured 593, most of them during the last eight days of the month. General Allman congratulated the division for its accomplishment of a most arduous battle task. You have denied the enemy the opportunity of regrouping his forces and forced him into a hasty retreat. The destruction of enemy forces and material has been tremendous and many times greater than our own losses. Plan to cut off communists. The 187th Airborne Regimental Combat Team, released from 9 Corps Reserve, arrived in the Hongchon area on 21 May and took a position between the 1st Marine Division on the left and the 2nd Infantry Division on the right. Two days later, 10 Corps gave the Marines the mission of securing the important road center at Yonggu at the eastern end of Huichan Reservoir. Elements of the 2nd Infantry Division, with the 187th Airborne RCT attached, were meanwhile to drive northeast to Inge after establishing a bridgehead across the river Soyan. From Inge, the 187th, reinforced, would continue to advance northeast toward its final objective, Kansong on the coast. After linking up with One Rock Corps, the Army Regiment might be able to pull the drawstring on a tremendous bag of prisoners, all the CCF forces south of the Inge-Kansong Road. There was, however, a big if in the equation. The communists were falling back with all haste, and it was a question whether the bag could be closed in time. The 1st Marine Division jumped off at 0800 on 23 May with the 1st and 5th Marines abreast, the 1st on the left. Both regiments advanced more than 5,000 yards against negligible opposition. During the course of this attack, the 1st Marines experimented by calling an airstrike in the hope of detonating an entire minefield. The results were disappointing. Live mines were blown to new locations, thus changing the pattern, but few exploded. The 7th Marines was relieved on the 23rd by elements of the 7th Infantry Division, 9 Corps, and moved to the east for employment on the Marine right flank. The KMC Regiment, relieved by other 9 Corps units, went into Division Reserve. The 1st Marines, advancing on the left, reached its objective about two-thirds of the way to Soyang by noon on the 26th. The Regiment reverted to Division Reserve upon relief by the KMCs. In the right half of the Division Zone, resistance gradually stiffened. On the 24th, the 2nd and 3rd Battalions of the 5th Marines ran into trouble as they started their advance toward their initial objective, three hills about 7,000 yards north of Hangye. Both battalions were slowed by heavy enemy mortar and machine gun fire. 
They requested immediate artillery and air support. Captain John A. Pearson, commanding item company, could observe the enemy on Hill 1051, holding up the attack with flanking fire. He directed air and artillery on the crest and on the communists dug in along the southeastern slopes. Soon the enemy troops were seen retiring northward. This eased the pressure on the center, and Captain Samuel S. Smith's dog company managed to work forward and gain the summit of Hill 883 by 1300. Tanks moved up in support, and at midnight, Colonel Hayward reported his portion of the division objective secured. The 7th Marines, moving forward in the right rear of the 5th, veered to the left and drove into the center of the division zone, reaching the southern bank of the Soyoung by nightfall on the 26th. That same day, 2-7 overran an enemy ammunition dump and took 27 CCF prisoners, some of them wounded men who had been left behind. The captured material included the following items, 100,000 rounds of small arms ammunition, 12,000 rounds of mortar ammunition, 1,000 rounds of artillery ammunition, 6,000 rounds of explosive charges, 9,000 hand grenades. Five U.S. trucks and jeeps were released to higher headquarters. Two CCF trucks, two mules, and a horse were integrated into the battalion transportation system and profitably employed thereafter. The 187th Airborne RCT reported on the 24th that its advance was being held up by increasing enemy resistance. It was already evident that the CCF flight had frustrated the plan of cutting off decisively large numbers of the 10 Corps zone. Air observation established, however, that hundreds of Chinese Reds had merely escaped from the frying pan into the fire. By fleeing westward along the south shore of the Huichan Reservoir, they stumbled into the 9 Corps zone. There, the remnants of whole units surrendered, in some instances without striking a blow. Along the route, they were pitilessly attacked by U.N. aircraft. First Ma units had never before known such good hunting as during the last week in May 1951. Despite the murky instrument weather of 27 May, the all-weather fighters of VMFN 513 reported the killing of an estimated 425 CCF soldiers. Two F-7F pilots killed or wounded some 200 Chinese Reds in the One Corps zone. On the following day, the first Ma claimed a total of 454 KIA casualties inflicted on the enemy. Estimates of enemy dead by pilots are likely to be over-optimistic, but there can be no doubt that UN aircraft slaughtered the fleeing communists in large numbers. Only poor flying weather saved the enemy from far worse casualties. So intent were the Chinese on escape that they violated their usual rule of making troop movements only by night. When the fog and mist cleared briefly, Marine pilots had glimpses of CCF units crowding the roads without any attempt at concealment. Napalm, bombs, and machine guns left heaps of dead and wounded as the survivors continued their flight, hoping for a return of fog and mist to protect them. Initial Marine Objectives Secured As the Marine ground forces advanced, they found fewer and fewer Chinese Reds opposing them. The explanation was given by a prisoner from the 12th Division, 5th Corps, of the North Korean People's Army, NKPA. His unit had the mission, he said, of relieving troops in the Yanggu Inge area and conducting delaying actions. The purpose was to allow CCF units to escape a complete disaster and dig in farther north. The North Koreans, in short, were being sacrificed in rearguard delaying actions in order that the Chinese Reds might save their own skins. U.S. interrogators asked NKPA prisoners why they put up with such treatment. The answer was that they couldn't help themselves. The Chinese had impressed them into service, armed them, and trained them after the NKPA collapse in the fall of 1950. They were under the thumb of political commissars holding life and death authority over them. Any NKPA soldier suspected of trying to shirk his duty or escape was certain to be shot like a dog. At least the man on the firing line had a chance to come out alive. The man who defied the system had none. 
This attitude accounts to a large extent for the many occasions when NKPA troops literally resisted to the last man in delaying actions. Marines in general, judging by their comments, considered the Chinese Red the better all-around soldier, but they credited the Korean Red with more tenacity on the defensive. Because of the stubborn NKPA opposition in East Korea, the 8th Army Staff in Command gave some thought to the possibility of an amphibious operation in the enemy's rear by the 1st Marine Division. Plans were discussed on 28 May for a landing at Tongchon. The Marines were to drive southward along the tongchon Kumwa Road to link up with the 9 Corps units attacking toward the northeast along the same route. After meeting, the two forces would systematically destroy the pocketed enemy units. It was decided that 6 June would be D-Day. And then, to the great disappointment of Generals Thomas and Allman, the plan was suddenly canceled by USAC on 29 May after a single day's consideration. Another scheme for cutting off large enemy forces was abandoned on 28 May when the 187th Airborne got as far as Inge. Most of the CCF units having escaped, this regiment was given a new mission of securing the high ground to the north of Inge. During the last five days of May, the 5th and 7th Marines continued to advance steadily. On the morning of the 31st, the 7th faced the task of breaking through a stubbornly contested pass leading into Yangu. With the battalion on each ridge leading into the pass, Colonel Nickerson found it a slow yet precarious prelude to get the men down. Adding to their trials were some 500 enemy, 76 mm and mortar shells received by the regiment. General Van Fleet, an onlooker while visiting the 7th Marines OP, shook his head wonderingly. How did you ever get the men up those cliffs? he asked Colonel Nickerson. The answer was short and simple. General, said the regimental commander, they climbed. As the day wore on, Nickerson called for what his executive officer, Lieutenant Colonel Davis, described as a through-the-middle play, a company of tanks, Company C, 1st Tank Battalion, commanded by Captain Richard M. Taylor, was launched up the road with infantry on foot hugging the protective cover of the steep road embankments. As the tanks drew fire, the infantry could spot the source and quickly clean the enemy out. This rapid thrust caused the enemy defenders to flee as fire was poured into them from our center force as well as the flank attackers. By nightfall on the 31st, the 7th Marines had control of Yangu, its airfield and the hills surrounding the burnout town. The 5th Marines had reached a point 6,000 yards northeast of Yangu astride the north-south ridgeline between that road center and Inge. Losses for the 1st Marine Division in May added up to 75 KIA, 8 DOW, and 731 WIA. The ratio of wounded to killed, it may be noted, is more than 9 to 1. This proportion, so much more favorable than the usual ratio, rose to an even more astonishing 15 to 1 in June. Various explanations have been offered, one of them being the spirit of cool professionalism of Marines who had learned how to take cover and not expose themselves to needless risks. But this doesn't account for the unusual ratio, and it may perhaps be concluded that the Marines were simply lucky in this operation. The comparatively low death rate has also been credited in part to the alertness with which Marine officers adapted to changing situations. War is a grim business on the whole, but Colonel Wilbert S. Brown took an amusing advantage of enemy propaganda accusing Americans of all manner of crimes against humanity. At the outset, he had requested colored smoke shells for signaling. But upon learning from POW interrogation that NKPA soldiers were terrified by what they believed to be frightful new gases, the commanding officer of the 1st Marines had an added reason for using green, red, and yellow smoke. Unfortunately, Lt. Col. Merritt Adelman, commanding officer of the 2nd Battalion, 11th Marines, soon had to inform him that the inadequate supply was exhausted. It was never renewed during Brown's command. Major David W. McFarland, commanding officer of VMO-6, also exploited enemy ignorance. 
His original purpose in initiating night aerial observation by OI planes was to improve artillery accuracy. Soon he noticed that the mere presence of an OI overhead would silence enemy artillery. The aerial observer, McFarlane explained, was often unable to determine the location of enemy artillery even though he could see it firing, because he would be unable to locate map coordinates in the dark, that is, relating them to the ground. Fortunately, this fact was unknown to the enemy. From their observation of the OYs in the daytime, they had found that the safest thing to do whenever an OY was overhead was to take cover. This they continued to do at night. VMO-6 also put into effect an improvement of 1st Marine Division Aerial Photographic Service at a time when the 1st MA photo section had missions all over the Korean front. Lieutenant Colonel Donald S. Bush, commanding officer of the section, is credited with the innovation of mounting a K-17 camera on an OY. Only a 6-inch focal length lens could be installed on one of these small planes. This meant that in order to get the same picture as a jet, the OI must fly at half the altitude. The pilot would be in more danger, but haze problems were reduced. The experiment was an immediate success. The division set up a photo laboratory near the VMO-6 CP for rapid processing and printing. A helicopter stood by for rapid delivery to the units concerned. Not all the variations in tactics were innovations. Lieutenant Colonel Bernard T. Kelly, commanding officer of 3-7, revived an old device on 31 May by using indirect automatic weapons fire with good effect. Four water-cooled heavy machine guns provided long-range, 2,600 yards, plunging fires on the reverse slopes of hills in support of his leading elements during the final attack on Yanggu. MAG-12 moves to K-46 at Hoinsong. Delay and uncertainty were still the two great stumbling blocks to adequate air support for the ground forces under the jock control system. Marine officers contended that infantry units sometimes took unnecessary casualties as a consequence. Worse yet, there were occasions when the expected planes did not arrive at all. Statistics kept by the 1st MA and Navy during the spring of 1951 upheld these conclusions. During the Incheon Seoul operation, the average delay in receiving air support had been 15 minutes as compared to 80 minutes in May and June of 1951. Approximately 35 minutes of this time was required to process the request through JOC, and only 65 to 70 percent of the sorties requested were ever received by Marine ground forces. General Shepard and Harris had discussed the problem during the early spring of 1951 with General Partridge of the 5th Air Force. Several compromises were reached, and for brief periods the 1st Marine Division received more air support than it could use. Unfortunately, these periods were at times of the least need. When the chips were down, the old delays and uncertainties reappeared. General Partridge commented, The 1st Marine Air Wing was assigned for operational control by the 5th Air Force, and it was used just as any of the other units of the 5th were employed, that is, in support anywhere along the battlefront where it appeared to be most urgently needed. And every action such as took place in Korea when the resources, and especially the air resources, are far too few, ground commanders inevitably feel that they are being shortchanged. They are trying to accomplish their objectives under the most difficult circumstances and with the minimal number of casualties, and they want all the assistance from the air that they can get. I am sure I would feel the same in similar circumstances. However, there was never enough air support to satisfy everyone, and I was most unhappy that this was the case. From time to time, I was called upon to denude one section of the front of its close air support in order to bolster some other area where the situation was critical. Sometimes this worked to the advantage of the Marines, as in the case of operations near the Chosen Reservoir in December 1950, and at other times it worked to their disadvantage. In retrospect, however, I would estimate that, day in and day out, the Marine ground units had more air support than any other division which was engaged. With all due respect to General Partridge, Marine officers felt that the discussion should not be limited merely to the amount of air support. 
It was not so much the amount as the delay and unreliability under jock control that constituted the problem as the Marines saw it. On 24 May, while on one of his periodic tours of the Far East, General Shepard brought up the matter of Cass with General Ridgway. He agreed with the UN Commander-in-Chief that it would be improper for a Marine division to expect the exclusive support of a Marine air wing in Korea. The main difficulty, he reiterated, lay in the slowness and uncertainty of getting air support when needed. At this time, an extensive reshuffling of Air Force commanders was in progress. On 21 May, General Partridge relieved Lieutenant General George E. Stratemeyer, C.G. Fief, who had suffered a heart attack. Partridge, in turn, was relieved by Major General Edward J. Timberlake, who assumed temporary command of 5th Air Force until Major General Frank E. Everest arrived to take over a few days later. The 1st Ma was also undergoing changes in command. General Harris was relieved on 29 May by his deputy commander, Major General Thomas J. Cushman. Brigadier General William O. Bryce, just arrived from the States, became the wing's new deputy commander. After several get-acquainted discussions, the new Air Force and First Maw Generals agreed on a plan to cut down delays in air support. It was a simple solution. The aircraft were merely to be brought near to the Marine ground forces. This was to be managed by moving the MAG-12 forward echelon from K-16 at Seoul to K-46 at Hoingsong. The new field, if such it could be called, was nothing more than a stony dirt strip, but it was only 40 miles, or a 10 to 15 minute flight, from the firing line. The first missions from the new field were flown on 27 May. VMFs 214 and 323 kept an average of 12 Corsairs at K-46 thereafter, rotating them from K-1. On the surface, this seemed to be a practical solution, especially after a four-plane alert was established at K-46 for use by the 1st Marine Division when needed. Devastate Baker was permitted to put in an alerting call directly to the field. The rub was that the jock must be called in order to make the original request. Before the planes could take off, the MAG-12 operations officer at the field was likewise required to call jock and confirm the fact that the mission had been approved. Communications were poor at first for the 40 miles between the field and the front. Devastate Baker got better results by calling First Maw headquarters at K-1, 140 miles south, and having the wing call K-46 and jock. This meant delays such as General Thomas described in a letter to General Almond. On 29 May, he said, the 5th and 7th Marines were up against severe enemy fire in their attack. The TACPS had enemy targets under observation and were ready to control any aircraft they could get. The Marines requested 92 sorties and received 55. Of these, 20 were flown by Corsairs or Panther jets and 35 by Air Force jets and Mustangs. And though 55 sorties were considerably less than optimum air support, practically all arrived from 2 to 4 hours late. On the firing line, the enemy's resistance, concluded General Thomas, was broken not by air power but by Marine riflemen. On other days, the new plan made a more encouraging showing. There was, for instance, the occasion when the OYs discovered an enemy regiment near the 1st Marine Division right flank. Devastate Baker called the 1st Maw direct on 31 May for 16 fighters as soon as possible. Wing called Jock for approval to launch the flight and put in a call to K-46 to alert the planes. In just 48 minutes after the initial call from Devastate Baker, 16 pilots had jumped into their flight gear at K-46, had been briefed, and were airborne on what proved to be a timely strike with excellent results. A new tactic of night air support was introduced in May when Marine R-4D transports were outfitted to operate as flare planes. Not only did these unarmed aircraft light up targets along the front lines for the VMFN-513 night fighters, they were also on call for use by the 1st Marine Division. Later, on 12 June, the Navy provided the 1st Ma with PB-4Y-2 privateers for the nightly illumination missions. Fight of the 5th Marines for Hill 610
During the heyday of the battleship, every midshipman dreamed of some glorious future day when he would be on the bridge, directing the naval maneuver known as crossing the T. In other words, his ships would be in line of battle, firing converging broadsides on an enemy approaching in column. Obviously, the enemy would be at a disadvantage until he executed a 90-degree turn under fire to bring his battered ships into line to deliver broadsides of their own. It was a mountain warfare variation of crossing the T that the Korean Reds were using against the Marines. Whenever possible, the enemy made a stand on a hill flanked by transverse ridgelines. He emplaced hidden machine guns or mortars on these ridgelines to pour a converging fire into attackers limited by the terrain to a single approach. It meant that the Marines had to advance through this crossfire before they could get in a position for the final assault on the enemy's main position. There were two tactical antidotes. One was well-directed close air support. The other was the support of tanks advancing parallel to enemy-held ridgelines and scorching them with the direct fire of 90mm rifles and 50 caliber machine guns. On 1 June, the two regiments in assault, the 5th and 7th Marines, found the resistance growing stiffer as they slugged their way forward toward line Kansas. Within an hour after jumping off, 2-5 was heavily engaged with an estimated 200 enemy defending Hill 651 tenaciously. At noon, after ground assaults had failed, a request was put in for air support. Four VMF-214 planes led by Captain William T. Copus bombed and strafed the target. This attack broke the back of NKPA opposition, and 2-5 moved in to seize the objective. Early on the morning of the 2nd, Lt. Col. Hopkins' 1-5 moved out to secure the southwest end of the Long Ridge Line that stretched northeast from Yangu and afforded a natural avenue of approach to Tam San and the Kansas Line on the southern rim of the Punch Bowl. The Marine advance got underway at 0915. After two four-plane strikes by VMF-214 and a preparation by 111 and the first rocket battery, the battalion attacked across a valley with Baker Company, 1st Lieutenant William E. Kerrigan, on the right, and Charlie Company, 1st Lieutenant Robert E. Warner, on the left to seize the terminal point on the ridge leading to Hill 610. Abel Company, Captain John L. Kelly, followed Charlie as Company C, Captain Richard M. Taylor of the 1st Tank Battalion moved into supporting position. Converging fire from transverse ridges had the Marine riflemen pinned down until the tankers moved along the valley road running parallel. Direct 90mm fire into NKPA log bunkers enabled C-15 to advance to the forward slopes of Hill 610. The enemy fought back with machine guns and grenades while directing long-range rifle fire against 2-5 attacking along a parallel ridge across the valley. By 1945, the last bunker on Hill 610 had been overrun. Meanwhile, 2-5 had pushed ahead some 5,000 yards to the northeast. The capture of Hill 610 will never have its glorious page in history. It was all in the day's work for Marines who could expect a succession of such nameless battles as they clawed their way forward. That night, the wary men of 1-5 were not astonished to receive a counterattack in the darkness. It was all part of the job, too. After driving off the unseen enemy, the new tenants of Hill 610 snatched a few hours of sleep. They were on their feet again at dawn, ready to go up against the next key terrain feature in a rocky area that seemed to be composed entirely of Hill 610s. The next knob along the ridge happened to be Hill 680, about 1,000 yards to the northeast. VMF-214 planes from K-46 napalmed and strafed the enemy, and Abel Company led the 1-5 attack. During the airstrike, the Koreans had taken to cover in their holes on the reverse. They were back in previously selected forward slope firing positions by the time the Marines came in sight. Close-in artillery support enabled the attackers to get within grenade range and seize the last NKPA bunker by 1400. Abel Company pushed on. Midway from Hill 680 to the next knob, Hill 692, the advance was stopped by enemy small arms and mortar fire. 
An airstrike was requested on the bunkers holding up the assault, but fog closed in and the planes were delayed more than two hours. At 1600, after Able Company had renewed the assault without air support, four VMF-214 Corsairs started a target run controlled by a liaison plane from VMO-6. The foremost Marines, almost at the summit by this time, had to beat a hasty retreat to escape the napalm and 500-pound bombs being dumped on Hill 692. Fortunately, there were no friendly casualties. Some were caused indirectly, however, when hostile mortar fire caught Marines withdrawing along a connecting saddle to the comparatively safe reverse slope of Hill 680. When the danger passed, Able Company returned to the attack on 692 and routed the remaining defenders. The 1st Marine Division made it a policy thereafter that only the forward air controllers on the ground were to direct close air support along the front. Control of airstrikes farther behind the enemy lines was reserved for the OYs. End of Chapter 7, Part 1「Chapter 7, Part 2 of U.S. Marine Operations in Korea, 1950-1953, Volume 4, The East Central Front, by Lynn Montross, Norman Hicks, and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Advance to the Punch Bowl First Maw in Operation Strangle Sightings of enemy vehicles during the month of May totaled 54,561 seven times those of January. This increase prompted General Van Fleet to ask the 5th Air Force and 7th Fleet to initiate a program of cutting off all possible enemy road traffic between the latitudes 38 degrees 15 minutes north and 39 degrees 15 minutes north. Earlier in 1951, the interdiction program had been aimed chiefly at the enemy's rail lines and bridges. The Communists had countered by using more trucks. The new program, known as Operation Strangle, was to be concentrated against vital road networks. Flight leaders were briefed to search out critical spots where truck and ox cart traffic could be stopped. Road skirting hills were to be blocked by landslides caused by well-placed bombs. Where cliffside roads followed the coast, as they so often did in East Korea, naval gunfire started avalanches of dirt and rocks which sometimes reached a depth of 20 feet. Roads running through a narrow ravine or rice paddy could often be cut by a deep bomb crater. The first mall was given the assignment of stopping traffic on three roads in East Korea, from Wonsan to Pyongyang, from Kojo to Kumwa, and along a lateral route linking the two. Since Kumwa and Pyongyang were two of the three Iron Triangle towns, these roads were of more than ordinary importance. The Communists reacted to the new UN pressure by increasing their flak traps. UN pilots were lured with such bait as mysterious lights, tempting displays of supposed fuel drums, or damaged UN aircraft that called for investigation. The cost of the UN in planes and pilots showed an increase during the first two months of Operation Strangle. From 20 May to the middle of July, 20 Marine planes were shot down. Six of the pilots returned safely, two were killed, and 12 listed as missing. The demands of Operation Strangle added to the emphasis on interdiction and armed reconnaissance by the 5th Air Force. Statistics compiled by the 1st Marine Division for 1-17 June 1951 show that 984 close air support sorties had been requested and 642 received, about 65%. The ratio of Marine planes to other UN aircraft reporting to the division was about 4-1. to 1. The statistics of the 1st MA indicate that out of a total of 1,875 combat sorties flown from 1 to 15 June 1951, about a third were close air support, 651 day casts and 19 night casts. Of this number, 377 sorties went to the 1st Marine Division, which received more than half. Next in line were the 7th Infantry Division, 41 sorties, the 3rd Infantry Division, 31 sorties, 
and the 25th Infantry Division, 28 sorties. The effect of Operation Strangle on the enemy must be left largely to conjecture. There can be no doubt that it added enormously to the Communist logistical problem. It is equally certain that they solved these problems to such an extent that their combat units were never at a decisive handicap for lack of ammunition and other supplies. Operation Strangle, in short, merely added to the evidence that interdictory air alone was not enough to knock a determined adversary out of the war, as enthusiasts had predicted at the outbreak of hostilities in Korea. KMC Regiment Launches Night Attack on the night of 1-2 to 2 June, Colonel Nickerson was notified that the 7th Marines would be relieved next day by the 1st Marines, which would pass through and continue the attack. The 1st Marines moved into assembly areas at 0630. Lieutenant Colonel Homer E. Heyer, commanding officer of 3-1, went forward at 0800 with his command group to make a reconnaissance of the area. As his staff paused for a conference in a supposedly enfiladed location, a communist mortar barrage hit the group by complete surprise. The artillery liaison officer was killed instantly. His assistant, two forward observers, four company commanders, the S-3 and 32 enlisted men were wounded. So hard hit was the battalion that its attack had to be postponed until the following day. The 1st Division objective was designated X-ray. 2-1 had the mission of taking the high point, Hill 516. Across the valley, 3-1 advanced up a parallel ridge. Planes from VMF 214 and VMF 323 cleared the way for the securing of this battalion's objective at 1900. Aircraft from these same squadrons also aided 2-1 in overrunning the last opposition on Hill 516, where 80 NKPA dead were counted. The KMC Regiment, in reserve only two days, was ordered to relieve the 5th Marines on 4 June. This would permit Colonel Hayward to shift over to the right flank, thus extending the 1st Marine Division zone 5,000 yards to the east with the north-south boundary of the Soyoung River Valley. The purpose of this maneuver was to free 2nd Infantry Division troops for a mission of mopping up in the Ten Corps rear area. Three Marine Regiments were now in line, the 1st on the left, the KMC's in the center, the 5th on the right, and the 7th in reserve. A reshuffling of units also took place in the 1st Mall when VMF 312 ended its tour of duty on the CVL Baton. The replacement involved a change of carriers when VMF 323 was alerted for West Coast duty on the CVE Sicily a week later. Ahead of the KMC stretched the most difficult of the regimental zones of action the main mountain range extending northeast from Yanggu to Hill 1316, known to the Koreans as Taem San. Along these ridges, the Chinese had placed North Korean troops with orders to hold until death. From the air, the ground in front of the KMCs resembled a monstrous prehistoric lizard rearing up on its hind legs. The 1st Battalion was to ascend the tail and the 2nd the hind legs. The two would meet at the rump, Hill 1122. From this position, the backbone ran northeast to the shoulders, Hill 1218. Still farther northeast, along the neck, was the key terrain feature, Taem San, the head of the imagined reptile. The 1st and 2nd Battalions ran immediately into the opposition of an estimated NKPA regiment. In an effort to outflank the enemy, the 3rd Battalion swung over to the east and attacked up the ridge, forming the forelegs. Seizure of the shoulders, Hill 1218, would render enemy positions along the back, rump, hind legs, and tail untenable. Major General Cho Am Lin, commanding the 12th NKPA Division, was quick to recognize the tactical worth of this height and exact a stiff price for it. That the KMCs could expect little mercy from their fellow countrymen was demonstrated when the bodies of ten men reported missing were found. All had been shot in the back of the head. For five days the fight raged with unabated fury. The terrain limited the advance to a narrow front so that the attack resembled the thrust of a spear rather than a blow from a battering ram. 
When the KMCs did gain a brief foothold, the enemy launched a counterattack. At 2000 on 10 June, after six days of relatively unsuccessful fighting, the KMCs decided to gamble on a night attack. This had heretofore been the enemy's prerogative, and the Korean Reds were caught unaware and a devastating surprise. Most of the NKPA troops were attending to housekeeping duties at 0200 when all three KMC battalions fell upon them like an avalanche. Hill 1122, the rump of the lizard, was seized, and under pressure the enemy withdrew from the shoulders. This made the fall of Tam San inevitable, and only mopping up operations remained for KMCs who had suffered more than 500 casualties. General Thomas sent the regiment this message on 12 June. Congratulations to the KMC on a difficult job well done. Your seizure of objectives on the Kansas line from a determined enemy was a magnificent dash of courage and endurance. Your courageous and aggressive actions justify our pride in the Korean Marines. Logistical support of the three regiments in the attack presented a problem to the division supply echelons. The KMCs in the center and the 1st Marines on the left could be supplied over a narrow, winding mountain road that scaled a high pass before dropping down into an east-west valley giving relatively easy access to the center and left. The 5th Marines had to receive its supplies over another mountain road leading north of Inge, then west into the regimental zone. Both of the division supply routes needed a good deal of engineering work before trucks could move over them freely. Landslides were frequent, and many trucks skidded off the slippery trail while rounding the hairpin turns. The 1st Marines moved northward on north-south ridges, and the KMCs in the center had spurs leading to their objectives. It was the misfortune of the 5th Marines to have a topographical washboard effect ahead. The axis of advance was south to north, but the ground on the way to the final objectives on the Kansas line consisted of five sharply defined ridge lines running northwest to southeast. Instead of attacking along the ridge lines, Colonel Hayward's men had to climb some 1,200 feet, then descend 1,200 feet, five separate times while covering an advance of 8,000 yards. Artillery fired for more than two hours on the morning of 6 June to soften defenses on the next regimental objective, Hill 729. An airstrike was attempted, but fog with low-hanging clouds forced the flight leader to abort the mission. At 1300, the assault battalions moved across the LD against small arms and machine gun fire. The fog lifted sufficiently at 1400 to allow four F9Fs from VMF 311 to deliver an effective attack. And by 2100, both 25 and 35 were consolidating their positions on the first of the five ridges. This assault is typical of the fighting as the 5th Marines took the remaining four ridges, one by one, in a slugging assault on an enemy defending every commanding height. The advance resolved itself into a pattern as the Korean Reds probed the Marine lines at night and continued their tough resistance by day. For 10 days, the regiment plugged ahead, step by step, with the support of artillery, air, mortars, and 75mm recoilless rifles. First Marines moves up to Brown Line. On the left flank, the 1st Marines devoted several days to consolidating its position and sending out reconnaissance patrols in preparation for an attack on the ridge just north of the Hoichan Reservoir. From this height, the Communists could look down the throats of Colonel Brown's troops. From 6 to 8 June, Lt. Col. Hyer's 3rd Battalion led the attack against moderate but gathering resistance. A gain of 1,500 yards was made on the right flank by 2-1, commanded by Major Clarence J. Mabry, after the evacuation of Lt. Col. McClellan, wounded on the 5th. On the left, Lt. Col. Robley E. West's 1-1 held fast as the Rock 5th Regiment, 7th Rock Division, 10 Corps, passed through on its way to a new zone of action to the west. Early on the 9th, as 2-1 was preparing to launch its attack, an intense artillery and mortar barrage fell upon the lines, followed by the assault of an estimated NKPA company. The Korean Reds were beaten off with heavy losses. 
and though the enemy fire continued, 2-1 jumped off on schedule, fighting for every inch of ground. Colonel Brown committed 1-1 on the left. It was an all-day fight for both battalions. After taking one ridge in the morning, it was used as the springboard for an assault on the second objective. The weapons of the Regimental Anti-Tank Company built up a base of fire that enabled this ridge to be secured by 1600. The 5th Rock Regiment took its objectives by the morning of the 10th. The 1st Marines provided additional fire support by diverting all its anti-tank guns and tank rifles to the aid of the rocks. The pressure, which had been building for several days, reached a new high on 10 June. Late that morning, Colonel Brown met General Almond and the Division G3, Colonel Richard G. Weed, at a conference. By 1100, the entire 2nd Battalion of the 1st Marines was committed. On the left, Lt. Col. West had to hold up the 1st Battalion until 1330, when the rocks completed the occupation of the high ground dominating the route of advance. For several hours, it appeared that the Marines had met their match this time. A tenacious enemy defended log bunkers expertly, refusing to give ground until evicted by grenade and bayonet attacks. At every opportunity, the Communists counterattacked. So effective was their resistance that at dusk the two Marine battalions were still short of their objectives in spite of casualties draining the strength of both units. Colonel Joseph L. Weinkoff, commanding officer of the 11th Marines, remained on the telephone for hours with Colonel Brown. He gave all possible artillery support, not only of his own regiment but also nearby corps units. By nightfall, with the attacking battalion still held up, the atmosphere was tense in the regimental forward CP. Lieutenant Colonel Adelman, commanding the supporting artillery battalion, 211, helped to coordinate airstrikes and artillery with Lieutenant Colonel Donald M. Schmuck, executive officer of the 1st Marines and the air liaison officers. Everything I had ever hoped to see in years of teaching such coordination of fire seemed to come true that night, commented Colonel Brown at a later date. I stayed in my regular CP until I was sure all I could do through Weinkoff was done, and then went forward to see the finale. It was a glorious spectacle, that last bayonet assault. In the last analysis, 2-1 had to take its objective with the bayonet and hand grenades, crawling up the side of a mountain to get at the enemy. It was bloody work, the hardest fighting I have ever seen. This was no small tribute, coming from a veteran officer whose combat service included three major wars, not to mention Nicaragua and China. It was nearly midnight before Mabry's battalion took its final objective. Casualties for the day's attack were 14 KIA and 114 WIA, exclusive of slightly wounded, who were neither counted nor evacuated. West Battalion, which seized Hill 802, overlooking the Soyang River, had won its all-day fight at a cost of 9 KIA and 97 WIA. Unfailing support had been given throughout the daylight hours by aircraft of VMF-214. VMF-N-513 took over on the night shift, and planes came screeching in as late as 2200 to attack moonlit targets 100 yards ahead of the leading infantry elements. The 1st Marines had outfought and outgamed a tough enemy. Never again, after the 10th, was the NKPA resistance quite as determined. The 3rd Battalion led the other two during the next few days. There was plenty of fighting for all three, but the result was never again in doubt. By the late afternoon of 14 June, the regiment was in position on the Brown Line. This was the unofficial name for an extension of the Kansas Line some 3,000 yards north. It had been requested by Colonel Brown when he realized that positions along the Kansas line were completely dominated by the next ridge to the north. The change made necessary a continued advance by the KMCs on the right to tie in with the 1st Marines. The so-called Brown line was then officially designated the modified Kansas line. 7th Marines committed to the attack. For several days, General Thomas had been concerned over the heavy casualties suffered by his command. In order to give greater impetus to the division effort, he decided to commit the Reserve Infantry Regiment, the 7th Marines, minus one battalion held back as division reserve, 
to complete the occupation of the modified Kansas line. On 8 June, Colonel Nickerson's regiment, minus 37, moved into an assembly area between the 1st Marines and the KMCs, ready to attack in the morning. Ahead stretched a narrow but difficult zone of advance up the valley of the Sochan River. Tank infantry patrols went forward to select favorable positions for the jump-off, and engineers worked throughout the daylight hours to clear the valley roads of mines. Despite their best efforts, 10 Marine tanks were lost to mines during the first week. As the two battalions advanced on the morning of the 9th, they came under heavy enemy artillery and mortar fire. Nevertheless, they secured Hill 420 and dug in before nightfall. On the 10th, Rooney's 17 advanced along the ridgeline to support the attack of Meyerhoff's 27 up the valley floor. The maneuver was carried out successfully in spite of NKPA automatic weapons and mortar opposition. Contact was established with KMC forward units at dusk. 16 POWs were taken by the 7th Marines and 85 North Korean dead were counted on the objectives. The two battalions continued the attack throughout the next week. The 3rd Battalion of the 7th Marines remained General Thomas's sole division reserve until he committed it on the afternoon of 18 June. The newcomers got into the fight just in time for the enemy's all-out effort to defend the steep east-west ridge marking the Brown Line. The nature of the terrain made maneuver impossible. A frontal assault was the only answer. Defending the ridge was the 1st Battalion, 41st Regiment, 12th NKPA Division. Waiting on the reverse slope, the enemy launched a counterattack when the Marines neared the crest. George Company, commanded by 1st Lieutenant William C. Earhart, met five successive repulses at the hands of superior numbers. Item Company, 1st Lieutenant Frank A. Winfrey, also took part in the 5th Assault, and both companies held their ground near the summit when the fighting ended at dusk. They expected to resume the attack at dawn, but the enemy had silently withdrawn during the night. All three 7th Marines battalions occupied their designated positions on the Brown Line without further interference. By early afternoon on the 20th, The division was in complete control of the modified Kansas line and construction of defenses began in earnest. The next day, the 1st Marines and KMCs extended their right and left flanks respectively and pinched out the 7th Marines, which dropped back into reserve. Thus ended two months of continued hard fighting for the 1st Marine Division, beginning on 22 April with the Great CCF Offensive. Few and far between were the interludes of rest for troops which saw both defensive and offensive action. After stopping the enemy's two drives, they launched a month-long counterstroke that had the enemy hard-pressed at times for survival. Only the ruthless sacrifice of NKPA troops in defensive operations enabled the Chinese Reds to recover from the blows dealt them in late May and early June. The cost in Marine casualties had been high. Throughout the entire month, the 1st Marines alone suffered 67 KIA and 1,044 WIA, most of them being reported during the first two weeks. This was a higher total than the regiment incurred during the Chosen Reservoir operation. Reflecting on the caliber of these men, the regimental commander had this to say, They were war-wise when I got command. I contributed nothing to their training because they were in battle when I joined them and I left them when they came out of the lines for a rest. They used cover, maneuvered beautifully, used their own and supporting arms intelligently, were patient and not foolhardy. But when it came to the point where they had to rely on themselves with bayonet, hand grenade, and sheer guts, they could and did do that too. I have long ago given up telling people what I saw them do on many occasions. Nobody believes me, nor would I believe anyone else telling the same story of other troops. Colonel Brown, of course, paid this tribute to the troops of his regiment. But it is safe to say that any commanding officer of the 1st Marine Division would have felt that these sentiments applied equally to his own men. All the combat Marines of the 60-day battle had shown themselves to be worthy heirs of the traditions of Bella Wood, Guadalcanal, Iwo Jima, and the Chosen Reservoir. End of chapter 7, part 2.
Chapter 8, Part 1 of U.S. Marine Operations in Korea, 1950 to 1953, Volume 4, The East Central Front, by Lynn Montross, Norman Hicks, and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Truce Talks at Kaesong It is not likely that the date, 25 June 1951, meant much to the Marines on the Kansas line. In all probability, few of them recalled that it was the first anniversary of the communist aggression which started the war in Korea. Since that surprise attack on a June Sunday morning in 1950, some 1,250,000 men had been killed, wounded, or captured in battle, a million of them from the communist forces of Red China and the North Korean People's Republic. This was the estimate of J. Donald Kingsley, Korean Reconstruction Agent General for the United States. He reckoned the civilian victims of privation, violence, and disease at two million dead. Another three million had been made homeless refugees. On 25 June 1951, the Communists held less territory by 2,100 square miles than they occupied when they began their onslaught with an overwhelming local superiority in arms and trained troops. Losses of communist equipment during the first year included 391 aircraft, 1,000 pieces of artillery, and many thousands of machine guns, automatic rifles, and mortars. North Korea, formerly the industrial region of the peninsula, lay in ruins. Cities, factories, and power plants had been pounded into rubble. In short, the thrifty conquest planned by the Koreans and their Soviet masters had backfired. Not only had the communist offensives of April and May been stopped, the United Nations forces had rebounded to win their greatest victory of the war's first year. While Ten Corps was advancing to the punch bowl, other major 8th Army units had also gained ground. Perhaps the most crushing blow was dealt by one corps in its attack on the Iron Triangle. Units of two U.S. infantry divisions fought their way through extensive minefields into Chorwan and Kumwa on 8 June. By the end of the month, one corps held defensive positions about midway between the base and the apex of the strategic triangle that had been the enemy's main assembly area for the troops and supplies of his spring offensives. On the East Central Front, units of Nine Corps pushed within 10 miles of Kumsung while one Rock Corps advanced along the east coast to Chodo-ri. Thus, the UN forces occupied the most favorable line they had held since the great CCF offensive early in January. From the mouth of the Imjin, this line ran northeast to the middle of the Iron Triangle, eastward across the mountains to the southern rim of the Punch Bowl, then northeast to the coast of Chodo-ri. Communists ask for truce talks. The first anniversary of the Korean conflict was overshadowed two days earlier by the news that the communists had taken the initiative in proposing truce talks. The suggestion was made in a New York radio address of 23 June by a Soviet delegate to the United Nations, Jacob Malik, foreign minister of the USSR. On the 25th, the idea was unofficially endorsed in a radio broadcast by the Chinese Communist government. UN officials immediately indicated their willingness to discuss preliminary terms. The outcome was an agreement that representatives of both sides would meet on 7 July at Kaesong, then located between the opposing lines in West Korea. Why had the communists been first to ask for a truce conference? Both Generals Van Fleet and Almond believed that the answer might have been traced to military necessity rather than any genuine desire for peace. I felt at that time that the Chinese Communists and the North Korean armies were on the most wobbly legs that they had been on to that date, said General Almond when interviewed shortly after his retirement in 1953. They were punch drunk and ineffective, and I, personally, thought at that time that it was the time to finish off the effort. Raymond Cartier, representing a Paris newspaper, probably spoke for most of the correspondents at the front when he suspected that the proposal for truce talks was possibly just a crafty trick devised by the communists to gain time and build up again the badly mauled Chinese armies. 
It might have been recalled at this time that the communists had used truce negotiations for military purposes during the Chinese Civil War. In 1945 and 1946, when prospects for a national victory were bright, the enemy took advantage of American peace efforts by agreeing on several occasions to meet for truce conferences. And while prolonging the talks by all manner of subterfuges, the communists profited from the breathing spells by regrouping their forces and planning new offensives. Their final triumph, in fact, owed in no small measure to interludes when the conference table served a military purpose. History repeated itself in June and July 1951, when events of the next two years were shaped by the political decisions of a few summer weeks. Indeed, Admiral C. Turner Joy believed that the war was actually prolonged rather than shortened as a result of the negotiations. Military victory was not impossible nor even unusually difficult of achievement, wrote the senior delegate and chief of the UN command delegation at the truce talks. Elimination of the artificial restraints imposed on United States forces, coupled with an effective blockade on Red China, probably would have resulted in military victory in less time than was expended on truce talks. Mao Zedong's forces had lost face by the failure of their long-heralded fifth phase offensive. They had been badly beaten during the UN counteroffensive. Pretensions of high CCF morale could no longer be maintained when troops were laying down their arms without a fight. Nor could charges of low UN morale be supported when the fighting spirit of the 8th Army was being shown every day at the front. In view of these circumstances, it would appear that the Communists had poor cards to play against United Nations trumps at a truce conference. But they played them so craftily, with such a sly sense of propaganda values, that the victors of the May and June battles were soon made to appear losers begging for a breathing spell. To begin with, the Chinese knew that the mere public announcement of the possibility of truce talks would have a tremendous appeal in the United States, where the war was unpopular. Pressure would be brought upon Washington to meet the enemy immediately for negotiations. And while a ceasefire remained even a remote prospect, American public opinion would demand a slackening of offensive military operations with their attendant casualties. From the outset, it was apparent that the United Nations command was no match for the communists in low cunning. The UN suggested, for instance, that the truce teams meet on the Danish hospital ship Jutlandia. Here, surely, was neutral ground, since the Danes had no combat forces in Korea. Moreover, the ship was to be anchored in Wonsan Harbor within range of CCF shore batteries. The Reds won the first of many such concessions with their refusal. They insisted that the talks be held at Kaesong, and the UN command let them have it their way. The reason for the communist decision was soon made evident. Kaesong was in the path of the advancing 8th Army, which meant that an important road center would be immune from attack. And though the ancient Korean town was originally in no man's land, the communists soon managed to include it within their lines. All delegates were requested to display white flags on their vehicles for identification. Communist photographers were on hand to snap countless pictures of UN delegates which convinced Asia's illiterate millions at a glance that the beaten United Nations had sent representatives to plead for terms. If any doubt remained, other photographs showed the unarmed UN delegates being herded about Kaesong by scowling communist guards with burp guns. No detail of the stage setting was too trivial to be overlooked. Oriental custom prescribes that at the peace table the victors face south and the losers face north. Needless to add, the UN delegates were seated at Kaesong with a view to enhancing communist prestige. Some of the propaganda schemes bordered on the ridiculous. At the first meeting of the delegates, Admiral Joy related, I seated myself at the conference table and almost sank out of sight. The communists had provided a chair for me which was considerably shorter than a standard chair. Across the table, the senior communist delegate, General Nam Il, protruded a good foot above my cagely diminished stature. 
This had been accomplished by providing Stumpy Nam Il with a chair about four inches higher than usual. Chain-smoking Nam Il puffed his cigarette in obvious satisfaction as he glowered down on me, an obviously torpedoed admiral. This condition of affairs was promptly rectified when I changed my foreshortened chair for a normal one, but not before communist photographers had exposed reels of film. Patrol Bases on Badger Line The war went on, of course, during the negotiations, but the tempo was much reduced as the UN forces consolidated their gains and the enemy appeared to be breaking off contact at every opportunity. Generally speaking, the 8th Army had shifted from the offensive to the defensive. In keeping with this trend, the 1st Marine Division occupied the same positions for nearly three weeks after fighting its way to the Brown Line. On 22 June, all three infantry regiments were directed to establish battalion-sized patrol bases on the Badger Line, one and a half to two and a half miles forward of their present positions. In the 1st Marine Sector, 3-7 was attached to Colonel Brown in order to relieve 3-1 on the left flank of the regiment. The purpose was to free 3-1 to move forward and establish a patrol base on Hill 761, about 1,000 yards forward of the MLR. While these arrangements were being carried out, General Allman called at the 1st Marine CP. He expressed surprise that the establishment of patrol bases were being contemplated by USAC when some of the frontline units were still in contact with the enemy. Execution of these orders was accordingly suspended. The following day, however, Division again alerted the infantry regiments to be prepared to occupy patrol bases on order. This was by direction of Corps, which in turn had been directed by USAC. The Marine Regimental and Battalion Commanders were not happy about this turn of affairs. The patrol base concept had been tried out early in May during the lull between the enemy's two offensives and found wanting. In theory, it was a good means of keeping contact with an enemy who had pulled back out of mortar and light artillery range. In practice, the enemy had shown that he could bypass patrol bases at night for probing attacks on the MLR. The bases themselves ran the constant risk of being surrounded and overwhelmed. As a final objection, a regiment was often deprived of its reserve battalion, which was the logical choice for such duty. In compliance with orders, 3-1 moved out on 26 June and established a patrol base on Hill 761. This position received such a bombardment of large caliber mortar fire that Colonel Brown pulled the battalion back to the MLR the following day. General Thomas gave his opinion of the patrol base concept after his retirement when he summed it up as an invitation to disaster. He could only carry out orders, however, when Corps directed early in July that a patrol base be established on Teusan. This 4,000-foot peak, located some two miles north of the MLR, afforded excellent observation eastward into the Punch Bowl and westward into the Sochan River Valley. The enemy, of course, was aware of these advantages and made Teusan a strong point of his MLR. This was clearly indicated by the stiff resistance encountered by KMC reconnaissance patrols. Nevertheless, Division G-3 was suddenly alerted on the morning of 7 July by the Marine Liaison Officer with 10 Corps to expect an order directing the setting up of a patrol base on Teusan the following day. The KMC Regiment, warned by telephone, had little time for planning and organizing an attack. Since the KMCs could not be relieved for responsibility for their sector, it was necessary to form a composite battalion of three companies that could most conveniently be relieved. Unfortunately, they contained a large proportion of recruits and the battalion commander was a new arrival. There were two avenues of approach. One was a long and open, fairly level ridgeline that extended from the KMC positions. The other called for a descent into the stream bed generally paralleling the MLR and a steep climb up a ridge leading directly north to Teusan. Both routes of approach were used. One company advanced on the right by way of the stream bed and two companies took to the ridge line on the left. The assault was to have been preceded by airstrikes and an artillery bombardment 
but bad weather kept the aircraft grounded. The attack jumped off at 10.30 on 8 July. All three companies were greeted by enemy mortar and machine gun fire that pinned down the company on the right. The two companies on the left won a foothold on Hill 1100, about a mile in front of Teusan. Here the advance ground to a halt. The KMCs dug in for the night and repulsed a series of counterattacks. On the morning of the 9th, the KMC regimental commander, Colonel Kim Tai Sheik, committed the entire 1st Battalion to the attack on the right. It had no better success than the company of the day before. Meanwhile, the two companies were driven off Hill 1100. Colonel Gould P. Groves, senior liaison officer with the KMCs, recommended that the remnants of the two companies be withdrawn. The 1st Battalion had managed to capture Hill 1001, but it was plain that the KMC regiment could not come close to Teusan. On 12 July, the 1st Marine Division informed 10 Corps that the position held by the KMCs just forward of Hill 1001 fulfilled the requirements of an advanced patrol base. As far as the Marines were concerned, the sad affair was permitted to rest there. As evidence of the valiant effort made by the KMCs, they suffered 222 casualties. A sequel to this story was written late in July after the 2nd Infantry Division relieved the Marines. Ten Corps again ordered the capture of Teusan as a patrol base, and it required the commitment of the major part of the division to accomplish the task. Although the fighting had not been severe for other units of the 1st Marine Division during the first two weeks of July, the casualties, including KMC losses, were 55 KAA, 360 WIA, and 22 MIA, a total of 437. Relief of the Marines was completed by the 2nd Infantry Division on 15 July, and by the 17th, all units were on their way back to assembly areas in 10 Corps rear. It was the second time since the landing of the 1st Provisional Marine Brigade on 2 August 1950 that the Marines had been away from the firing line for more than a few days. Red Herrings at Kaesong it is not changing the subject to switch to the truce talks. Kaesong was actually a second UN front. After the preliminaries had been settled, most of them to communist satisfaction, the UN delegation, headed by Admiral Joy, held a first meeting on 10 July 1951 with his opposite number, NKPA Major General Nam Il, and the communist truce team. This was the first of the talks that were to drag on for two dreary years. Nam Il, a Korean native of Manchuria, born in 1911, had been educated in Russia and had served with the Soviet Army in World War II. His career in Korea began when he arrived as a captain with Soviet occupation troops in 1945. Rising to power rapidly, he took a prominent part in the creation of a Soviet puppet state in North Korea. An atmosphere of sullen hatred surrounded the UN delegates at Kaesong. The CCF Sentinel posted at the entrance to the conference room wore a gaudy medal which he boasted had been awarded to him for killing 40 Americans. When Admiral Joy tried to send a report to General Ridgway, the messenger was turned back by armed communist guards. These are samples of the indignities heaped upon the UN truce team. After several UN delegates were threatened by guards with burp guns, Joy protested to Nam Il, demanding prompt elimination of such crudities. In order to give their battered armies more time for recuperation, the communist delegates met every issue with delaying tactics. They proved themselves to be masters of the ancient art of dragging a red herring across the trail. Going back on their word did not embarrass them in the least if they found it to their advantage to renege. The truce negotiations were bound to have an immediate effect on military operations. In the United States, it seemed a pity to newspaper readers that American young men should have to die in battle at a time when headlines were hinting at the possibility of peace. Mothers wrote to their congressmen, requesting a halt in Korean operations. General Van Fleet minced no words after his retirement when he commented on the effect of the truce talks on strategy.
Instead of getting directives for offensive action, we found our activities more and more prescribed as time went on. Even in the matter of straightening out our lines for greater protection, or capturing hills when the Reds were looking down our throats, we were limited by orders from the Far East Command in Japan, presumably acting on directives from Washington. It was the opinion of Admiral Joy that more UN casualties were suffered as a consequence of the truce talks than would have resulted from an offensive taking full advantage of Red China's military weaknesses in June 1951. As soon as armistice discussions began, he wrote, United Nations Command ground forces slackened their offensive preparations. Instead, offensive pressure by all arms should have been increased to the maximum during the armistice talks. I feel certain that the casualties of the United Nations Command endured during the two long years of negotiations far exceeded any that might have been expected from an offensive in the summer of 1951. First Marine Division in Reserve Most of the First Marine Division units were in 10 Corps Reserve during the last two weeks of July 1951. The 5th Marines, however, remained in ready reserve near Inge under the operational control of 10 Corps. Toward the end of the month, the 3rd Battalion of the 11th Marines passed to the operational control of the 2nd Infantry Division. Meanwhile, the 7th Marines and Division Reconnaissance Company displaced to the Yangu area to aid in the construction of defensive positions and undergo special training. 1st Marine Division Training Order 2-51 covering the period from 23 July to 20 August 1951, provided for a stiff daily schedule of general and specialist military subjects. The objectives were to maintain each individual and unit of the command at a very high state of proficiency, while emphasizing rest and rehabilitation of personnel and repair and maintenance of equipment. A minimum of 33% of all technical training was to be conducted at night, stressing individual and unit night discipline. Formal unit schools and on-the-job training were utilized extensively. Most thoroughly covered among general military subjects were mechanical training, capabilities, tactical employment, and firing of individual and infantry crew served weapons. Lectures and demonstrations were combined to good effect with instruction in basic infantry tactics. The prescribed periods of physical conditioning, the division report continued, were supplemented by extensive organized athletic programs outside of training hours, resulting in the maintenance of a high degree of battle conditioning of all hands. Special military subjects encompassed the whole range of activities necessary to the accomplishment of any mission assigned the division. Building from the duties of the individual Marine, Infantry, artillery, engineer, and tank personnel progressed through small unit employment and tactics as it applied to their respective specialties. Meanwhile, such diverse training as tank repair and watch repair was conducted in various units. Fortification came in for study after a tour of the Kansas line by Major General Clovis E. Byers, who had relieved General Almond as 10 Corps commander. He listed the weaknesses he found and directed that special attention be given to the thickness, strength, and support of bunker overheads, and to the proper revetting and draining of excavations. The KMC regiment received the most thorough training it had ever known, considering that it had been in combat continually since its organization. Each of the division's three other regiments sent four training teams consisting of a lieutenant, an NCO, and an interpreter to the KMCs on 22 July. The 12 teams had orders to remain until 20 August. Attached to various KMC companies, they acted as advisors for the entire training period. Another organization of Koreans that had won its way to favorable recognition was the newly formed Civil Transport Corps, CTC. The use of indigenous labor for logistical purposes dated back to March 1951, when the 8th Army's advance was slowed up by supply problems caused by muddy roads. Plans were made to equip and train a special corps to assist in the logistical support of combat troops in areas inaccessible to normal motor transportation. The project began on 29 March with 720 South Koreans, all from the Korean National Guard, being assigned to one corps. 
Plans were developed for a civil transport corps of 82 companies, each containing 240 men. The CTC was to be supervised by a staff of eight U.S. Army officers and four enlisted men under the operational control of the Transportation Section, USAC. The ROC Army had the added responsibility for logistical support of hospitalization and medical services other than emergency treatment in forward areas. Support for the CTC from UN units was to be provided in a manner similar to that in effect for the ROC forces. No difficulty was found in filling the CTC ranks, for the pay meant food and clothing to a Korean and his family. The Marines were always astonished at the heavy loads the Korean cargadors could carry uphill on their A-frames, which looked like sturdy easels with a pair of arm and shoulder carrying straps. Humble and patient, these burden bearers were the only means of supply in remote combat areas. End of chapter 8, part 1. Chapter 8, Part 2 of U.S. Marine Operations in Korea, 1950-1953, Volume 4, The East Central Front, by Lynn Montross, Norman Hicks, and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Truce Talks at Kaesong Marine Helicopters Take the Lead The Truce Talks continued to be the front-page news in August. Some of the more impulsive newspaper and radio commentators hinted at the possibility of a ceasefire before the end of summer. As for the Marine Command and staff, they were not so optimistic, judging from this sentence in a report. All division units were notified on 14 August that requisitions had been sent to USAC for cold weather clothing and equipment. The training period afforded an opportunity to glance back over the first year of fighting in Korea and evaluate the results. There could be no doubt that the war's foremost tactical innovation so far was the combat helicopter. The Marine Corps had taken the lead in its development when VMO-6, made up of OYs and Sikorsky HO-3S1 helicopters in roughly equal numbers, got into action with the 1st Provisional Marine Brigade in the Pusan perimeter. Brigadier General Edward A. Craig had the historical distinction, insofar as is known, of being the first commanding general to see the advantages of a chopper as a command vehicle. Evacuation of casualties was the principal job of the rotary wing aircraft, and 1,926 wounded Marines were flown out during the first year. No less than 701 of these mercy flights took place during the three months from 1 April to 30 June 1951 covering the period of the two CCF fifth phase offensives and the UN counterstroke. By that time, the Bell HTL-4, with its built-in litters on both sides sheltered by plexiglass hoods, had taken over most of the evacuation missions from the HO-3S-1. The zeal of the pilots contributed substantially to the successful results. Captain Dwayne L. Redelin gave a demonstration of the VMO-6 spirit at the height of the first CCF offensive in the spring of 1951. During the 13 and a half hours from 0600 to 1930 on 23 April, he was in the air constantly except for intervals of loading or unloading casualties. Logging a total of 9.6 flight hours, he evacuated 18 wounded men under enemy fire that left bullet holes in the plexiglass of his HTL-4. Practically all the helicopter techniques put into effect by VMO-6 had originally been developed by the Marine Experimental Squadron, HMX-1, organized late in 1947 at Quantico. Despite the enthusiasm for rotary wing aircraft then prevailing, HMX-1 decided that an observation squadron should combine OYs with helicopters. The wisdom of this conclusion was proved in Korea, where the test of combat showed that both types were needed. The OYs were the superiors at reconnaissance and artillery spot missions, while the helicopters excelled at transportation and liaison and evacuation flights. VMO-6 as a whole was the only Marine organization linking the ground and air commands. An administrative unit of the 1st MA, the squadron was under operational control of the 1st Marine Division. 
Thanks to the ability of the helicopter to land on a dime, staff liaison missions and command visits were greatly facilitated. The helicopter had become the modern general's steed, and the gap between staff and line was narrowed by rotary wings. The importance of wound evacuation missions can hardly be overestimated. Surgeons stress the value of time in treating the shock resulting from severe wounds. The sooner a patient could be made ready for surgery, the better were his chances of survival. Definitive care had waited in the past until a casualty was borne on a jolting stretcher from the firing line to the nearest road to begin a long ambulance ride. Such a journey might take most of a day, but there were instances of a helicopter evacuee reaching the operation table only an hour after being wounded at the front, 15 or 20 miles away. Captain J.W. McElroy, U.S. Navy Reserve, commanding the famous hospital ship Consolation, asserted that his experience had proved conclusively the superiority of the helicopter method of embarking and evacuating casualties to and from the ship. A helicopter loading platform was installed on the Consolation in July 1951 during an overhaul at the Long Beach Naval Shipyard in California. Marine helicopter pilots advised as to landing requirements, and eventually all the hospital ships had similar platforms. At a conservative estimate, the 1,926 wounded men flown out by VMO-6 helicopters during the squadron's first year in Korea included several hundred who might not have survived former methods of evacuation. Marine body armor tested in Korea Another far-reaching tactical innovation was being launched at this time as Lt. Commander Frederick J. Lewis, MSC, U.S. Navy, supervised a joint Army-Navy three-month field test of marine armored vests made of lightweight plastics. A glance at the past reveals that body armor had never quite vanished from modern warfare. European cavalry lancers wore steel cuirasses throughout the 19th century. During the American Civil War, two commercial firms in Connecticut manufactured steel breastplates purchased by thousands of Union soldiers. So irksome were the weight and rigidity of this protection, however, the infantrymen soon discarded it. World War I dated the first widespread adoption of armor in the 20th century. The idea was suggested when a French general noted that one of his men had survived a lethal shell fragment by virtue of wearing an iron mess bowl under his beret. France led the way, and before the end of 1915, steel helmets were being issued to all armies on the Western Front. When the United States entered the war, General John J. Pershing put in a request for body armor. Some 30 prototypes using steel or aluminum plates were submitted but rejected. In every instance, the weight and rigidity were such that too high a price in mobility would be paid for protection. During the 1930s, new possibilities were opened up by developments in lightweight plastics. The Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor interrupted experiments that were not resumed until 1943. Then a new start was made with the formation of a joint Army-Navy committee headed by Rear Admiral Alexander H. Van Curen and Colonel George F. Doriot. Wound statistics indicate that the great majority of fatal wounds were received in a comparatively small area of the body. The following table shows the regional frequency. Non-fatal. Head, 10%. Chest, 10%. Abdomen, 10%. Upper extremity, 30%. Lower extremity, 40%. Fatal. Head, 20%. Chest, 50%. Abdomen, 20%. Upper extremity, 5%. Lower extremity, 5%. Shell, mortar, or grenade fragments cause 60% of the fatal wounds, the statistics revealed, with the remainder being charged to rifle or machine gun fire. It was futile to hope for lightweight protection against high-velocity bullets. But researchers hoped that plastic body armor could stop enough shell or mortar fragments to reduce serious wounds to light wounds while preventing light wounds altogether. Doron and nylon were the materials approved by the Joint Army-Navy Committee. 
The first, named in honor of Colonel Doriot, consisted of laminated layers of glass cloth filaments bonded under heavy pressure to form a thin, rigid slab. That a 1-8 inch thickness could stop and partially flatten a submachine gun bullet with a muzzle velocity of 1,150 feet per second was demonstrated by ballistic tests at a range of 8 yards. The committee recommended 12-ply, laminated, basket-weave nylon for use where flexibility was required. Both the Duron and nylon protected the wearer by offering enough resistance to absorb the energy of the missile, which spent itself at the impact. Thus the shock was spread out over too large a surface for a penetration, although the wearer could receive a bad bruise. If a penetration did result from a missile of higher velocity, its effects would be much reduced in severity. Aircraft pilots and crewmen, who could tolerate more weight than foot sloggers, were first to benefit. Flax suits and curtains were being manufactured in quantity for airmen by 1944, and the 8th Air Force claimed a 50% reduction in casualties as a result. The infantry stood most in need of protection. Statistics from 57 U.S. divisions in the European theater of operations during World War II indicated that foot soldiers, comprising 68.5% of the total strength, suffered 94.5% of the casualties. It was further established that shell or mortar fragments caused from 61.3 to 80.4% of the wounds. Unfortunately, progress lagged for the ground forces, owing to conflicting requirements. Several prototype armored vests were submitted and rejected. The Marine Corps planned to conduct combat tests in the spring of 1945 by providing the ordinary utility jacket with sheaths to hold slabs of Doron. A battalion of the 2nd Marine Division had been selected to wear the garment in Okinawa, but the experiment was interrupted by the end of the campaign. The Navy and Marine Corps renewed their research in 1947 at Camp Lejeune. There a new ballistics center, established for the development and evaluation of body armor, was set up by the Naval Medical Field Research Laboratory, NMFRL. Lieutenant Commander Lewis was placed in charge of experiments. Scientific precision seemed more important than haste in time of peace, and the NMFRL was not ready with an armored vest when communism challenged the free world to a showdown in Korea. 500 of the armored utility jackets of the proposed Okinawa test were available, however, and were shipped to the 1st Marine Division during the Incheon Seoul operation. Many of them went astray during the sea lift to Wonsan and subsequent chosen reservoir operation. Only the 50 garments issued to the Division Reconnaissance Company were worn in combat. And though this unit kept no records, the Doron slabs were credited by Major Walter Gall, the commanding officer, with saving several lives. By the summer of 1951, Lieutenant Commander Lewis and his researchers had designed a new marine armored vest weighing about 8.5 pounds, combining curved, overlapping Doron plates with flexible pads of basket-weave nylon. This garment, according to the official description, was capable of stopping a 45 caliber USA pistol or Thompson submachine gun bullet. All the fragments of the U.S. hand grenade at 3 feet, 75% of the U.S. 81mm mortar at 10 feet, and full thrust of the American bayonet. Only 40 vests were available for field tests in the summer of 1951. Lewis rotated them among as many wearers as possible in the three regiments selected for the test, the 5th Marines and the 23rd and 38th Regiments of the U.S. 2nd Infantry Division. There was, as he saw it, a psychological question to be answered. Would body armor win the acceptance of troops in combat? The hackneyed phrase, bulletproof vest, for instance, put the wearer in a class with the buyer of a gold brick. Nylon was associated in the minds of the men with alluring feminine attire rather than protection from shell fragments. Finally, there could be no denying that undesired weight had been added that Doron plates hampered movement to some extent, and that nylon pads were uncomfortably warm for summer wear. 
Despite these drawbacks, Lewis found that troop acceptance was all that could be asked. The locale of the test was the Inge area and the approaches to the Kansas line in June and early July. By keeping these few vests almost constantly in use, the Medical Service Corps officer commented, the maximum amount of troop wear was obtained. Included in the wide sampling were company aid men, riflemen, barmen, mortar 60 millimeter men, radio backpack type men, each carrying his basic weapon, ammunition load, and one meal ration. When Lewis returned to Camp Lejeune, he reported that body armor, protection of some type for the vital anatomic areas, is almost unanimously desired by all combat troops, particularly the combat veteran of several actual firefights with the enemy. Infantry body armor had at last made the transition from a dream to a reality. The M1951 was put into production by a Philadelphia sportswear firm and it was estimated that by the spring of 1952 nearly all Marines would be protected by the vest in combat. Saving of American lives, of course, was a primary consideration, but there was a tactical as well as humanitarian advantage to be gained. For if body armor could reduce fatal and serious wounds by as much as 50%, as NMFRL researchers hoped, it would mean that a large percentage of the enemy's best anti-personnel weapons had, in effect, been silenced. MAG-12 moves to K-18 There was no respite for First Maw while the 1st Marine Division remained in reserve. Operation Strangle was at its height, and interdiction flights called for nearly all the resources of Marine aviation during the summer of 1951. Close air support missions were made secondary. This principle was upheld by Air Force Major General Otto P. Wayland. I might suggest that all of us should keep in mind the limitations of air forces as well as their capabilities. Continuous cast along a static front requires dispersed and sustained firepower against pinpoint targets. With conventional weapons, there is no opportunity to exploit the characteristic mobility and firepower of air forces against worthwhile concentrations. In a static situation, close support is an expensive substitute for artillery fire. It pays its greatest dividends when the enemy's sustaining capability has been crippled and his logistics cut to a minimum while his forces are immobilized by interdiction and armed reconnaissance. Then decisive results can be obtained as the close support effort is massed in coordination with the determined ground action. Marine aviation officers, of course, would have challenged some of these opinions. But General Wayland insisted that in the summer and fall of 1951, it would have been sheer folly not to have concentrated the bulk of our air effort against interdiction targets in the enemy rear areas. Otherwise, the available firepower would have been expended inefficiently against relatively invulnerable targets along the front while the enemy was left to build up his resources to launch and sustain a general offensive. The UN interdiction program was costly to the communists. Yet it remained a stubborn fact that the enemy had not only maintained, but actually increased his flow of supplies in spite of bombings that might have knocked a Western army out of the war. That was because CCF and NKPA troops could operate with a minimum of 50 short tons per day per division an average of about 10 pounds per man. It was about one-fifth of the supply requirements for an equal number of U.S. troops. Try as they might, the U.N. Air Forces could not prevent the arrival of the 2,900 tons of rations, fuel, ammunition, and other supplies needed every day by the 58 Communist divisions at the front. The enemy during this period was increasing his own air potential. On 17 June, the 5th Air Force warned that the Communists had stepped up their number of planes from an estimated 900 in mid-May to 1,050 in mid-June. Their Korean airfields were being kept under repair in spite of persistent UN air attacks. In June, enemy light planes made night raids along the UN front lines and even into the Seoul area. VMFN 513 pilots, flying the nightly combat patrol over Seoul, had several fleeting contacts with these black-painted raiders. 
The Marines were unable to close in for the kill since the opposing planes were non-metal and difficult to track by radar. Soon, however, the VMFN 513 pilots had better hunting. On 30 June, Captain Edwin B. Long and his radar operator, Chief Warrant Officer Robert C. Buckingham, shot down a black two-place PO-2 biplane. And on 13 July, Captain Donald L. Fenton destroyed another. Despite the Air Force emphasis on interdiction, better close air support remained a major objective of the first maw. One of the requirements was a shorter flying distance from airbase to combat area. K-46, the MAG-12 field near Hoingsong, had qualified with respect to reduced flying time. Maintenance problems caused by the dusty, rocky runway of this primitive strip led to its abandonment. On 14 July, the squadrons pulled back temporarily to K-1, and on the 26th, MAG-12 withdrew its maintenance crews. The group's new field was K-18, a 4,400-foot strip on the east coast near Kangnun and just south of the 38th parallel. Situated only 40 miles behind the 1st Marine Division and on the seacoast, the new field seemed to be ideally located. The runway, reinforced with pure steel planking, extended inland from a beach where waterborne supplies could be delivered, as at K-3. The division back in action again. Political causes had a good deal to do with the renewal of activity for the 1st Marine Division late in August 1951. Apparently, the Communist Armed Forces had been given enough time to recuperate from their hard knocks in May and June. At any rate, the Red Delegates walked out of the truce talks after falsely charging on 22 August that UN planes had violated the neutrality of the Kaesong area by dropping napalm bombs. Although the Reds were unable to show any credible evidence, the negotiations came to an abrupt end for the time being. On the 26th, all Marine units received a division warning that offensive operations were to be initiated in the immediate future. The effective strength of the division, including the KMCs, had been reported as 1,386 officers and 24,044 enlisted men on 1 August 1951. Attached to the division at that time were 165 interpreters and 4,184 Korean CTC cargadors. On the 26th, the regiments were disposed as follows. The 1st Marines near Chogutan, the 5th Marines near Inge, the 7th Marines near Yanggu, and the 1st KMC Regiment at Hangye. Service units and the Division CP were located along the Hongchan Hangye Road in the vicinity of Tungdong Ni. The 11th Marines, minus, with the 196th Field Artillery Battalion, U.S. Army, attached, constituted the 11th Marine Regiment Group, an element of 10 Corps artillery. Throughout the training period, 211 remained under the control of the 1st Marine Division and 311 was attached to the 2nd Infantry Division. The 5th Marines, 7th Marines, and KMCs were alerted to be prepared to move up to the combat areas south and west of the Punch Bowl on 27 August. The 1st Marines was to remain in division reserve, and the 11th Marines reverted to parent control. It was only about a five-hour motor march from Tungdong Ni to the forward assembly area under normal road and weather conditions but recent rains had turned roads into bogs and fordable streams into torrents. Bridges were weakened by the raging current in the Soyang, and landslides blocked the road in many places. The 1st Marine Division was back in action again, but it would have to fight its first battles against the rain and the mud. End of Chapter 8, Part 2 Chapter 9, Part 1 of U.S. Marine Operations in Korea, 1950-1953, Volume 4, The East Central Front, by Lynn Montross, Norman Hicks, and others. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Renewal of the Attack It was, to a large extent, a new 1st Marine Division on 27 August 1951. Very few veterans of the reservoir campaign were left, 
and even the Marines of the hard fighting in April and May had been thinned by casualties and rotation. Whatever the new arrivals lacked in experience, however, they had made up as far as possible by intensive and realistic training while the division was in reserve. The new Marine zone of action, in the Punch Bowl area, was as bleak and forbidding as any expanse of terrain in Korea. Dominating the Punch Bowl from the north and blocking any movement out of it was Yoke Ridge, looking somewhat like an alligator on the map. Hill 930 represented the snout, Hill 1000 was the head, and the body extended eastward through hills 1026 and 924. Two smaller hills, 702 and 602, spread off southeast and northeast respectively to the Soyang River and its unnamed tributary from the west. On either side of Yoke Ridge were numerous sharp and narrow ridges. Some of the hills were wooded with enough scrub pine to afford concealment for outposts and bunkers. Altogether, it was an area eminently suited to defense. The defenders were identified by Division G-2 as troops of the 6th Regiment, 2nd Division, 2 NKPA Corps. Apparently, they did not lack supporting weapons, for 3-7 positions on Hill 680 were hit by an estimated 200 mortar and artillery rounds during daylight hours of the 30th. Crossing the Soyang in Flood The 7th Marines and KMC Regiment, ordered to relieve U.S. and ROC Army units on the Kansas line, started their march in a downpour on 27 August. The 5th Marines, less 1st Battalion, at Inge had orders to follow the 7th up the narrow Soyang Valley. Typical of the wet weather difficulties were those experienced by 3-7. Scheduled to depart early for the forward positions, the company struck tents. Trucks failed to arrive and they remained to eat the noon meal, a gustatorial bonus of all food the galley crew could not carry with them. Unfortunately, the trucks were delayed further and the men shivered in the rain as they ate an evening meal of sea rations. When the vehicles finally arrived at 2100, the rain had reached torrential proportions. Progress was so slow over muddy roads that it took until 0330 on the 28th to reach the CP of the 7th Marines at Sowari, just southeast of the junction of the Soyang and a tributary from the east. The bivouac area assigned to 37 for the night proved to be a foot deep in water, and Lt. Col. Kelly directed his men to catch what sleep they could in the trucks while he and his staff attempted to straighten out the snarled traffic situation. It took the rest of the night for the three seven officers to walk the length of the convoy, cutting out trucks with less essential cargo. With only a small space available for a turnaround, the three seven vehicles were ordered to back into it, unload their troops and equipment, and return along a narrow road, which had been churned into a quagmire. The battalion assembly area was on the other side of the rain-swollen Soyang. Howe Company and the command group managed to cross over a waist-deep ford, but the crossing was so perilous that DUKWs were requested for the other two rifle companies. Lt. Col. Lewis C. Griffin's 27 also found the river crossing an operation requiring DUKWs. By the afternoon of the 29th, all elements of the two 7th Marine battalions were on the west bank, occupying their assigned assembly areas. The relief proceeded slowly. Two KMC battalions on the left of the 7th Marines took over the zone formerly held by elements of the 2nd Infantry Division and the 8th Rock Division. The cosmopolitan character of the 8th Army was revealed when two KMC relieved the French battalion of the 2nd Infantry Division. Linguistic chaos was averted only by the best efforts of the exhausted interpreters. By the 30th, the 1st and 3rd KMC battalions were behind the line of departure on Hill 755, ready to attack in the morning. The 2nd Battalion assumed responsibility for the regimental zone on the Kansas line. The 2nd and 3rd Battalions of the 7th Marines had meanwhile completed the relief of elements of the 8th Rock Division. On the other side of the river, Lt. Col. James G. Kelly's 17 had relieved units of the Rock Division on the hill mass a mile and a half north of Tunpyong. 
These Marines were first to come under fire as the enemy sent over a few mortar rounds after dark on the 29th. Division Operation Order 22-51 directed the two assault regiments, the 7th Marines and KMCs, to attack at 0600 the following morning and seize their assigned positions on Corps Objective Yoke, the ridgeline running from Hill 930 on the west through Hills 1026 and 924 on the east. Objective 1, the hill mass 1.5 miles northeast of Tumpyong, was already occupied by 1-7. The 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines, was ordered to seize Objective 2, generally that part of Yoke Ridge east of Hill 924. The KMC Regiment was assigned Objective 3, consisting of Hills 924 and 1026. Other 1st Marine Division units had the following missions on 31 August. 5th Marines, to patrol the division zone along the Kansas line and protect defensive installations. 1st Marines, to remain in the rear at the Hongchon area and 10 Corps Reserve. 1st Tank Battalion, to move up in readiness to support the assault regiments. Division Reconnaissance Company, to continue to patrol the punch bowl and mop up bypassed enemy. Landmines were a constant menace to troop movements as the assault regiments adjusted positions in preparation for the attack. As usual, neglected friendly mines were encountered as well as those planted by the enemy. POW information and air reports indicated a southward movement of two to three enemy regiments with artillery and supplies. Prisoners stated that an attack was due on 1 September leading to the G2 conjecture that the enemy's sixth phase offensive might be about to start. Light resistance at first. Priority of air support on 31 August was assigned to the two KMC battalions. They jumped off in column against light to moderate resistance, with Hill 924 as their first objective. Minefields gave the KMCs more trouble at first than scattered NKPA mortar and machine gun fire. Forward movement and maneuver were restricted as 1 KMC passed through 3 KMC at 1445 to continue the attack against stiffening resistance. On the right, 3-7 also encountered light resistance in the morning, which increased as the assault troops neared the objective. The slopes of Hill 702 proved to be heavily mined, and forward elements of 3-7 were hit by a concentration of mortar and artillery fire. East of the river, on the regimental right flank, where Objective 1 had been occupied without a fight, 1-7 supported the attack of 3-7 with mortar fire. Both 3-7 and the KMCs were within 1,000 yards of their objectives late in the afternoon when a halt was called for the day. Casualties had been light, thanks in large measure to excellent air and artillery support. When the attack was resumed on 1 September, 3 KMC moved through positions of 3-7 to reach a ridgeline on the flank of the regimental objective. While 3 KMC advanced from the northeast, 1 KMC closed in from the southeast. Both battalions took heavy losses from enemy mines and mortars, as well as machine guns and automatic weapons fired from hidden bunkers. The converging attack made slow but steady progress, however, until one company of 3 KMC drove within 200 meters of the top of Hill 924 at 1700. Even so, it took four more hours of hard fighting to secure the objective. That evening, 2 KMC was relieved of its defensive responsibility along the Kansas line by 3rd Battalion 5th Marines, enabling the KMC battalion to join in the attack. Throughout the day, 3-7 slugged it out in the vicinity of 702 with an NKPA battalion. Four counterattacks were launched from Hill 602, the northeastern fork of Yoke Ridge. More than 500 men were employed in this effort, some of them penetrating briefly into 3-7 positions. Two airstrikes, called by patrols of 1-7 from across the river, helped to break up the main NKPA attack, and the 11th Marines, Colonel Custis Burton, Jr., poured in a deadly concentration of artillery fire. Lieutenant Colonel B.T. Kelly's battalion continued to be engaged until dusk. 
The tenacity of the NKPA defense was demonstrated at the expense of the KMCs when they were driven from the top of Hill 924 by a surprise enemy counterattack at midnight. The Korean Marines came back strongly at daybreak and a terrific fight ensued before the North Koreans were in turn evicted shortly before noon. As a measure of the artillery assistance rendered, Major Gordon R. Worthington's 1st Battalion, 11th Marines, fired 1,682 rounds of 105 ammunition in support of the KMCs during the 24 hours ending at 1800 on 2 September. During the same period, Lt. Col. William McReynolds, 311, fired 1,400 rounds in support of 37. The other battalions of the Marine Artillery Regiment, reinforced by the 196th, 937th, and 780th Field Artillery Battalions, U.S. Army, brought the number of rounds to a grand total of 8,400 for this 24-hour period. After the securing of Hill 924, the 2nd Battalion of the KMC Regiment passed through the 1st and 3rd Battalions to spear point the attack west toward Hill 1026. In the zone of 3-7, an NKPA counterattack was repulsed at 0700 on 2 September. Two hours later, George Company, supported by Howe Company with mortar and machine gun fire, moved out to resume the attack on Hill 602. Lt. Col. B.T. Kelly ordered his battalion heavy machine gun set up in a battery to deliver overhead supporting fires. In slightly less than two hours, the Marines of 3-7 swept the crest of Hill 602, securing Division Objective 2. Three company-sized enemy counterattacks were repulsed before the North Koreans withdrew to the north at 1500. The 2nd KMC Battalion fought its way to a point within 800 yards of Hill 1026 before dusk. So aggressive and persistent was the NKPA defense that several light enemy probing attacks were launched during the night of 2-3 September, not only against forward marine elements, but also against the 5th Marines units on the Kansas line, five miles to the rear. The front was where you found it. While 3-7 constructed emplacements and obstacles on Hill 602, the KMCs continued their attack on the morning of 3 September toward Hill 1026. With the extending of the 7th Marine Zone to the left to decrease the width of the KMC front, 2-7 was brought up from Regimental Reserve to help cover a new sector that included Hill 924. The attack led by 2-KMC collided with a large-scale enemy counterattack. It was nip and tuck for three and a half hours before the North Koreans broke, but by mid-morning, the KMCs were in possession of Division Objective 3 and consolidating for defense. They were not a moment too soon in these preparations, for the enemy counterattacked at 12.30 and put up a hot fight for two hours before retiring. This action completed the battle for core objective Yoke. At 1800 on 3 September, the 1st Marine Division was in full possession of the Hayes Line, dominating the entire northern rim of the punch bowl. Reports from the U.S. 2nd Infantry Division and 5th Rock Division, attacking in sectors to the west, indicated that the pressure exerted by the Marines was assisting these units. Large gains had been made on the west side of the punch bowl against comparatively light resistance. On 4 September, with all objectives consolidated, 1st Marine Division units patrolled northward from defensive positions. Plans were being formed for the second phase of the division attack, the advance to seize the next series of commanding ridge lines 4,000 to 7,000 yards forward of the present MLR. The victory in the four-day battle had not been bought cheaply. A total of 109 Marine KIA and 494 WIA, including KMCs, was reported. NKPA casualties for the period were 656 counted KIA and 40 prisoners. As evidence that the enemy had profited by the breathing spell during the Kaesong truce talks, it was estimated that the NKPA artillery fire in the punch bowl sector almost equaled the firepower provided by the organic marine artillery and the guns of attached U.S. Army units. NKPA strength in mortars and machine guns also compared favorably with that of Marines. Supply problems cause delay. 
Logistical shortages made it necessary for the 1st Marine Division to call a six-day halt and build up a new reserve of artillery and mortar ammunition. During the first phase of the division attack, the main burden of transport and supply had fallen upon three Marine units. The 1st Ordnance Battalion, Major Harold C. Borth, the 1st Mortar Transport Battalion, Lieutenant Colonel Howard E. Wortman, and the 7th Motor Transport Battalion, Lieutenant Colonel Carl J. Cagle. The extraordinary expenditure of artillery shells for these four days posed a resupply problem that was aggravated by an almost impassable supply route. The three Marine battalions had to strain every resource to meet minimal requirements. Ammunition Supply Point, ASP 60-B, a U.S. Army installation manned by elements of the Marine 1st Ordnance Battalion, was located about five miles behind the gun positions. From this dump, it was 48 miles to Hongchan, the source of supplies for ASP 60-B. A well-maintained two-lane dirt road led from that base to Inge, but northward it deteriorated into a narrow, twisting trail following the Soyang Valley. Recent rains, resulting in earth slides and mud holes, had reduced the road to such a condition that the round trip between ASP 60-B and Hongchan took 25 hours. As an added complication, it was necessary to build up a 10-day reserve of ammunition at ASP 60-B so that division transport would be available for lifting 2,000 rotated troops to Chunchon sometime between 3 and 15 September. This meant that 50 to 60 marine trucks must be employed daily to haul ammunition, with the result of a drastic shortage of motor transport for other purposes. Only human transport was available for supplying marines on the firing line. Ten Corps started the month of September with 20,070 Korean Service Corps, the successor to CTC, and civilian contract laborers, the equivalent in numbers of a U.S. Army Infantry Division. Even so, 14 airdrops were necessary during the month, only one of which went to a Marine unit. This took place on 1 September, when 20 Air Force cargo planes from Japan dropped ammunition and rations to the KMCs. A 90% recovery was reported. It generally took a full day in the 1st Marine Division zone during the first week of September for a cargador to complete the trip from a battalion supply point to the front lines and return. This made it necessary to assign from 150 to 250 Korean laborers to each infantry battalion. And as the Marines advanced farther into the rugged Korean highlands, the logistic problem was increased. Resumption of Division Attack Enemy groups moving southward into the zone of the 1st Marine Division during the six-day lull were sighted by air observation. POW interrogations and other G-2 sources established that the 2nd NKPA Division, 2 Corps, had been relieved by the 1st NKPA Division, 3 Corps. Accurate 76mm fire from well-hidden guns was received by the Marines throughout the interlude, and patrols ran into brisk mortar fire when they approached too near to enemy bunkers on Hill 673. For the second time, during the night of 4 to 5 September, 5th Marines units were assailed on the Kansas line, five miles to the rear of the 7th Marines troops similarly deployed along the Hayes line. Yet a large 7th Marines patrol ranged forward some 2,000 yards the next day without enemy contacts. A like result was reported by a patrol representing almost the entire strength of the Division Reconnaissance Company, Major Robert L. Autry, after it scoured the area north of the Punch Bowl. 1st Marine Division Operation Order 23-51, issued on the morning of 9 September, called for the 7th Marines to jump off at 0300 on the 11th and attack objectives Abel and Baker, Hills 673 and 749 respectively while maintaining contact with the 8th Rock Division on the right. Other division units were given these missions. 1st Marines, to be released from 10 Corps Reserve near Hongchon to division control, to be prepared to pass through the 7th Marines when that regiment secured its objectives, and continue the attack to seize Objective Charlie, 
the ridge line leading northwest from Hill 1052. Fifth Marines. To maintain one company on Kansas line while occupying positions in Division Reserve along Hayes Line in rear of 7th Marines. KMC Regiment. To patrol aggressively on Division Left to exert pressure on enemy defenses south and southeast of Objective Charlie. 11th Marines. To displace forward to support attack of 7th Marines. Division Reconnaissance Company. To patrol northward in the Soyang Valley as far as Huangi to deny the enemy this area. The area ahead of the 7th Marines was ideal for defense. From Yoke Ridge, the assault troops had to descend into a narrow valley formed by a small tributary of the Soyang Gang, cross the stream, and climb Kanmumbong Ridge on the other side. This formidable piece of terrain was dominated by three enemy positions, hills 812, 980, and 1052. Thus the attack of the 7th Marines had its primary purpose, the securing of initial objectives on Kanmunbong Ridge that would give access to the main NKPA defense line, some 4,000 yards to the north. The 7th Marines was to seize the eastern tip, Objective Abel, of this commanding terrain feature and run the ridge to Hill 749, Objective Baker. While Lt. Col. Lewis G. Griffin's 27 maintained its patrolling activities on the left, tied in with the KMCs, Lt. Col. B. T. Kelly's 37 in the center and Lt. Col. J. G. Kelly's 17 on the right were to attack. As an intermediate regimental objective on the way to Kanmunbong Ridge, the 680-meter hill directly north of B. T. Kelly's position on Hill 602 was assigned to his battalion. He ordered Howe Company to move forward under cover of darkness and be prepared to attack at dawn. Rain and poor visibility delayed the attempt until surprise was lost, and after a fierce firefight, Howe Company was stopped halfway up the southeast spur. In order to relieve the pressure, the battalion commander directed Item Company to attack on the left up the southwest spur. This maneuver enabled Howe Company to inch forward under heavy mortar and machine gun fire to a point within 50 yards of the topographical crest. Item Company became confused in the fog of war and finally wound up on Howe Spur at 1245. Twice the two companies made a combined assault after artillery and mortar preparation and airstrikes with napalm, rocket, and strafing fire. Both times the North Koreans swarmed out of their bunkers to drive the Marines halfway back to the original jump-off line. It was anybody's fight when the two battered companies dug in at dusk. Across the valley to the east, J.G. Kelly's 17 had no better fortune in its attack on Hill 673. Heavy enemy mortar and machine gun fire kept the assault troops pinned down until they consolidated for the night. With both attacking battalions in trouble, Colonel Nickerson ordered 27 to advance up the narrow valley separating them. His plan called for the reserve battalion to move under cover of darkness around the left flank of 17 and into a position behind the enemy before wheeling to the northeast to trap the North Koreans defending Hill 673. The maneuver succeeded brilliantly. Griffin's troops were undetected as they filed northward during the night, making every effort to maintain silence. By daybreak on 12 September, 27 had two platoons in position behind the enemy to lead the attack. The assault exploded with complete surprise as 27 swept to the crest of Hill 673 against confused and ineffectual opposition. Griffin's battalion and 17 had the enemy between them, but the jaws of the trap could not close in time because of NKPA minefields. Thus, 17 continued to be held up on the forward approaches of Hill 673 by NKPA mortar and small arms fire. Grenades were the most effective weapons as J.G. Kelly's men slugged their way to the summit at 1415 while 27 was attacking Objective Baker, Hill 749. On the other side of the valley, 37 had seized its initial objective. While Howe and Item companies attacked up the southeast spur, where they had been stopped the day before, George Company launched a surprise assault up the southwest spur. This was the blow that broke the enemy's will to resist. 
George Company knocked out seven active enemy bunkers one by one, thus taking the pressure off the troops on the other spur. At 1028, all three companies met on the summit. The 2nd Battalion, 7th Marines, radioed that Objective Baker had been secured at 1710 after a hard fight, but this report proved to be premature. Enough NKPA troops to give the Marines a good deal of trouble were still holding the wooded slopes of Hill 749, and it would take the attack of a fresh battalion to dislodge them. Along the ridgeline from Hill 673 to Hill 749, an undetermined number of enemy soldiers had been caught between 27 and 17, and events were to prove that they would resist as long as a man remained alive. Casualties of the 1st Marine Division on 11 and 12 September were 22 KIA and 245 WIA, nearly all of them being suffered by the assault regiment. Enemy losses included 30 counted KIA and 22 prisoners. The Mounting Problem of Cass With the division in reserve from 15 July until the latter part of August, close air support, Cass, was not a vital problem. However, upon return to the punch bowl area, the situation became serious. The difficulties arose from the time lag between the request for air support to the time the planes arrived over target. The 1st Marine Aircraft Wing, operating under the control of the 5th Air Force, was busily employed on interdiction missions. On 30 August, a tactical air observer, spotting what appeared to be a division of NKPA troops moving toward the Marines, hurriedly flashed back a request for a multi-plane strike. The enemy troops were beyond artillery range, but they were bunched up, a good target for a concentrated airstrike. It was more than three hours later that four fighter bombers arrived on the scene. By that time, the enemy formation had dispersed and the desired number of casualties could not be inflicted. The reason for this lack of timely air support was apparent. Most of the UN air power was being funneled into Operation Strangle, the interdiction operation designed to cut off the enemy's vehicular and rail traffic in the narrow waste of North Korea. With the emphasis on air interdiction, close air support sorties were limited to only 96 per day for the entire 8th Army. The 1st Marine Division received only a proportionate share. Marine close air support was needed because of the enemy's determined resistance to the division's attack. The Reds hurled frequent night counterattacks and pounded the Marine positions with artillery and mortars hidden in the precipitous punch pole area. At one time, it was estimated that the enemy was using 92 pieces of artillery. The Marines had only 72 field pieces, but in one 24-hour period, they expended more than 11,000 rounds of artillery ammunition on a 6,000-yard frontage. The enemy emplacements, hewn out of solid rock, were hard to knock out. To support the hard-working infantrymen, Marine Aircraft Group 12, MAG-12, had moved VMF-214 and VMF-312 from the Pusan area to K-18, an airfield on the east coast of Kangnung. By moving closer to the division area, planes were able to extend their time over the target area and render more effective support to the infantry. Also, Marine Air Support Radar Team 1, Massert 1, was sent to Korea and established positions to support the division. Using its support radar, the team began to evaluate its capability of guiding unseen fighter bombers at night or under conditions of poor visibility. Even though the Corsairs at K-18 were less than 50 miles from the 1st Marine Division, very few were available to the Marines. Operation Strangle, in full swing, was not achieving the desired results. Since sightings of enemy vehicles were increasing, more and more Marine and Navy air sorties were channeled into interdiction. During 18 days of rugged fighting from 3 to 21 September, forward air controllers made 182 tactical air requests. Fighter bombers were provided on 127 of these requests. However, in only 24 instances did the planes arrive when needed. The average delay time in getting CAS in response to requests during September was slightly less than two hours, but in 49 cases the planes were more than two hours late. 
As a consequence, General Thomas reported, many of the 1,621 casualties suffered by the 1st Marine Division during the hard fighting in September were due to inadequate close air support. Furthermore, he said, the tactical capabilities of his battalion were strongly restricted. During the planning of attacks, infantry commanders almost always desired and requested close air support. It was also desirable to have planes on station overhead should an immediate cast need arise, for the lack of an airstrike when needed could jeopardize success. However, with restricted availability of cast planes due to participation in strangle, many times desired air cover was not to be had. Attacks under those circumstances were often costly. End of chapter 9, part 1